part one chapters one and two of the mysteries of marseilles this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recorded by celine major the mysteries of marseilles by emile zola translated by ernest alfred visitelli part one chapter one how blanche de casalis eloped with philippe Cayol towards the end of the month of may eighteen four blank a man about thirty years of age was walking rapidly along a footpath in the st joseph quarter near the aguelade he had left his horse in the care of a small cultivator occupying a neighbouring farm and was going in the direction of a large solidly built square house a kind of country chateau such as are to be found on the hills of provence the man turned aside to avoid the chateau and went and seated himself in a pine wood which spread out behind the building then anxious and feverish he pushed aside the branches and glanced along the pathways apparently awaiting some one with impatience now and again he rose and took a few steps then reseated himself all in a tremble this man who was tall and of strange appearance wore bushy black whiskers his long face marked by energetic lineaments displayed a kind of violent and passionate beauty suddenly his eyes softened and a tender smile spread over his thick lips a young girl had just issued from the chateau and stooping as though to hide herself was hastening towards the pine wood rosy and breathless she reached the shelter of the trees she was barely sixteen years old beneath the blue ribbons of her straw hat her young face was smiling with a joyous and at the same time a startled expression her fair hair fell over her shoulders her little hands pressed to her breast were endeavouring to calm her throbbing heart how late you are blanche said the young man i had almost given up hoping to see you and he seated her on the moss beside him forgive me philippe answered the young girl my uncle has gone to aix to purchase an estate but i could not get rid of my governess she yielded herself to the embrace of him she adored and the two lovers enjoyed one of those long talks which are at once so silly and so sweet blanche was like a big child playing with her lover as she would have done with a doll philippe now ardent and speechless was pressing the young girl to him and gazing upon her with all the transports of love and ambition and whilst they were seated there oblivious of the world they noticed on raising their heads some peasants who were following a neighbouring path whilst watching them and laughing blanche full of alarm drew away from her lover i am lost she exclaimed turning quite pale those men will inform my uncle ah for pity's sake philippe save me the young man jumped up on hearing her cry if you wish me to save you he replied impetuously you must follow me come let us fly together to-morrow your uncle will consent to our marriage and we shall be united for evermore fly fly repeated the child ah i fear i have not the courage to do so i am too weak too timid i will sustain you blanche we will live a life of love blanche without hearing without replying let her head drop on philippe's shoulder oh i dread i dread the convent she resumed after a time in a low voice you will marry me you will love me always i love you see i am on my knees then closing her eyes yielding blanche hastily descended the slope clinging to the arm of philippe who had risen after she had gone some distance she looked back a last time at the home she was leaving and a poignant emotion filled her eyes with tears a minute's error had sufficed to throw her into the young man's arms exhausted and confiding she loved philippe with all the warmth of a first passion with all the folly of her inexperience she was running away like a schoolgirl voluntarily and without weighing the terrible consequences of her flight and philippe was carrying her off intoxicated with his victory and quivering at feeling her moving and panting at his side at first he thought of hastening to marseilles to procure a vehicle but he was afraid to leave her alone on the high road and he preferred to go with her on foot as far as his mother's country house which was situated quite a league away in the st just quarter philippe had to leave his horse behind and the two lovers started off bravely together they passed through meadows ploughed fields and pine woods taking short cuts and walking very quickly it was about four o'clock the sun clear and scorching cast before them broad sheets of light 
and they hastened along in the warm air urged on by the madness which was eating into their hearts as they passed by the labourers raised their heads and watched their flight with amazement it did not take them an hour to reach the home of philippe's mother blanche quite tired out seated herself on a stone bench beside the door whilst the young man went to see if the coast was clear he then returned and conducted her to his room he had begged ayas a gardener whom his mother was employing that day to fetch a vehicle from marseilles both were still a prey to the excitement of their flight whilst awaiting the vehicle they remained silent and anxious philippe having led blanche to a little chair knelt at her feet and gazed lingeringly at her seeking to reassure her by gently kissing the hand she yielded to him you cannot remain in that light gown he said after a time would you like to dress up as a man blanche smiled she felt childlike joy at the thought of disguising herself my brother is rather short continued philippe you can put on some of his things it made them quite merry the young girl dressed herself laughing the while she was charmingly awkward and philippe eagerly kissed the blushes on her cheeks when she was ready she had quite the appearance of a little man of a youngster of twelve she had great difficulty in confining her mass of hair in the hat and her lover's hands trembled as he gathered the rebellious locks together ayas at length returned with the vehicle he consented to receive the fugitives in his own home at st barnabé philippe took what money he possessed and all three entered the carriage which they left at the pont du jarret continuing the journey to the gardener's house on foot it was now twilight transparent shadows were falling from the pale heavens whilst acrid odours rose from the earth still warm with the last rays of the sun then a vague fear took possession of blanche her heart was sinking within her she sought to gain time listen said she to philippe i will write to my confessor abbe chastanier he will go and see my uncle to obtain my pardon and his consent to our marriage i think i should not be so frightened were i your wife philippe smiled at the tender simplicity of the last words write to abbe chastanier he answered for my part i will send my brother our address he will come to-morrow and will take your letter it was thus that blanche de casalis eloped with philippe cayolle one fine may evening ah sweet and terrible night which was doomed to overwhelm the lovers with wretchedness and bring them nothing but suffering and regret for the rest of their lives chapter two introduces the hero marius cayolle marius cayolle the brother of blanche's lover was about twenty-five years old he was short thin and puny his light yellow face with its long narrow black eyes was lighted up at times with a kind of smile of self-devotion and resignation he walked with a slight stoop and the hesitation and timidity of a child but the hatred of evil the love of uprightness that filled his being made him appear almost handsome he had assumed the hardships of the family leaving his brother to follow his ambitious and passionate instincts he made himself quite insignificant beside him saying generally that as he was the ugly one he ought not to emerge from his ugliness he added that it was excusable for philippe to like to display his fine figure and the vigorous beauty of his countenance moreover when necessary he could be severe towards the great impetuous child who was a senior and whom he treated with the remonstrances and affection of a father their mother now a widow was not at all wealthy she had a difficulty in making both ends meet on the remnants of her dowry the major portion of which her husband had lost in business this money deposited at a banker's yielded her a small income which had enabled her to bring up her two sons but when they had reached man's estate she showed them her empty hands and placed them face to face with the difficulties of life and the two brothers thrown thus into the struggle for existence led on by their different natures followed diametrically opposite courses philippe who had an appetite for wealth and liberty could not bend himself to labour he wished to attain fortune by the shortest road and had visions of making a rich marriage that was in his idea an excellent expedient a rapid means of obtaining an income and a pretty wife so he passed his life in the sunshine became amorous and even slightly dissipated he experienced an extreme delight in being well dressed in displaying his elegant hasty manners his eccentric garments his love-laden glances and speeches about marseilles his mother and brother who spoiled him endeavoured to provide for his whims 
moreover philippe was acting in good faith he adored women and it seemed natural to him to be beloved and carried off some day by a rich and beautiful young girl of noble birth whilst his brother was exhibiting his fine looks marius had taken a situation as clerk in the office of m martelly a ship-owner residing in the rue de la darse he felt quite happy hidden away in his office his sole ambition being to earn a modest competence and to live a peaceful and unostentatious life besides this he felt a secret pleasure in assisting his mother and brother the money he earned was dear to him because he could give it away and bestow happiness with it and himself taste the profound delights of self-sacrifice he had chosen in life the straight way the painful path which leads to peace joy and self-respect the young man was on the point of starting for his office when he received a letter in which his brother informed him of his elopement with mademoiselle de casalis it filled him with painful surprise and he beheld at a glance the frightful chasm into the depths of which the lovers had cast themselves he hastened without loss of time to say barnabé at the door of ayas the gardener's house was a vine trained to form an arbour whilst two big mulberry trees pruned to the shape of parasols spread their knotty branches around and cast their shade upon the entry marius found philippe seated in the arbour gazing lovingly upon blanche de casalis beside him the young girl already weary was silently regretting what they had done the interview was a painful one full of anguish and shame philippe rose up you blame me he asked holding his hand out to his brother yes i blame you answered marius energetically you have committed a base action pride has led you away and passion has ruined you you have not thought of the evils you will bring on your family and yourself philippe protested you are frightened he said bitterly for myself i did not stop to consider i loved blanche and she returned my love i said to her will you come with me and she came that is the whole story we are neither of us deserving of censure why lie replied marius with greater severity you are not a child and you know very well that your duty was to protect this young lady against herself you should have stayed her on the brink of wrong prevented her accompanying you ah don't talk to me of love i recognize only the love of justice and duty philippe smiled disdainfully and drew blanche to his breast my poor marius said he you are a good fellow but you have never been in love and do not understand its fever this is my defence and he allowed blanche to embrace him as she clung quiveringly to him the poor child felt well enough that her only hope was this man she had given herself away she belonged to him and now she worshipped him almost as a slave lovingly and in fear marius in despair felt that he would do no more good in talking reason to the lovers he determined to follow his own instincts and asked for full details of the unhappy affair philippe quietly answered his questions i have known blanche for nearly eight months he said i met her first at a public festival she was smiling in the crowd and i fancied her smile was meant for me since that day i have loved her and have sought every opportunity of meeting and addressing her haven't you written to her asked marius yes many times where are your letters she has burnt them each time i wrote i bought a bouquet of fine the florist on the cour st louis and slipped my letter in amongst the flowers marguerite the milkwoman used to take blanche the bouquets and did your letters remain unanswered at first yes blanche refused the flowers then she accepted them and finally she ended by answering me i was madly in love i dreamed of marrying her and of loving her for ever marius shrugged his shoulders and drew philippe on one side he there continued the investigation with more harshness in his voice you are either a fool or a liar said he quietly you know very well that m de casalis deputy millionaire all-powerful in marseilles would never have given his niece to philippe Cayol, poor plebeian and republican in addition to his other drawbacks confess that you have reckoned on the scandal that your elopement will occasion to force blanche's uncle to come to terms well and what then retorted philippe impetuously blanche loves me and i have in no way forced her will she has freely chosen me for her husband yes yes i am aware of all that you have said it too often for me not to know how much of it i should believe 
but you have not considered m de cazalis's anger which will fall with terrible force on you and your relations i know the man last night he no doubt exhibited his outraged pride to all marseilles the best thing you can do is to take the young lady back to her home at st joseph no i will not i cannot blanche would never dare return home she had only been at the country house about a week i was in the habit of seeing her twice a day in a little pine wood her uncle knew nothing and it must have been a great shock to him it is impossible for us to go there at present well listen give me the letter for abbe chastanier i will see him and if necessary will go with him to call on m de cazalis we must hush up the scandal i have a task to perform the task of repairing the wrong you have done promise me you will not leave this house that you will await here my further instructions i promise you to wait if no danger threatens me marius took philippe's hand and looked him loyally in the face love this child well he said in a deep voice pointing to blanche you will never be able to undo the wrong you have done her he was about to take his leave when mademoiselle de cazalis came forward she clasped her hands in supplication stifling her sobs if you see my uncle sir she stammered be sure and tell him that i love him i cannot account for what has happened i would like to remain philippe's wife and to return to my home in his company marius slightly bowed have hope he said and he went off sad and troubled feeling that his words were a lie and that to hope would be madness end of chapters one and two part one chapters three and four of the mysteries of marseilles by emile zola translated by ernest alfred visitelli this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter three there are menials in the church on reaching marseilles marius directed his steps to the church of st victor to which abbe chastanier was attached it is one of the oldest churches in marseilles its dark high and crenulated walls give it the appearance of a fortress the rough people of the port hold it in particular veneration the young fellow found the priest in the sacristy he was a tall old man with a long emaciated face pale as wax his sad eyes had a fixed look of suffering and misery he had just returned from a funeral and was slowly taking off his surplice his history was a short and sad one born of peasant parents and as gentle and innocent as a child he had taken orders to satisfy the pious wish of his mother in becoming a priest he had desired to perform an act of humility of absolute devotion he believed in his simplicity that a minister of god should bury himself in the infiniteness of divine love renounce the ambitions and intrigues of the world and live in the heart of the sanctuary absolving sins with one hand and dispensing charity with the other ah poor abbe how they let him see that the simple-minded are only fit to suffer and remain in obscurity he was soon to learn that ambition is a sacerdotal virtue and that young priests often love god for the sake of the worldly favours that his church distributes he beheld all his comrades of the seminary struggling to the nail he assisted at these internal battles those secret intrigues which turn a diocese into a turbulent little kingdom and as he remained humbly on his knees as he did not seek to please the feminine portion of the congregation as he asked for nothing and appeared piously stupid he was endowed with a miserable living thrown to him as one cast a bone to a dog he remained thus for forty years in a little village situated between aubagne and cassis his church was a kind of barn lime-washed and icily bare in winter when the wind blew in one of the window-panes the interior was chilled for weeks together for the poor priest did not always possess the few coppers necessary to replace the broken glass yet he never complained he lived peacefully amidst his wretchedness and solitude he even experienced great joy in suffering in feeling himself kin to the beggars of his parish he was sixty years old when one of his sisters a workwoman at marseilles became an invalid she wrote to him beseeching him to come to her the old priest therefore begged his bishop to find him a small place in one of the city churches he was kept waiting the fulfilment of his modest request for several months when at length he received a call to st victor there he had to undertake so to say all the roughest work all the labour that brought least renown and least profit 
he prayed over the coffins of the poor and led them to the cemetery he even at times fulfilled the duties of a sacristan it was at this period that he began really to suffer so long as he had remained in his desert he had been able to be simple poor and old at his ease now he felt that his poverty and old age his gentleness and simplicity were looked upon as a crime and his heart was rent when he understood that there could be menials in the church he saw well enough that he was looked upon with derision and scorn he bowed his head still more becoming yet more humble weeping over his faith shaken by the words and deeds of the worldly priests about him fortunately of an evening he had some happy moments he nursed his sister consoling himself in his own way by devoting himself to another he surrounded the poor invalid with a thousand little joys then another pleasure had been vouchsafed him m de casalis who had no faith in young abbes had selected him to be his niece's spiritual adviser the old priest seldom attracted a lady penitent and scarcely ever heard a confession he was moved to tears on the receipt of the deputy's proposal and he questioned he loved blanche as though she had been his own child marius handed him the young girl's letter and watched his face for a trace of the emotions the reading of it was about to cause him he beheld the signs of acute grief yet the priest did not appear to experience that surprise which results from unexpected news and marius concluded that blanche had mentioned in confession her growing affection for philippe you did well to count upon me sir said abbe chastanier to marius but i am very weak and not at all skilful i should have displayed more energy the poor man's head and hands shook with that sad gentle trembling peculiar to old people i am at your disposal he continued how can i assist the unhappy child sir replied marius i am the brother of the young madman who has eloped with mademoiselle de casalis and i have sworn to right the wrong to stifle the scandal will you join with me the young lady's honour is gone if her uncle has already denounced the affair to the authorities go therefore and find him endeavour to calm his anger and tell him his niece shall promptly be restored to him why did you not bring her with you i know how passionate m de casalis can be nothing but certainty will satisfy him it is just that anger which has frightened my brother besides this is no time for reasoning we are overwhelmed with accomplished facts believe me i feel as indignant as you and fully understand how disgraceful my brother's behaviour has been but for pity's sake let us do something very well said the abbe simply i will go wherever you wish they went along the boulevard de la corderie and reached the cour bonaparte where the deputy's town-house was situated m de casalis a prey to terrible anger and despair had returned to marseilles early in the morning following the elopement abbe chastanier stopped marius at the door of the house do not come in said he your visit might be considered an insult let me manage and wait for me here marius walked feverishly up and down the pavement for a good hour he would have preferred to have gone in to have explained matters himself and have asked for pardon in philippe's name whilst the fate of his family was under discussion in that house he had to remain there outside inactive and a prey to all the agony of waiting at length abbe chastanier came out he had been weeping his eyes were red his lips quivering monsieur de casalis will listen to nothing he said in a troubled voice i found him in a blind rage he has already been to the crown attorney the poor priest did not mention that m de casalis had received him with the bitterest reproaches venting his anger upon him and accusing him in his rage of having given evil counsel to his niece the abbe bent beneath the storm he almost fell on his knees not seeking to defend himself but imploring the deputy to take pity on the others tell me all exclaimed marius in despair it appears the priest replied that the man with whom your brother left his horse assisted m de casalis in his search a complaint was lodged at an early hour this morning and the police have been to ransack your lodging in the rue sainte and your mother's house at st just good heavens good heavens sighed marius 
m de caselli swears that he will crush the whole of your family i vainly endeavoured to bring him to a kindlier frame of mind he talks of having your mother arrested my mother whatever for he makes out that she is an accomplice that she assisted your brother in carrying off mademoiselle blanche what can we do how prove the falsity of such an accusation oh wretched philippe it will be the death of our mother and marius sobbed aloud his face buried in his hands abbe chastanier beheld his fit of despair with tender pity he understood the goodness and probity of the poor lad who wept thus in the open street come my child he said be courageous you are right father exclaimed marius it is courage i need i was weak this morning i should have wrested the young lady from philippe and have taken her back to her uncle an inner voice bade me perform that act of justice and i am punished for not having obeyed its prompting they talked to me of love passion and marriage and i allowed their words to move me they remained a moment silent and then marius said suddenly come with me between us we shall be strong enough to separate them i am willing the abbe replied and without even thinking to take a cab they followed the rue de breteuil the canal quay the napoleon quay and then ascended the canebiere they walked hurriedly along without speaking when they reached the cour st louis the sound of a fresh young voice caused them to turn their heads it was fine the flower girl calling marius josephine cougourdan familiarly known by the pet name of fine was one of the marseilles brunettes small and plump whose refined features have preserved all the delicate purity of their grecian ancestors her round head stood upon slightly drooping shoulders her pale face bore an expression of disdainful scorn beneath her braided black hair passionate energy was visible in her large melancholy eyes which were softened now and again by a smile she was from twenty-two to twenty-four years of age when only fifteen she found herself an orphan with a young brother not more than ten years old dependent upon her she bravely took her mother's place and three days after the funeral whilst still suffering from her great grief she was seated in a kiosk on the cour st louis making up and selling nosegays sobbing the while the little florist soon became the spoilt child of marseilles her youth and grace secured her popularity her flowers it was said had a sweeter smell than those sold elsewhere gallants swarmed around her she sold them her roses violets and carnations but that was all and it is thus that she was able to bring up her brother cadet and apprentice him when eighteen years old to a master stevedore the two young people lived on the place aux Eux in the centre of the labouring class quarter cadet was now a big fellow employed at the docks fine grown handsomer and having arrived at womanhood had the lively gait and careless caressing way of marseillaise women she was acquainted with the cailloles through having sold them flowers and she would speak to them with that tender familiarity which springs from the warm air and gentle language of provence besides which if all must be told philippe had latterly so often bought her roses that she ended by feeling a slight tremor when he approached her the young man who was by instinct an admirer of the sex laughed with her and gazed at her so intently that he made her blush half declaring his love the while and all this simply not to forget the ways of wooing the poor girl who up till then had made short work of would-be lovers fell a victim to this flirtation at night-time she dreamed of philippe and wondered with anguish whatever he could do with all the flowers she sold him when marius approached her he found her high-coloured and troubled she was half hidden by her nosegays and looked adorably fresh beneath the broad lappets of her little lace cap monsieur marius she added hesitatingly is what every one is saying this morning true that your brother has eloped with a young lady who told you that asked marius quickly why every one the rumour is all over the place and as the young man seemed as troubled as herself and stood there without speaking fine added with slight bitterness i was told that monsieur philippe was a flirt his tongue was too soft for his words to be true she was on the point of weeping but was forcing back her tears with painful resignation she then added more gently i can see that you are in trouble if you should need me do not fail to let me know 
marius looked in the face and seemed to guess the agony of her heart you are a brave girl he exclaimed i thank you and will perhaps avail myself of your services he heartily shook her hand as he would have done to a comrade and hastened to rejoin abbe chastanier who was waiting for him at the edge of the pavement we have no time to lose he said the story is spreading all over marseilles we must take a cab night was falling when they reached st barnabé they only found the gardener ayes's wife who was knitting in a low room this woman quietly informed them that the gentleman and young lady had become alarmed and had gone off on foot in the direction of x she added that her son had accompanied them to guide them amongst the hills the last hope was thus dead marius completely overcome returned to marseilles without hearing the encouraging words abbe chastanier addressed to him he was thinking of the fatal consequences of philippe's madness he was rebelling against the misfortunes about to befall his family my child said the priest as he left him i am only a poor man but dispose of me as you will i will go and pray to god for you chapter four how m de casalis avenged his niece's dishonour the lovers had eloped on a wednesday on the following friday all marseilles knew the story the gossips on their doorsteps embellished the adventure with many dramatic details the nobility was indignant whilst the middle-class folk had a hearty laugh m de casalis in his rage had done everything to increase the racket and turn his niece's flight into a frightful scandal clear-sighted people easily accounted for his show of anger m de casalis was a deputy of the opposition and had been returned at marseilles by a majority composed of a few liberals some priests and members of the aristocracy devoted to the cause of legitimacy bearing one of the most ancient names of provence bowing humbly before all powerful mother church he had experienced considerable repugnance in flattering the liberals and receiving their votes in his eyes they were merely varlets servants fit only to be whipped in the public streets his indomitable pride suffered at the thought of lowering itself to their level yet he had been obliged to bow before them the liberals noised abroad the services they were rendering and for a time a pretence was made of disdaining their assistance but when they talked of intervening in the election by naming one of their own party as a candidate m de casalis was forced by circumstances to bury his hatred in the depths of his heart promising himself his revenge on some future occasion then the most shameless jobbery was resorted to the clergy took the field votes were secured right and left thanks to innumerable civilities and promises with the result that m de casalis was elected and here was philippe Cayolle, one of the leaders of the liberal party fallen into his hands at last he would be able to gratify his hatred on the person of one of the louts who had bargained with him for his return to the chamber he should be made to pay for all his relatives should be ruined and plunged into despair and as for him he should be thrown into prison precipitated from the height of his dream of love on to the straw of a dungeon what a little nobody had dared to win the love of the niece of a casalis he had led her away with him and now they were both roving along the roads attending the hedge school of love it was a scandal to be made much of an ordinary person would perhaps have preferred to hush it up to conceal the deplorable adventure as far as possible but a casalis deputy and millionaire was possessed of sufficient influence and pride to proclaim the shame of a relative abroad without a blush what mattered a young girl's honour all the world might know that blanche de casalis had eloped with philippe Cayolle, but no one should be able to say that she was his wife that she had degraded herself by marrying a poor devil without a handle to his name pride required that the child should remain dishonoured and that her dishonour should be posted on the walls of marseilles m de casalis had bills placarded in all the squares of the city promising ten thousand francs reward to whosoever would bring him his niece and her seducer bound hand and foot when one loses a pure-bred dog it is also usual to advertise for it among the upper classes the scandal spread still more noisily m de casalis decimated his rage everywhere he availed himself of the influence of his friends of the clergy and nobility as guardian of blanche who was an orphan and as a trustee of her fortune he urged on the authorities in their search and drew up the indictment of the accused 
it might be said that he took pains to procure the greatest possible publicity for the gratis show about to begin one of the first measures he resorted to was to secure the arrest of philippe cayolle's mother when the crown attorney presented himself she replied to all questions that she did not know her son's whereabouts her confusion her anguish her mother's fears which made her hesitate were no doubt considered so many proofs of complicity she was sent to prison more as a hostage and possibly in the hope that her son would surrender himself in order to secure her release when marius heard of his mother's arrest he almost went mad he knew she was in delicate health and pictured her with terror shut up in a bare and icy cold cell she would die there tortured by all the pangs of suffering and despair marius was also suspected at the outset but his firm answers and the bail that his employer the shipowner martelli offered on his behalf saved him from imprisonment he wanted to remain free in order to work for the salvation of his family little by little his upright mind was able to properly weigh the facts at first he had been overwhelmed by philippe's guilt he had seen only the irreparable wrong his brother had done and he had humbled himself desiring solely to calm blanche's uncle and give him every reparation possible but in face of the deputy's rigour of the scandal he was raising the young man had a revulsion of feeling he had seen the fugitives and knew that blanche was voluntarily accompanying philippe and he was indignant at hearing the latter accused of abduction hard words flew around him his brother was called a scoundrel a villain and his mother did not come off much better in consequence his love of truth prompted him to defend the lovers to take the part of the fugitives even against the authorities besides which the deputy's noisy accusations sickened him he felt that true grief is dumb and that an affair in which a young girl's honour is at stake should not be ventilated in public and he felt all this not because he wished to see his brother escape chastisement but because his delicacy was wounded by all this publicity given to a child's shame moreover he knew the meaning of the deputy's rage by striking philippe he was striking far more the republican than the abductor marius was thus in his turn overcome with anger he was insulted through his family his mother cast into prison his brother tracked like a wild beast his dearest affections dragged in the mud they were the victims of bad faith and passion at this he held up his head again the guilt was not all on the side of the ambitious lover who had eloped with a wealthy young lady it was equally the portion of him who was stirring up marseilles and who intended using all his power to satisfy his pride since the authorities had undertaken to punish the first marius swore that sooner or later he would punish the second and that in the meantime he would upset his plans and endeavour to counterbalance the influence his wealth and birth gave him from this moment marius displayed febrile energy he devoted himself entirely to the preservation of his mother and brother unfortunately he was unable to learn what had become of philippe two days after the flight he had received a letter in which the fugitive implored him to send him a thousand francs to defray the expenses of his journey the letter was dated from lambesque philippe had there found a few days hospitality in the house of m de girousse an old friend of the family m de girousse who was the son of a former member of the parliament of aix was born in the midst of revolution at his first breath he had inhaled the burning atmosphere of eighty nine and his blood had always preserved a little of the revolutionary fever he felt uncomfortable in his mansion on the cour at aix in his eyes the nobility of the town seemed possessed of such inordinate pride such deplorable inertness that he judged it severely and preferred to live at a distance from it his upright mind his love of logic had helped him to accept the new order of things and he willingly held out his hand to the people and accommodated himself to the tendencies of modern society at one time he had thought of founding a factory and of exchanging his title of count for that of manufacturer considering that nowadays the only nobility is the nobility of talent and labour and as he preferred living alone away from his equals he stayed the greater part of the year on an estate he owned near the little town of lambesque it was there that he had harboured the fugitives marius was overwhelmed by philippe's request his savings did not amount to more than six hundred francs he bestirred himself and during two days endeavoured to borrow the remainder of the amount one morning when he was beginning to despair fine called upon him he had confided his trouble to the young woman the day before 
she had been for ever on his footsteps since philippe's flight and constantly asking for news of his brother being apparently most anxious to know whether the young lady was still with him fine laid five hundred francs on a table there she said with a blush you can return it to me later on it's some money i put aside to purchase my brother's discharge if he was drawn in the conscription marius would not accept it you're making me waste my time resumed fine with charming abruptness i must hurry back to my flowers but if you don't mind i'll call here every morning for news and she hastened away marius sent the thousand francs then he heard nothing further but passed a whole fortnight in complete ignorance of the march of events he knew philippe was being relentlessly hunted down and that was all he would not believe the grotesque or frightful stories that were current with the public he had enough with his own fears without being frightened at the gossip of the town he had never in his life before suffered so much his anxiety nearly drove him mad the least sound frightened him he was for ever on the alert as though expecting some bad news at any moment he heard that philippe had gone to toulon and had almost been arrested there the fugitives it was said had then returned to aix there all trace of them was lost had they attempted to cross the frontier had they remained in hiding among the hills no one seemed to know marius was all the more anxious because he had been obliged to neglect his work at the shipowner martelli's if he had not been fixed to his desk by duty he would have hastened to philippe's assistance and would have personally occupied himself with his safety but he dared not leave the business where his services were required m martelli showed him quite a paternal sympathy a widower for several years past and living with one of his sisters who was twenty-three years of age he treated marius like a son on the morrow of the scandal raised by m de casalis the shipowner called the young man into his private office ah my friend he exclaimed this is a very unpleasant matter your brother is done for we shall never be strong enough to save him from the terrible consequences of his folly m martelli belonged to the liberal party and was noted for the southern violence of his opinions he had already had some spars with m de casalis and therefore knew his man his strict probity his immense fortune placed him beyond all attack but he possessed the haughtiness of his liberalism and took a sort of pride in never making use of his power he advised marius to keep quiet and await events he would render him all his assistance once the struggle was started marius consumed by his fever was about to ask him for a leave of absence when fine all in tears appeared one morning before him the gentleman has been arrested she exclaimed between her sobs they found him with the young lady in a cottage in the trois bon dieu quarter about a league from aix and as marius greatly agitated rushed downstairs to make inquiries which only too fully bore out the truth of fine statement she still in tears smiled and said in a low voice at any rate the young lady is no longer with him End of chapters three and four part one chapters five and six of the mysteries of marseilles by emile zola translated by ernest alfred visitelli this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter five blanche journeys six leagues on foot and sees a procession pass by blanche and philippe left the gardener's house at dusk at about half-past seven o'clock during the day they had noticed gendarmes on the road they were assured that they would be arrested that evening and fright drove them from this their first retreat philippe put on a peasant's blouse whilst blanche borrowed a workwoman's dress from the gardener's wife a red cotton gown with a flowery pattern and a black apron she put a yellow check fichu round her breast and a big coarse straw hat on her head victor the son of the house a lad of fifteen accompanied them to show them the way across the fields to the x road the warm night air was full of murmurs a hot breath rose from the earth counteracting the fresh breeze which was wafted now and again from the mediterranean a bright light like the reflection of a fire still illumined the west the rest of the sky was of a violet blue gradually growing paler in colour while the stars appeared one by one in the night similar to the flickering lights of a distant town the fugitives hastened along with bowed heads and without exchanging a word they were in a hurry to find themselves amidst the solitude of the hills 
so long as they were crossing the outskirts of marseilles they met a few passers-by whom they eyed with distrust at last the open country spread out before them and the only human beings they encountered were now and again some grave shepherds standing at the edge of the path watching their flocks and their flight continued in the gloom and the emotional silence of the serene night vague sounds floated around them pebbles rolled beneath their feet with a noise that filled them with uneasiness the sleeping countryside extended like a black mass in the monotony of the darkness blanche affrighted clung to philippe hastening her little footsteps in order to keep up with him she heaved deep sighs as she recalled the peacefulness of her nights at home then they reached the hills with the deep ravines which had to be crossed around marseilles the roads are soft and easy but out in the country one meets those rocky ridges which cut up the whole centre of provence into narrow sterile valleys uncultivated plains stony slopes with here and there some sorry tufts of thyme and lavender now extended before the fugitives in all their desolate mournfulness the paths wound up and down the sides of the hills fallen rock now and again blocked the way beneath the bluish serenity of the heavens one could have fancied it a sea of pebbles an ocean of stones stricken with eternal immobility in the midst of a hurricane victor leading the way softly whistled a provencal air as he jumped from rock to rock with the agility of a chamois he had grown up amid this desert and was acquainted with its innermost recesses blanche and philippe followed him laboriously the young man was supporting the girl whose feet were cut by the sharp stones on the way she did not complain and whenever her lover gazed inquiringly into her face in the transparent darkness she smiled to him with sad sweetness they had just passed septembre when the young girl worn out sank to the ground the moon slowly rising in the heavens lit up her pale face bathed in tears philippe bent over her in great distress you are crying he exclaimed you are in pain my poor darling child ah it was cowardly of me to keep you with me was it not do not say that philippe replied blanche i am weeping because i am a miserable girl see i can scarcely walk we should have done better to have fallen on our knees before my uncle and have implored him with clasped hands she regained her feet with an effort and they continued their journey over the arid hills it was far different from the gay and foolish escapade of a couple of lovers it was a dismal flight full of anxiety the flight of a guilty couple silent and quaking with fear they traversed the gardan district struggling during five hours against the obstacles of the way at last they decided to descend to the high road leading to aix and there they were able to proceed more freely the dust however nearly blinded them when they reached the top of the arc hill they dismissed victor blanche had covered six leagues among the rocks on foot in less than six hours she sat down on a stone seat at the gate of the town and declared that she could not proceed any further philippe who feared to be arrested if he remained at aix went in search of a vehicle he came across a woman driving a light cart who agreed to give him and blanche a lift as far as lambesque whither she was bound in spite of the jolting blanche fell into a sound sleep and did not wake up until they were nearing their destination this sleep calmed the fever of her blood she felt soothed and stronger the lovers alighted from the vehicle just as day was breaking a fresh and radiant dawn which filled them with hope the terrors of the night had vanished the fugitives had forgotten the septem rocks and were walking side by side in the damp grass intoxicated with their youth and love not finding m de Giroux, of whom philippe had intended asking hospitality they went to an inn where they were at last able to enjoy a day of peace on the morrow philippe saw m de Giroux, who had returned he told him the whole story and asked his advice the deuce exclaimed the old nobleman your matter is serious you know my friend you're but a clodhopper a hundred years ago m de casalis would have hanged you for daring to touch his niece nowadays he can only have you cast in prison and you may be sure he won't omit to do so but what had i better do now what had you better do why restore the young lady to her uncle and make for the frontier as fast as you can you know very well that i shall never do that very well then just wait quietly until you're arrested i've no other advice to give you 
so there beneath a friendly abruptness m de Girousse hid the kindest heart in the world as philippe confused by the curtness of his reception was about to take his departure he called him back and taking his hand continued with slight bitterness my duty would be to have you arrested i belong to that nobility you have just insulted listen i have somewhere on the other side of lambesque a little unoccupied house of which i will give you the key go and hide yourselves there but don't tell me you're going to do so if you do i'll send the gendarmes after you it was thus the lovers remained nearly a week at lambesque they lived in retirement amid a peacefulness broken at times by sudden alarms philippe had received a thousand francs marius had sent him blanche was becoming quite a little housekeeper and they ate out of the same plate with delight this new life was like a dream to the young girl at times however she would wonder why she had gone off with philippe she would then experience a revulsion of feeling and wish to return to her uncle but she never dared say so it was then the time of the feast of corpus christi one afternoon as blanche was looking out of the window she saw a procession pass by she knelt down and joined her hands and fancied she could see herself dressed in white amongst the singers her heart was bursting that night philippe received an anonymous letter warning him that he would be arrested on the morrow he thought he recognized m de Girousse's handwriting the flight was resumed more difficult and painful chapter six the hunt after the lovers then ensued a regular rout a race without truce or repose an ever-recurring panic driven right and left by their fright perpetually fancying they could hear the sound of horses hoofs behind them passing their nights hurrying along the highways and their days trembling in the filthy rooms of country inns the fugitives crossed and recrossed the whole of provence going before them and retracing their footsteps not knowing where to find an unknown retreat hidden on the confines of some desert they left lambesque one terribly stormy night and went in the direction of avignon they had hired a little cart and the wind nearly blinded their horse blanche was shivering in her thin cotton dress to complete their wretchedness they thought they could see from a distance at one of the gates of the town some gendarmes examining the faces of the passers-by thoroughly frightened they retraced their steps and returned to lambesque through which they only passed arrived at aix they did not dare stay there and resolved to reach the frontier at no matter what cost there they would procure themselves a passport and be in safety philippe who knew a chemist at toulon decided to pay a visit to that town he expected that his friend would be able to assist him in his flight the chemist a big merry fellow named jourdan received them very well he hid them in his own room and promised to at once try and obtain them a passport jourdan was gone out when two gendarmes called blanche nearly fainted away white as a ghost and seated in a corner she was stifling her sobs philippe in a choking voice asked the gendarmes what they wanted are you monsieur jourdan one of them inquired with a roughness which forebode nothing good no replied the young man monsieur jourdan is out but will soon be back very well said the gendarme curtly and he seated himself heavily the poor lovers scarcely dared look at each other they felt fit to faint away in the presence of these men who had no doubt come after them their anguish lasted a good half hour at length jourdan returned he paled at the sight of the gendarmes and answered their questions with the greatest confusion you must come with us said one of the men what for he asked what am i accused of you are charged with having cheated at cards last night in a club you will be able to give your explanations when before the magistrate a shudder passed through jourdan's frame he was quite dazed and accompanied the gendarmes with the docility of a child they went off without even perceiving the terror of the lovers jourdan's affair made a great sensation at toulon at the time but no one knew of the painful drama which had been enacted at the chemist's the day of his arrest this event took all the courage out of philippe he understood that he was not strong enough to evade the police who were on his track besides he had now no longer any hope of obtaining a passport and would therefore be unable to cross the frontier moreover he saw that blanche's strength was giving away he therefore determined to return towards marseilles and wait in the neighbourhood of the city until m de cazalis's anger was partly appeased like all those who have no longer any ground for hope 
he had at times ridiculous visions of pardon and happiness philippe had a relation at aix named isnard who kept a draper's shop not knowing where to obtain hospitality the fugitives returned to aix to ask isnard for the key of one of his cottages a fatality pursued them the draper was away and they were obliged to hide themselves in an old house on the cour sextus belonging to a cousin of m de Girousse's farmer this woman would not at first receive them fearing she might be called to account later on for her hospitality she only yielded before philippe's promises to procure her son's exemption from military service the young man was no doubt in a hopeful frame of mind he could already see himself a deputy's nephew and was disposing freely of his uncle's great influence that evening isnard came to the lovers and handed them the key of a cottage he owned in the puricard plain he had two others one at tholonais and the other in the district of trois bon dieu the keys of these were hidden under certain great stones which he described to them he advised them not to remain two nights running beneath the same roof and promised to do his best to put the police off their track they started off and took the road which passes beside the hospital isnard's cottage was situated to the right of priericard between the village and the road leading to venelle it was one of those ugly little buildings formed of lime-washed stones without mortar and enlivened by a roof of red tiles it contained but one room little better than a dirty stable straw refuse littered the ground and great cobwebs hung from the ceiling they had fortunately brought a rug with them they gathered the litter into a corner and spread the rug over the heap this formed their couch amid the acrid exhalations of the dampness surrounding them on the morrow they passed the day in a hole in a dried-up watercourse called the Toulouvre. then towards evening they gained the venelle road and reached the Lonnais by a roundabout way in order to avoid passing through aix it was eleven o'clock when they arrived at the draper's cottage situated below the jesuit oratory this cottage was rather better it had two rooms a kitchen and a parlour which latter contained a fold-up bedstead the walls were covered with caricatures cut out of the charivari and strings of onions hung from the whitewashed beams the lovers could almost fancy themselves in a palace in the morning their fright returned they climbed the hill and remained till night-time in the recesses of the infernet in those days the precipices of jaunegarde still possessed all their sinister horror the zola canal had not then pierced the mountain and strollers did not often venture into that dismal abyss of reddish rocks blanche and philippe enjoyed profound peacefulness in the midst of this desert they rested long beside a clear and murmuring spring which trickled from a gigantic mass of rock at nightfall returned the cruel question of shelter blanche could now scarcely walk her wounded feet bled upon the sharp and pointed stones philippe understood he could not take her much farther he supported her and they slowly ascended to the level ground overlooking the infernet it is an extensive uncultivated plain vast fields of pebbles waste land broken up here and there by disused quarries nothing looks so strangely wild as this broad landscape with its bare horizon dotted here and there with a dark and stunted vegetation the rocks looking like distorted limbs pierce above the barren earth the plain having the appearance of a humpback seems to have been stricken with death in the midst of the convulsions of a terrible agony philippe hoped to find some hole some cavern he had the good luck to discover a shanty one of those shelters in which sportsmen hide themselves while awaiting the flight of birds of passage he did not hesitate to force in the door and seated blanche upon a little bench he felt beneath his hand then he went and gathered a quantity of thyme the plain is covered with this humble grey plant the strong perfume of which rises from every hill of provence he carried the thyme into the shelter and spread it in the form of a mattress over which he laid the rug the bed was ready and the fugitives kissed each other good night upon this miserable couch philippe was unable to sleep the strong smell of the thyme upon which he was lying affected his brain he dreamt in spite of his wakefulness that m de casalis had received him affectionately and that he had been elected deputy in his uncle's stead now and again he could hear blanche's mournful sighs as she slumbered beside him agitated and feverish the young girl had come to consider her flight some nightmare full of bitter pleasures during the day she was rendered stupid by fatigue she smiled sadly and never complained her inexperience had caused her to agree to the flight and her weak character prevented her proposing to return 
she belonged body and soul to this man who carried her along all she wished was to have to walk less she continued to believe that her uncle would consent to her marriage when his temper had cooled the fugitives left their bed of time at sunrise their clothes were becoming terribly torn and their shoes were nearly worn out in the coolness of the morning amid the wild perfumes of this solitude they forgot their wretchedness for a time and declared laughingly that they were frightfully hungry so philippe told blanche to go back to the hut and hurried off to tolonet in search of food it took him a good half hour when he returned he found the girl in a state of terror she assured him she had seen some wolves prowling about the table was laid on a large flat stone and they were like a couple of gypsy lovers breakfasting in the open air after breakfast they made for the centre of the plain and remained there all day these were some of their happiest hours but when the twilight fell fear again seized them they dreaded to pass another night amidst all that solitude the pure warm air of the hills had filled them with gentler thoughts and hopes you are tired my poor child asked philippe oh yes she replied listen we must perform one more journey let us go as far as isnard's cottage in the trois bon dieu district and remain there until your uncle forgives us or has me arrested my uncle will forgive us i dare not think it in any case i will no longer fly you have need of rest come let us walk slowly they crossed the plain leaving the infernes behind them and passing the chateau of st marc which they could see on an eminence on their right they reached their destination at the end of an hour isnard's cottage was on the slope of the hill which stretches to the left of the vauvenargue road after one has passed the repentance glen it was a small one-storied house the ground floor consisted of a single room containing a rickety table and three old rush-bottomed chairs a ladder led to the upper room a kind of loft almost entirely bare and containing merely a wretched mattress on a heap of hay isnard had considerately placed a sheet at the foot of the mattress philippe's intention was to go on the morrow to aix and procure information as to m de cazalis's intentions towards him he felt that he would be unable to hide himself any longer he went to rest in an almost peaceful frame of mind calmed by blanche's kind words as she judged events with all a young girl's hopefulness it was now twenty days that the fugitives had been running about the country and during this time the gendarmes had been scouring the neighbourhood following on their track sometimes losing it but always getting set right again by some slight circumstance the deputy's anger had only increased with the delay his pride was irritated by each fresh obstacle at lambesque the gendarmes came a few hours too late the arrival of the fugitives at toulon was not known until the morrow of their return to aix everywhere they escaped as though by a miracle the deputy ended by accusing the police of being lukewarm he was informed at last that the lovers were in the neighbourhood of aix and that they were on the point of being arrested he hastened there to assist in the search the woman of the cour sexus who had given them hospitality for a few hours was seized with terror to avoid being accused of complicity she told all she knew and said that they were probably hidden in one of isnard's cottages isnard who was questioned quietly denied everything he declared that he had not seen his relative for several months past this was happening at the very time philippe and blanche were entering the cottage in the trois bon dieu district the draper was unable to warn the lovers during the night at five o'clock the next morning a police commissary called on him and informed him that he was going to search his house and three cottages m de cazalis remained at aix saying he was afraid he would kill his niece's abductor if he ever met him face to face the officers sent to search the cottage at Piricard found the nest empty isnard obligingly offered to lead two gendarmes to his place at tolonet feeling certain that they would waste their time the police commissary also accompanied by two gendarmes went to the trois bon dieu he took a locksmith with him isnard having vaguely stated that the key of the cottage was hidden under a stone on the right of the door it was about six o'clock when the commissary arrived there everything was closed and not a sound came from inside he went forward and hammering on the door with his fist exclaimed in a loud voice open in the name of the law echo alone answered nothing stirred 
after waiting a few minutes the commissary turned towards the locksmith saying pick the lock the locksmith selected his tools and the grating of the iron could soon be heard in the silence the shutter of a window was then violently thrown back and philippe caillol disdainful and angry his neck and arms bare appeared in the bright light of the rising sun what do you want he asked leaning on the window-sill the first blow struck by the commissary had awoke the fugitives seated on the edge of the mattress still half asleep they listened anxiously to the voices without the words in the name of the law that cry which rings so terribly in the ears of the guilty struck the young man full in the chest he jumped up quivering bewildered not knowing what to do the young girl huddled up in the sheet her eyes still heavy with sleep was shedding tears of shame and despair philippe understood that all was over and that he had only to surrender himself but a dull feeling of revolt rose within him so his dreams were dead he would never be blanche's husband he had carried off an heiress to be himself cast into jail instead of the happy existence he had dreamed of he ended by gaining a prison cell then a cowardly thought passed through his mind it occurred to him to leave the girl there and fly in the direction of vauvenargues in the defiles of st victoire perhaps he could escape by a window at the back of the cottage he bent over blanche and in a low hesitating voice told her of his project the young girl half stifled by her sobs did not understand nor even hear him he saw with anguish that she was not in a state to assist his flight at this moment he heard the sound of the workman picking the lock the poignant drama that had just been enacted in that bare room had lasted at most a minute he felt himself lost and his chafed pride restored his courage had he been armed he would have defended himself but conscious that he was no abductor blanche having accompanied him voluntarily he felt that he had nothing to be ashamed of so he angrily pushed back the shutter and asked what was wanted open the door ordered the police commissary we will tell you afterwards what we want philippe went down and opened the door are you monsieur philippe caillol resumed the commissary yes replied the young man energetically then i arrest you on the charge of abduction you have carried off a young girl under sixteen years of age who is no doubt hidden here with you philippe smiled and said mademoiselle blanche de casalis is upstairs and can tell you if i used any violence towards her i don't know what you mean by talking of abduction i was about to go this very day to monsieur de casalis and ask him for his niece's hand in marriage blanche pale and shivering had just come down the ladder she had dressed herself hastily mademoiselle said the commissary i have orders to take you to your uncle who is awaiting you at aix he is in great grief i am deeply sorry for having displeased my uncle replied blanche with some firmness but you must not accuse m caillol whom i accompanied of my own free will and deeply affected on the point of again bursting into sobs she turned towards the young man and continued have hope philippe i love you and will beseech my uncle to be good to us our separation will only last a few days philippe looked at her sadly and shook his head you are a weak and timid child he replied slowly then he added in a harsher tone remember only that you belong to me if you forsake me you will find me ever in your life the recollection of my kisses will never cease scorching your lips and that will be your punishment she was weeping love me well as i love you he resumed more gently the police commissary placed blanche in a carriage he had had brought to the spot and took her back to aix whilst the two gendarmes marched philippe off and placed him in the prison of the town End of chapters five and six part one chapters seven and eight of the mysteries of marseilles by emile zola translated by ernest alfred visitelli this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter seven blanche denies her love the news of the arrest did not reach marseilles until the following day and caused quite a sensation m de casalis was observed driving along the canebiere in the afternoon accompanied by his niece the gossips had their fill 
every one spoke of the deputy's triumphant attitude and of blanche's shame and embarrassment m de cazalis was capable of dragging his niece throughout marseilles to show the people she had returned to his protection and that no woman of his race would marry beneath her marius informed by fine was out and about all day the common talk of the town confirmed the tidings and he was able to pick up all the details of the arrest in a few hours the event had become legendary and the shopkeepers the idlers and loafers related it as though it had been the marvellous tale of something that had happened a century before the young man tired of hearing these cock-and-bull stories went to his office his head aching and his brain incapable of deciding what course to pursue unfortunately m martelli would be away until the following evening and marius felt the need of doing something at once he would have liked to have immediately taken some steps that would have reassured him as to his brother's fate his first alarm had now however partly subsided he reflected that after all his brother could not be accused of abduction and that blanche would be there to defend him he ended by naively imagining that it was his duty to call upon m de cazalis and ask him for his niece's hand in philippe's name on the following morning he dressed himself in black and was going out when fine came as usual the poor girl turned quite pale when marius told her what he was about to do will you permit me to accompany you she asked in a beseeching tone of voice i will wait outside to learn the answer of the young lady and her uncle she followed marius and when they arrived at the cour bonaparte the young man walked firmly to the deputy's house and sent up his name m de cazalis's blind passion had now subsided he held his vengeance he would be able to prove his might by crushing one of those republicans whom he detested now his sole desire was to taste the joy of playing with his prey so he ordered that m marius cayol should be admitted he expected tears earnest supplications the young man found him standing up haughtily in the centre of a vast saloon he advanced towards him and without giving him time to speak said calmly and politely i have the honour to ask you sir in the name of my brother m philippe cayol for the hand of your niece mademoiselle blanche de cazalis the deputy was thunderstruck marius's request seemed to him so absurdly extravagant that it failed to anger him he stepped back looking the young man straight in the face and answered with a disdainful laugh you must be mad sir i know that you are an industrious and honest fellow and it is for that reason that i do not have you put out your brother is a scoundrel a knave who shall be punished as he deserves what do you want with me on hearing his brother insulted marius felt a great desire to strike the noble personage as one of the rabble would have done he restrained himself however and continued in a voice that was beginning to tremble with emotion i have already told you sir i am here to offer mademoiselle de cazalis the only reparation possible that is to say marriage the wrong that has been done her can thus be effaced we are above any wrong exclaimed the deputy with contempt the shame for a cazalis is not that she has had anything to do with a philippe Cayolle her shame would be to ally herself to such people as you such people as we have other ideas as regards honour however i will not dwell upon it my duty alone prompted me to offer you the reparation you refuse permit me merely to add that your niece would no doubt accept this offer if i had the honour of making it to her in person you think so said m de cazalis sarcastically he rang the bell and requested the servant to ask his niece to come to him at once blanche entered pale-faced and red-eyed looking worn out by her two powerful emotions she shuddered on beholding marius mademoiselle said her uncle coldly this gentleman has asked for your hand on behalf of the scoundrel whose name i will not pronounce in your presence tell the gentleman what you told me yesterday blanche reeled she dared not look at marius her eyes fixed upon her uncle her whole frame trembling she murmured in a weak and hesitating voice i told you i had been carried off by force and that i would do all in my power to secure the punishment of the odious attempt made upon me these words were uttered like a lesson learnt beforehand blanche denied her love m de cazalis had not lost his time as soon as his niece was in his power he influenced her with all the weight of his obstinacy and pride 
she alone could secure his ultimate success it was necessary that she should lie and stifle her feelings that she should become a compliant and passive instrument in his hands during four hours he kept her under the spell of his sharp cold words he was not so foolish as to give vent to his rage he spoke with crushing haughtiness recalling the ancient origin of his race displaying his wealth and power he skilfully showed her on the one hand the picture of a vulgar and ridiculous marriage and on the other the noble joys of a rich and great alliance he attacked the young girl through her vanity tired her out broke her spirit dulled her intellect and rendered her such as he desired tractable and inert blanche emerged from this long interview this continuous martyrdom utterly vanquished perhaps beneath the sting of her uncle's overpowering words her patrician blood had at length revolted at the memory of philippe's vulgar love perhaps her childhood dreams were called upon as the deputy descanted on luxurious costumes worldly elegance and honours of all kinds moreover her head was too bad her heart too sore for her to resist that terrible will every sentence m de casalis uttered struck her crushed her filled her with painful anxiety she no longer felt the power of having a will of her own she had loved and accompanied philippe through weakness now she was turning against him also through weakness she was ever the same timid being she accepted everything and promised everything she longed to escape from the stifling weight with which her uncle's words were crushing her on hearing her make her strange declaration marius stood amazed and terrified he remembered the young girl's attitude when at ayes the gardener's he could recall her clinging to philippe's neck loving and confiding ah mademoiselle he exclaimed bitterly the odious attempt you speak of did not seem to fill you with such abhorrence the day you beseeched me to implore your uncle's pardon and consent have you reflected that your falsehood will cause the ruin of the man you perhaps still love and who should be your husband blanche now erect her lips tightly drawn together was looking vaguely in front of her i do not know what you mean she stammered i have told no falsehood i yielded to force that man took advantage of me and my uncle will avenge the honour of our family marius drew himself up dignified anger increased his short stature and his feeling of justice and truth made his thin face appear handsome he looked around him contemptuously and said slowly and yet i am in the home of the casalis of the descendants of that illustrious family which is the glory of provence i had no idea that falsehood dwelt in this abode i never expected to find calumny and cowardice lodging here side by side oh you shall hear me to the end i intend to cast my lackey's dignity in the teeth of my unworthy superiors turning towards the deputy he continued as he pointed to the trembling girl that child is innocent and i forgive her weakness but you sir you are a clever man you safeguard the honour of your women by making them untruthful and faint-hearted were you now to offer me the hand of mademoiselle blanche de casalis for my brother i should refuse it for i have never lied i have never been guilty of a base action and i should blush to be allied to such people as you m de casalis bent beneath the young man's rage at the first insult he had summoned a big valet who stood at the open door as he signed to him to put marius into the street the latter resumed with terrible energy i swear i will shout out murder if this man moves a foot let me pass one day sir i may be able to fling in your face before all the world the truce i have just told you in this room and he walked out slowly and firmly he no longer thought of philippe's guilt his brother had become in his eyes a victim whom he was determined to save and avenge at no matter what cost in this upright nature the slightest untruth or injustice raised a tempest already the scandal stirred up by m de casalis at the time of the elopement had caused him to take the fugitive's part now that blanche lied and the deputy resorted to calumny he longed to be all-powerful in order to proclaim the truth from the housetops pine a prey to anxiety was waiting for him outside well asked the young woman as soon as she caught sight of him well he replied those people are miserable liars and vain fools 
fine drew a deep breath whilst a blush spread over her cheeks so she resumed monsieur philippe is not to marry the young lady the young lady said marius smiling bitterly pretends that philippe is a scoundrel who carried her off by force my brother is lost fine did not understand she bowed her head wondering how the young lady could treat her lover as a scoundrel and she thought how happy she would have been had philippe carried her off even by force marius's anger delighted her the marriage would never take place your brother is lost she murmured in a soft wheedling voice oh i will save him or rather we will save him together chapter eight the iron pot against the earthen ewer when marius told m martelli that evening of the interview he had had with m de casalis the shipowner said as he shook his head i do not know what advice to give you my friend i do not wish to drive you to despair but you will be conquered take my word for it your duty is to enter upon the struggle and i will assist you to the best of my ability yet we had better admit to each other that we are weak and unarmed in the presence of an adversary who has the clergy and nobility behind him marseilles and aix have little love for the july monarchy and these two towns are both wholly devoted to a deputy of the opposition which is waging such a war against m thiers they will assist m de casalis in his revenge i am alluding to the bigwigs the common people would help us if they were able to help any one the best thing would be to win over some influential member of the clergy to our cause do you know any priest who is in favour with our bishop marius replied that he only knew abbe chastanier a poor old man who certainly possessed no influence never mind go and see him said the shipowner the townspeople cannot be of any use to us the nobility would show us the door if we asked their assistance so there is only the church left that is where we must apply begin your campaign i shall be busy on my side also on the following morning marius went to st victor where abbe chastanier received him with a sort of timid embarrassment don't ask me to do anything he exclaimed at the first words the young man uttered it is known that i have already occupied myself with this affair and i have had to endure some grave reproaches i told you before i am only a poor man i can only pray for you marius was affected by the old man's humble attitude and was about to withdraw when the priest detained him and said in a low voice listen there is a man here a bedon who might be useful to you it is said that he is on the best of terms with his lordship he is a foreign priest an italian i think who has won everybody's good will in a few months he stopped speaking hesitating and seeming to be inquiring of himself the worthy man was thinking that he was about to compromise himself terribly but he could not resist the joy of doing a kindness would you like me to take you to him he asked suddenly marius who had perceived a slight hesitation sought to decline but the old man insisted forgetting entirely his personal tranquillity listening only to the promptings of his heart come he resumed abbe donadet lives only a short distance off on the boulevard de la corderie after a few minutes walk abbe chastanier stopped at a little one-storied house one of those discreet dwellings which have a vague air of the confessional about them here we are said he to marius an old woman servant opened the door and conducted them to a small apartment with dark hangings resembling some austere boudoir abbe donadet received them with easy grace his pale face with delicate features bore a slightly cunning expression and did not show the least surprise he drew some chairs forward in a coaxing manner his body half bent a slight smile about his lips doing the honours of his study like a lady does those of her drawing-room he wore a long black robe loose at the waist but this severe costume covered coquettish manners his delicate white hands appeared quite small as they issued from the ample sleeves and his clean-shaven face had a soft fresh complexion beneath the curly locks of his chestnut-coloured hair he looked about thirty years of age when he had seated himself in an armchair he listened with smiling gravity to what marius had to say he made him repeat all the spicier details of blanche's elopement and the story seemed to interest him immensely abbe donadei was born at rome and had an uncle who was cardinal one fine day his uncle suddenly packed him off to france without anybody knowing exactly why 
on his arrival the handsome abbe found himself obliged to enter the ex-seminary as a teacher of living languages such an humble position so humiliated him that he fell ill the cardinal relented and recommended his nephew to the bishop of marseilles his ambition satisfied donna dei quickly recovered he joined the clergy of st victor and as abbe chastanier had naively said he succeeded in winning everybody's good will in a few months his caressing italian nature his soft pink face turned him into a cherub in the eyes of the demure lady devotees of the parish he was especially successful in the pulpit his slight foreign accent gave a strange charm to his sermons and when he spread out his arms he knew how to cause his hands to tremble with an emotion which filled the eyes of his congregation with tears like most italians he was a born intriguer he used and abused his uncle's recommendation to the bishop of marseilles and soon became a power an occult power working underground and digging pitfalls in front of those persons he desired to remove from his path joining a religious club then all-powerful at marseilles he succeeded in imposing his will on his colleagues thanks to his suppleness his perpetual smile and humility and in becoming the leader of a party then he interested himself in every event had a finger in every pie it was he who secured m de casalis's election as deputy and he was awaiting a fitting opportunity to claim the reward of his services his plan was to work for the success of wealthy people later on when he had merited their gratitude he intended to make use of them in building up his own fortune he questioned marius courteously by the attention he paid him and his sympathetic manner he seemed fully disposed to assist him in his work of deliverance the young man allowed himself to be taken in by this pleasant amiable behaviour and unburdened himself relating his plans and owning that the clergy alone could save his brother finally he begged his kind offices with his lordship the bishop abbe donadet rose and said in a tone of austere raillery my cloth sir forbids my mixing myself up in this deplorable and scandalous affair the enemies of the church are only too fond of accusing the clergy of interfering in worldly affairs i can only beseech the almighty to pardon your brother marius in dismay had also risen he understood that he had just been duped by donna dei he sought however to disguise his feelings i thank you he replied prayers are indeed the sweetest of alms for the unfortunate pray that we may be granted the justice of our fellow-men he turned towards the door followed by abbe chastanier with bowed head donna dey had affected to ignore the old priest when they were on the point of leaving the room the handsome abbe recovering all his graceful sprightliness detained marius a moment you are employed at m martelli's i think he asked yes sir the young man answered with surprise he is a very honourable man i know however that he is not one of our friends nevertheless i esteem him greatly his sister mademoiselle claire whose spiritual director i have the honour of being is one of our best parishioners and as marius looked at him finding nothing to say donna dey added with a slight blush she is a charming person most exemplarily pious he bowed with an exquisite politeness and then gently closed the door outside on the pavement abbe chastanier and marius looked at each other and the young man could not help shrugging his shoulders the old priest was quite confused at having seen one of god's ministers play a part like an actor he turned to his companion and said hesitatingly my friend you must not blame the almighty if his ministers are not always what they should be the young man we have just been with is only guilty of ambition he continued a long time in this strain finding excuses for donna dey marius watched him affected by his goodness and in spite of himself he compared this poor old man to the powerful abbe whose smiles were law in the diocese then he reflected that the church did not love all her sons equally but like most mothers spoilt the rosy-cheeked ones and neglected the tender spirits who did good by stealth the two visitors were moving off when a carriage drew up at the door of the closed discreet little house and marius beheld m de casalis alight the deputy hastily entered abbe donadei's abode look father exclaimed the young man i feel certain that priest's cloth will not prevent his abetting m de casalis in his vengeance he was tempted to return to that home of hypocrisy 
but calming himself he thanked abbe chastanier and went off he thought with despair that the last loophole of safety the one in possession of the upper clergy was closing before him on the morrow m martelli told him the result of a visit he had paid to the chief notary of marseilles m douglas a pious man who in less than eight years had become quite a power through his wealthy clients and his great charity his name was loved and respected people spoke admiringly of the virtues of this upright worker who led a frugal life unlimited confidence was placed in his honesty and the activity of his intelligence m martelli had availed himself of his services when investing some money he thought that if douglas would use his influence on marius's behalf the latter would secure some of the clergy to his side he called on the notary and asked for his assistance douglas who appeared very much occupied muttered an evasive reply saying that he was overwhelmed with business and quite unable to struggle against m de casalis i did not persist said m martelli to marius i thought i understood that your adversary had been beforehand with you there yet i am surprised that such an upright man as m douglas should have allowed his hands to be tied i am afraid now my poor friend that the game is indeed up for a whole month marius went about marseilles seeking to win over a few influential persons he was everywhere received coldly with railing politeness m martelli was not more fortunate the deputy had enlisted the sympathies of the whole nobility and clergy the middle classes the shopkeepers were laughing in their sleeves unwilling to move owing to their great fear of compromising themselves as for the common people they sang songs about m de casalis and his niece this being all they could do on philippe caillol's behalf days passed by and the preparations for the trial went on apace marius was still as much alone as on the first day in preparing his brother's defence against the uncle's hatred and the niece's obedient falsehoods there was only fine whose angry speeches merely won over the work-girl's warm sympathy to philippe's cause one morning marius learnt that the act of accusation against his brother and the gardener ayes had been drawn up the former being accused of abduction and the latter with being an accomplice in the crime madame cayolle had been released for want of proof marius hurried off to embrace his mother the poor woman had suffered greatly during her incarceration her feeble health was seriously compromised a few days after leaving the prison she gently expired in her son's arms and he sobbing vowed to avenge her death the funeral was the occasion for a popular demonstration philippe's mother was conveyed to the st charles cemetery followed by a long procession of women of the people who did not hesitate to revile m de casalis openly they were even strongly inclined after the funeral to go and throw stones at the windows of the deputy's house alone in his little lodging in the rue sainte marius when all was over felt himself deserted in the world and wept bitterly his tears relieved him he saw the road he had to follow traced out clearly before him the misfortunes which were overwhelming him increased in his breast the love of truth and hatred of injustice he felt that all his life must henceforth be devoted to a holy cause he could no longer act at marseilles the scene of the drama having changed future events would be occurring at aix where the trial was to be held he desired to be on the spot in order to follow the different phases of the affair and take advantage of any incidents which might arise he asked his employer for a month's leave of absence which the latter immediately granted the day of his departure he found fine waiting at the coach office i am going to aix with you she said quietly but that would be madness he exclaimed you cannot afford to give your time thus who will attend to your flowers during your absence oh one of my friends a girl who lives on the same floor as i do at the house on the place aux Eux. i said to myself i can be useful to them so i put on my best dress and here i am i thank you very much marius replied simply in an agitated voice End of chapters seven and eight Part One, Chapters Nine and Ten of the Mysteries of Marseilles by Emile Zola, translated by Ernest Alfred Visitelli. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Nine, Monsieur de Girousse lets his tongue wag. On arriving at Aix, Marius went to Isnard's in the Rue d'Italie. The draper had not been molested. No doubt, such an insignificant prey was not considered worth capturing 
fine went straight to the jailer of the prison whose niece she was by marriage she had her plan and brought with her an enormous bunch of roses which was well received her pretty smiles her caressing liveliness made her in a couple of hours her uncle's spoiled child he was a widower with two young daughters to whom fine had once played the part of mother the trial was not to take place till early in the following week marius his hands tied no longer daring to attempt anything awaited the proceedings with anguish at times he was still mad enough to hope and to believe in an acquittal walking one evening on the cour he met m de Girousse, who had come from lambesque to be present at the affair the old nobleman took his arm and without saying a word led him to his house there he said after closing the door of a large drawing-room now we are alone my friend i can come down from my pedestal as much as i please marius smiled at the count's rough and eccentric ways well the latter went on you don't ask me to help you to defend you against Gazalis. come you're sensible you understand that i can do nothing against that vain and obstinate nobility to which i belong ah your brother has done a fine thing m de Girousse was striding about the drawing-room he pulled himself up abruptly before marius and said to him in a loud voice listen to what i am about to tell you there are some fifty of us in this good town all old fellows like myself living by ourselves buried in a past for ever dead we profess to be the cream of the cream of provence and there we stick doing nothing but twirling our thumbs for see you we are noblemen chivalrous hearts awaiting devoutly the return of their legitimate princes and the deuce take it we shall wait a long time so long that we shall have died of solitude and idleness before the least legitimate prince shows himself if we were gifted with good eyes we should observe the march of events we cry out to facts you shall go no farther and yet the facts pass quietly over our bodies and crush us it maddens me to see how we are shut up in an obstinacy as ridiculous as it is heroic to think that we are most of us wealthy that we might nearly all become intelligent manufacturers working for the prosperity of the country and that we prefer to grow mouldy in the recesses of our mansions like the rubbish of a bygone age he stopped to take breath and then went on still more energetically and we take a pride in our empty existence we don't work because we disdain labor we have a holy horror of the people because their hands are soiled ah your brother dared to touch one of our daughters we'll show him whether his blood is the same as ours we shall league ourselves together and give the rascalians a lesson we'll cure them of seeking to find favor in our children's eyes some powerful ecclesiastics will second us they are fatally bound to our cause it will be a splendid campaign for our vanity after a pause m de Girousse resumed sarcastically our vanity it has at times received some nasty knocks a few years prior to my birth a terrible tragedy was enacted in the mansion adjoining this m d'entrecasteaux the president of the parliament murdered his wife in her bed he cut her throat with a razor which was not found till twenty-five days afterwards at the bottom of the garden the victim's jewels were discovered down the well where the murderer had thrown them to lead the authorities to believe that robbery was the reason of the murder president d'entrecasteaux took flight and went i believe to portugal where he died in poverty the parliament condemned him in default to be broken alive on the wheel so you see we have also our scoundrels and that the lower classes have nothing to envy us that cowardly crime committed by one of ourselves dealt a sad blow in those days to our authority a novelist might write a heart-rending book with the materials furnished by this doleful and tragic story resuming his walk m de Girousse continued and we also know how to humble ourselves for instance when fouché the regicide then duke of otranto was somewhere about eighteen ten exiled for a short time to our town all the nobles dragged themselves before him i remember an anecdote which will show you to what abject servility we lowered ourselves on new year's day eighteen eleven 
there was a long file of persons waiting to pay their respects to the ex-member of the convention in the reception-room there was some talk of the severity of the weather and one of the callers was expressing his fears as to the fate of the olive-trees what do we care for the olive-trees exclaimed one of the noble personages providing his grace the duke keeps well that's how we are nowadays my friend humble with the mighty haughty with the weak there are no doubt some exceptions but they are rare you must see therefore that your brother will be convicted our pride which bent the knee before a fouché cannot do so before a cayolle that's logical good night and the count abruptly dismissed marius his own words had exasperated him and he feared that his anger might end by making him say something foolish the next day the young man met him again and m de Giroux took him home as on the previous evening he held in his hand a newspaper containing a list of the jury who were to decide philippe's case and struck the paper forcibly with his finger exclaiming those are the men who will condemn your brother shall i tell you some stories about them they are curious and instructive m de Giroux seated himself and glanced through the paper shrugging his shoulders as he did so it's a packed jury he said at last an assembly of rich men who have every interest to serve the cause of m de casalis they are all more or less mixed up with the clergy or on intimate terms with the nobility they are almost all friends of men who spend their mornings in the churches and cheat their customers the rest of the day then he named them one by one and spoke of the set they frequented with increasing indignation humbert he said is the brother of a marseilles merchant a dealer in oil an honest man who holds his head erect and whom every poor devil salutes twenty years ago their father was but a struggling clerk to-day his sons are millionaires thanks to his skilful speculations one year he sold a large quantity of oil beforehand at the market rate a few weeks afterwards the coal destroyed the olive trees the crop was lost and he was a ruined man if he did not deceive his customers but he preferred deceit to poverty whilst his brother merchants were delivering the genuine article at a loss our man bought up all the spoiled and rancid oils he could find and then made the promised deliveries his customers complained and grew angry but the speculator coolly replied that he was strictly keeping to his agreements and that they could claim nothing further of him and the trick was played all marseilles which knows the story is never tired of taking its hat off to this skilful man gauthier is another marseilles merchant he has a nephew paul bertrand who swindled in style this bertrand was in partnership with a person named aubert living in new york who used to send him consignments of goods to be disposed of in marseilles they shared the profits our man made immense sums in this business the more especially as he was careful to cheat his partner at each division of profits one day a crisis broke out and losses were incurred bertrand continued to receive the goods which the ship still brought but he refused to honour the drafts aubert drew upon him saying that business was bad and he was in difficulties the returned bills come back again with enormous expenses attached to them then bertrand calmly says that he won't pay that he is not obliged to be aubert's partner for ever and that he owes nothing there's a fresh return of the bills fresh expenses incurred and the new york merchant surprised and indignant has to take them up at great loss the latter who had to plead through a power of attorney lost the action for damages he brought against bertrand i was assured that two-thirds of his fortune twelve hundred thousand francs were swallowed up in this catastrophe bertrand remains the most honest man in the world he is received everywhere and belongs to several congregations he is envied and honoured du Taillet is a dealer in corn some time ago one of his sons-in-law georges fouque met with a misadventure which caused a scandal that his friends hastened to hush up fouque always arranged matters so that it should appear that the cargoes the ships brought him had suffered in transport the insurance offices paid on the report of an expert but tired of continually paying the offices appointed an expert an honest baker who soon received a visit from fouque the latter whilst conversing on indifferent matters slipped a few gold pieces into his hand 
the baker dropped the coins and kicked them into the middle of the room there were several persons present yet fouque's reputation has in no way suffered delorme lives in a town not far from marseilles he retired from business long ago listen to the disgraceful action his cousin mill was guilty of thirty years back mill's mother kept a draper's shop when the old lady retired she sold her stock in goodwill to one of her assistants an active and intelligent young fellow whom she almost looked upon as a son this person whose name was michel quickly discharged the debt and so increased his business that he felt compelled to take a partner he chose a young fellow of marseilles named jean martin who had a little money and who appeared to be an honest hard-working man it was an assured fortune that michel offered to his partner at first everything went well the profits increased annually and each partner put by a good round sum at the end of the year but jean martin who was eager for gain and dreamed of a rapid fortune ended by reflecting that he would make twice as much if he were alone the matter was a difficult one michel was in fact his benefactor and moreover he had a friend in the landlord of the house madame mille's son if the latter were honest jean martin would be unable to put his nefarious scheme into execution he went to see him and found him to be the scoundrel he required he proposed to him to give him a new lease in consideration of a large sum of money he doubled and even trebled the amount mill who was both a rogue and a miser sold himself for as much as possible the bargain was struck then jean martin played the hypocrite with michel he said he desired to cancel the partnership deed and to start a business elsewhere he even named a place he had taken michel surprised but not suspecting the infamous trick of which he was to be the victim said he could retire if he liked and the deed was cancelled shortly afterwards michel's lease expired and jean martin armed with the new lease triumphantly turned his ex-partner out michel nearly driven mad by such a piece of treachery opened a business elsewhere but having no customers he lost the money so painfully amassed during thirty years of labour he died paralysed suffering atrociously shouting that mill and martin were scoundrels and traitors and calling on his sons to avenge him to-day his sons are toiling and moiling to keep body and soul together mill is connected by marriage with the best families in the town his children are wealthy and living handsomely in an odour of piety and possessing the esteem of all there's favre his mother was married twice her second husband being a man named chabran a shipowner and bill discounter pretending he had made some unfortunate speculations chabran wrote one day to his numerous creditors to the effect that he was obliged to suspend payment some of them consented to give him time but the majority decided to proceed against him so chabran engages two young fellows as clerks and spends a week in coaching them up in the parts he wishes them to play then accompanied by these youngsters now thoroughly trained he calls on all his creditors one after the other bewailing his sad position and imploring their pity for his two starving sons who haven't a coat to their backs the trick succeeds admirably well all the creditors forego their claims the next day chabran was at the bourse more sedate and more insolent than ever a broker who had not heard of the affair asked him to discount three bills accepted as it so happened by three of the very merchants who had treated him so generously the day before i can have nothing to do with those kind of people he replied haughtily at the present time chabran has almost retired from business he lives in a villa where he gives sumptuous dinners on sundays as for Jeromino, the president of the club where he spends his evenings is a usurer of the very worst description it is said that he has earned at the trade a snug little million which enabled him to marry his daughter to one of the princes of finance his name is Pertini but since his last failure which left him a capital of three hundred thousand francs sticking to his fingers he goes by the name of felix this skilful rascal failed a first time forty years ago and that enabled him to purchase a house his creditors received fifteen per cent ten years later a second failure procured him a little place in the country 
that time his creditors received ten per cent scarcely fifteen years ago he failed a third time on that occasion for three hundred thousand francs and offered a composition of five per cent the creditors having declined to accept it he proved to them that all the property was really his wife's and he never paid them a centime marius thoroughly sickened made a movement of disgust as though to stop these abominable stories you don't believe me perhaps said the terrible count you're a simpleton my friend i've not yet done and you must hear me to the end m de girus railed in a dreadful manner his loud hissing words fell like the lash of a whip upon the persons whose disreputable histories he was relating he named the jurymen one after another he searched their lives and the lives of their relations and laid bare all the scandals and meannesses connected with them there was scarcely one he spared then he placed himself vehemently before marius and continued bitterly were you so simple as to believe that all these millionaires all these upstarts all these powerful persons who domineer over you and crush you to-day were little saints worthy individuals whose lives were spotless at marseilles especially these men display their vanity and insolence they have become devotees and hypocrites they have deceived even the worthy people who salute and esteem them in a word they form an aristocracy of their own their past is forgotten their wealth and newly acquired probity are alone seen well i'll unmask them listen this one made his fortune by betraying his friend that other by trafficking in human flesh that other in selling his wife and daughter that other in speculating on the misery of his creditors that other in buying back for a song the shares of a company of which he was manager and which he had brought into disrepute that other by scuttling a ship loaded with stones instead of merchandise and securing a handsome sum from the underwriters that other verbally a partner by refusing to pay his share of the losses in an unfortunate speculation that other by concealing his assets failing two or three times and ultimately living like an honest man that other by selling as wine a decoction of logwood or bullock's blood that other by buying up all the corn at a time of scarcity that other by defrauding the customs on a large scale attempting to corrupt the officers and robbing to his heart's content that other by forging the signatures of friends or relations to bills which they do not dare to dishonour at maturity but prefer to pay rather than disgrace the forger that other by setting fire to his factory or ships previously insured far above their value that other by tearing up and burning his acceptances snatched from his creditor's hand the day they fell due that other by speculating at the bourse without any intention of paying his differences which does not prevent him enriching himself a week afterwards at the expense of some dupe m de girus stopped for want of breath he remained silent for some time giving his anger an opportunity of dying out then he again opened his lips and smiled less bitterly i am a bit of a misanthrope he said gently to marius who had listened to him with pain and surprise i see the dark side of everything the fact is the idleness to which my title condemns me has enabled me to study the ignominies of this country but i must tell you there are some honest folk among us unfortunately they either dread or disdain the rascals marius took his leave of m de girus quite upset by the ardent words he had been listening to he foresaw that his brother would be unmercifully condemned the trial was to begin on the morrow chapter x a scandalous trial all aix was in a flutter scandal acquires additional force in quiet little towns where the curiosity of the gossips has not frequently some fresh material to feed upon all the talk was of philippe and blanche the lovers adventures were related at every street corner it was openly said that the accused was condemned beforehand that m de casalis had either personally or through his friends secured a promise of conviction from each juryman the ex-clergy gave the deputy its assistance though in a rather lukewarm manner it is true it comprised in those days some men who were unwilling to be parties to an act of injustice 
a few priests however submitted to the influence of the religious club of marseilles of which abbe donadey was so to say the leader these attempted in various ways to tie the hands of the magistracy they succeeded especially in persuading the jurymen of the righteousness of m de casalis's cause the nobles rendered them powerful aid in their task they considered that their honour demanded they should crush philippe Cayolle they regarded him as a personal enemy who having dared to attack the dignity of one of themselves had by so doing insulted the whole body of them to see these counts and marquises bestir themselves give vent to their anger and band themselves together one might have fancied that some hostile army was at the gates of the town yet it was after all simply a question of securing the conviction of a poor wretch guilty of love and ambition philippe however had some friends and defenders all the lower classes declared themselves freely for him they blamed his conduct and reproved the means he had employed saying that he would have done better to have loved and married a young woman in his own class of life but whilst censuring his behaviour they loudly took his part against the deputy's pride and hatred it was known throughout the town that blanche when before the examining magistrate had denied her love and the daughters of the people true provencal women enthusiastic and courageous spoke of her with insulting contempt they called her a renegade ascribed the most shameful motives to her conduct and did not hesitate to cry their opinions from the housetops in the expressive language of the gutter all this clamour compromised philip's cause considerably the whole town was in the secret of the drama about to be performed those whose interest it was to secure the prisoner's conviction being certain of succeeding did not even take the trouble to hide their proceedings those who would have liked to have saved him conscious of their weakness and unarmed condition relieved themselves by bawling delighted to annoy those powerful persons whom they had no hope of mastering m de casalis had shamelessly dragged his niece with him to aix during the first days he took a sort of proud delight in walking her up and down the cour it was his way of protesting against the idea of dishonour with which the crowd coupled the young girl's flight he seemed to be proclaiming to the world at large you see that a lout cannot damage the honour of a casalis my niece still looks down upon you from the height of her rank and fortune but he was unable to continue these walks long his behaviour angered the mob who insulted blanche and was on the point of stoning her and her uncle the women especially were furious they did not perceive that it was not the niece's fault and that she was simply submitting to an iron will she trembled before the popular wrath and lowered her eyes in order not to see those women gazing at her with such fiery glances she could feel their contemptuous gesticulations behind her hear horrible words she failed to understand and her legs were giving way beneath her as she clung to her uncle's arm in order not to fall she returned home one day pale and trembling and declared she would not go out again the poor child was going to become a mother at last the day of the trial arrived the doors of the court-house were besieged from early morning the place des Prêcheurs was filled with a noisy gesticulating crowd clamouring as to the probable result of the trial and discussing philippe's guilt and m de casalis's and blanche's attitude the court-room slowly filled extra rows of seats had been added for the persons provided with tickets there were so many of them that the majority had to remain standing there were the flower of the nobility the leading barristers the high functionaries in fact all the nobilities of x no prisoner had ever before had such an audience when the doors were opened for the admission of the general public only a few persons were able to find room the remainder were compelled to wait in the passages and even on the steps of the building and now and again the crowd indulged in groaning and hooting and the noise penetrated and swelled in the court-room and disturbed its quiet majesty the ladies had taken possession of the gallery and there formed a compact mass of smiling and anxious faces those in the front row fanned themselves or leant forward with their gloved hands resting on the red velvet covering the rail of the balustrade further back in the shadow rose serried tiers of pink faces their bodies scarcely discernible amid the mass of laces ribbons and stuffs and silvery laughter whispered words shrill little cries fell from this rosy gossiping crowd the ladies fancied themselves at a theatre when philippe cayolle was brought in there ensued a great silence the ladies devoured him with their eyes 
some even examined him from top to toe with their opera glasses the big fellow with his energetic features was quite a success the women having come to judge of blanche's taste no doubt considered the young person less to blame when they beheld her lover's lofty stature and clear penetrating eyes philippe's attitude was calm and dignified he was dressed entirely in black and seemed to ignore the presence of the two gendarmes beside him rising up and reseating himself with all the grace of a man of the world now and again he calmly surveyed the crowd without the least effrontery he gazed several times up at the gallery and on each occasion he smiled in spite of himself so great was his wish to love and please even there the indictment was read and was overwhelming for the accused in the depositions of m de cazalis and his niece the incidents were distorted in a skilful and terrible manner it was stated that philippe had perverted blanche's mind by the aid of bad books the truth being that he had lent her two utterly puerile books by madame de genlis the indictment further said on the strength of blanche's version of the story that she had been carried away by force that she had clung to an almond tree and that during the flight the abductor had resorted to violence to oblige his victim to follow him the gravest allegation was founded on one of blanche's depositions she pretended she had never written philippe any letters and that the two produced by him were antedated ones which he had made her write at lambesque by way of precaution when the reading of the indictment was finished the place became filled with the noisy murmur of innumerable private conversations each spectator before coming to the court-house had his own version and now was discussing in a low voice the official one outside the mob was howling the presiding judge threatened to have the hall cleared and silence was gradually restored philippe's examination was then proceeded with when the presiding judge had asked the usual preliminary questions and had repeated to him the particulars of the indictment drawn up against him the young man without refuting them exclaimed in a clear voice i am accused of having been carried off by a young girl these words caused a general laugh the ladies hid themselves behind their fans to give full vent to their feelings philippe's words foolish and absurd as they seemed contained nevertheless a great deal of truth the presiding judge sensibly observed that no one had ever known a man of thirty to be carried off by a girl of sixteen to which philippe quietly replied neither has any one ever seen a girl of sixteen wandering along the highways passing through towns meeting hundreds of people without appealing to the first person she encountered to deliver her from her abductor her jailer and he endeavoured to show the material impossibility of the acts of violence and intimidation of which he was accused at every hour of the day blanche had been free to leave him to procure aid and succour if she had accompanied him it was because she loved him and had consented to the flight in addition to this philippe expressed the greatest affection for the young girl and the greatest deference for m de cazalis he admitted his errors and merely asked not to be branded as an infamous abductor the trial was adjourned to the morrow for the hearing of the witnesses that night the town was in an uproar the ladies spoke of philippe with affected indignation serious men referred to him more or less severely while the lower classes energetically took his part on the morrow the crowd outside the court-house was if anything larger and noisier than on the previous day the witnesses were nearly all for the prosecution m de girousse had not been summoned his rough frankness was dreaded and moreover he should rather have been arrested as an accomplice marius had begged him not to compromise himself in the affair he also feared the old count's violence which might spoil everything there was scarcely more than the evidence of one witness in philippe's favour that of the innkeeper at lambesque who declared that blanche was accompanying her lover of her own free will this evidence was however effaced so to say by the depositions of the other witnesses marguerite the milkwoman stammered and said she no longer remembered having brought the accused any letters from mademoiselle de cazalis it was thus that each witness served the deputy's interest either through fear or stupidity and loss of memory the pleadings commenced and went into the third day philippe's counsel defended him with dignified simplicity he did not seek to excuse what was reprehensible in his conduct he described him as being an ardent ambitious man led astray by dreams of love and wealth 
but at the same time he showed that the accused could not be convicted of abduction and that the affair itself negatived all idea of violence and intimidation the crown attorney's speech was most vindictive it was expected that it would have been milder and his energetic accusations produced a disastrous effect the jury brought in a verdict of guilty and philippe cayolle was condemned to five years imprisonment and to be exhibited in the pillory on one of the public squares of marseilles the gardener ayes was only condemned to a few months imprisonment the sentences were received with murmurs in the court-room whilst outside the crowd howled with rage End of chapters 9 and 10part one chapters eleven and twelve of the mysteries of marseilles by emile zola translated by ernest alfred visitelli this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter eleven how blanche and fine find themselves face to face when sentence was passed on philippe blanche was present hidden at the back of the gallery she was there by order of her uncle who had wished to completely stamp out her affection by showing her her lover standing between two gendarmes like a thief an elderly lady relative had consented to accompany her to this edifying scene as the two ladies were awaiting their carriage on the steps of the court-house the crowd pushing forward suddenly separated them blanche who was dragged to the centre of the place des Prêcheurs, was recognised by the market-women who began hooting and insulting her that's her that's her shouted the women the renegade the renegade the poor bewildered child not knowing where to fly to was half dead with shame and fright when a young girl energetically divided the howling mob that surrounded her and placed herself at her side it was fine the flower girl had also been to hear a sentence passed on philippe for the space of nearly three hours she had passed through all the anguish of hope and fear the crown attorney's speech had been crushing and on hearing the judgment she had begun to weep she had just quitted the court-house irritated and in a terrible state of excitement when the hooting of the market-women reached her she understood that blanche was there and that she would be able to avenge herself by abusing her she dashed forward with clenched fists and an insult ready on her lip according to her the young girl was the great culprit she had lied she had been guilty of perjury and cowardice at this thought all fine's plebeian blood rushed to her face and urged her on to shout and strike she rushed forward and separated the crowd to take her share of vengeance but when she was face to face with blanche when she saw her doubled in two by fright she had pity for the weak and trembling child she found her so small so captivating so delicately fragile that a generous thought of pardon came from her heart she violently pushed back the women who were shaking their fists at the young lady and stretching herself to her full height she exclaimed in a loud voice and what now aren't you ashamed she is alone and you are a hundred against her the almighty doesn't require your shouts to punish her let us pass she had taken blanche's hand and stood erect before the murmuring people who drew closer together so as not to allow the two young girls to get through them fine awaited with pale and trembling lips and as she encouraged the little lady with a glance she perceived that she would soon be a mother she turned quite pale and advanced towards the women let me pass she continued with greater violence do you not see the poor girl's condition and that you will kill her child she thrust back an old hag who was protesting and all the others gave way fine's words had suddenly made them silent and compassionate both girls were then able to retire blanche crimson with shame nestled in fear against her companion and feverishly hastened her footsteps in order to avoid the rue du pont moreau which was then swarming with people and full of noise the flower girl took the little rue st john on reaching the cour she conducted mademoiselle de cazalis to her residence the door of which was open she had not uttered a single word all the way blanche obliged her to enter the hall and there half closing the door she said to her in an affected tone of voice oh mademoiselle how grateful i am to you for your assistance those wicked women would have killed me don't thank me answered fine sharply i went there like the others to insult and beat you you yes i hate you i wish you had died in your cradle 
blanche looked at the flower-girl with astonishment she had drawn herself up her aristocratic instincts were getting the better of her and her lips were curling slightly with disdain the two young girls were facing each other one in all her slim gracefulness the other in all her energetic beauty they contemplated each other in silence feeling the rivalry of their race and heart thundering within them you are beautiful and wealthy continued fine bitterly why did you come and rob me of my sweetheart when later on you could only feel contempt and anger for him you should have sought out some one in your own sphere you would have found a youth as pale and cowardly as yourself who would have satisfied your little girlish feeling of love look here do not take our men or if you do we will tear your pink faces i do not understand stammered blanche who was becoming afraid again you don't understand listen i was in love with philippe he came and bought roses of me of a morning and my heart used to beat fit to break when i handed him my nosegays i know now where those flowers went to one day they told me he had run away with you i wept then i thought that you would love him fondly and he would be happy and now you have had him put in prison look here do not let us speak of that or i shall get angry and beat you she stopped palpitating then continued approaching nearer to blanche and burning her icy cold cheeks with her hot breath you don't know then how we love we poor girls we love with all our body with all our courage when we run away with a man we don't say afterwards that he took advantage of our weakness we clasp him in our arms with all our might to defend him ah if philippe had loved me but i am an unhappy girl a poor creature an ugly and fine began to sob and show herself as weak as mademoiselle de casalis the latter took her hand and in a voice broken with tears answered for pity's sake do not accuse me will you be my friend shall i lay my heart bare to you i suffer so much if you only knew i can do nothing i obey my uncle who subdues me in his grip of iron i am a coward i know it but i have not the strength to be otherwise and i love philippe the memory of him is always within me he told me it would be that my punishment if i ever betrayed him would be to love him eternally to keep him without end in my breast he is there he is burning me he will kill me a short time ago when they sentenced him i felt something within me that made me start and which tore my inside i weep look i ask your pardon all fine's anger had gone she was supporting blanche who was staggering you are right continued the poor child i do not deserve pity i have dealt a blow at the one i love and who will never love me more ah for mercy's sake if he one day become your husband speak to him of my tears ask him to forgive me what drives me mad is that i cannot tell him i worship him he would laugh he would not understand all my cowardice no do not speak to him of me let him forget me i shall be alone to weep there was a painful silence and your child asked fine my child said blanche bewildered i don't know my uncle would take it away from me shall i act as a mother to it the flower girl uttered these words in a tender and grave voice mademoiselle clasped her in her arms in a passionate embrace oh you are so good she said you know how to love try to see me at marseilles when the hour arrives i will trust in you at this moment the elderly relative returned after having sought in vain for blanche in the crowd fine promptly withdrew and reascended the cour as she reached the place de carmelite she perceived marius from afar conversing with philippe's lawyer the young man was in despair he would never have believed that they could pass such a severe sentence on his brother the five years imprisonment terrified him but he was perhaps still more painfully overcome at the thought of the public exhibition on a square at marseilles he recognized the deputy's hand in this punishment m de casalis had above all wished to deprive philippe of the power of pleasing to render him for ever unworthy of women's love the crowd surrounding marius were clamouring about injustice the public with one voice protesting against the enormity of the punishment 
and while the young man was engaged in a heated discussion with the lawyer losing his temper and showing symptoms of despair he felt a soft hand on his arm he turned sharply round and perceived fine at his side calm and smiling hope and follow me she said to him in an undertone your brother is saved chapter twelve which shows that a jailer's heart is not always made of stone while marius was running over the town before the trial to no purpose fine had been labouring on her side at the work of deliverance she had engaged in a regular campaign against the conscience of her uncle the jailer Revertega. she had taken up her quarters with him and passed her days at the prison she did her best from morning to night to make herself useful to be beloved by her uncle who lived alone like a growling bear with his two young daughters she attacked him in his paternal love she was full of charming ways with the children and spent all her savings in toys sweets and small articles of dress the little ones were not in the habit of being spoiled they showed riotous tenderness for their big cousin who danced them on her knees and distributed such nice beautiful things amongst them the father felt affected and thanked fine effusively he experienced the young girl's penetrating influence in spite of himself and was ill-tempered when he had to leave her she seemed to have brought the sweet perfume of her roses and violets with her the lodge smelt nice since she was there merry and light of foot her bright petticoats appeared to bring light air and gaiety all was smiling now in the dark room and revertega remarked with a broad grin that spring had taken up its abode with him the worthy man forgot himself in the caressing effluvia of this spring his heart softened and he lost the harshness and severity of his calling fine was too smart a girl not to play her part with fondling prudence she did not hasten events she brought the jailer little by little to feelings of compassion and kindness then she pitied philippe before him and obliged him to acknowledge that they were detaining him unjustly in prison when she held her uncle in her power off his guard and disposed to be obedient to her wishes she asked him if she could not visit the poor young man's cell he dared not say no but conducted her there allowed her to enter and remained watching at the door fine stood before philippe like a silly thing she gazed at him confused and blushing forgetting what she wanted to say to him the young man recognized her and hastened towards her with a movement full of tenderness and delight you here my dear child he exclaimed ah how kind of you to come to see me will you allow me to kiss your hand philippe assuredly imagined himself in his little apartment in the rue sainte and he was not perhaps far from dreaming of a fresh adventure the flower-girl surprised almost wounded withdrew her hand and gravely contemplated blanche's lover you must be mad monsieur philippe she answered you know very well that you are married now for me let us speak of serious things she lowered her voice and continued rapidly the jailer is my uncle and i have been working at your deliverance for the past week i wanted to see you to tell you that your friends have not forgotten you so hope philippe on hearing this good news regretted his amorous welcome give me your hand he said in an unsteady voice it is a friend who asks you for it to clasp it as an old comrade do you forgive me the flower-girl smiled without answering i think she resumed that i shall soon be able to throw the gate wide open to you on what day would you like to run away run away but i shall be acquitted what is the use of running away if i were to escape i should be acknowledging my guilt fine had not thought of this reasoning to her mind philippe was condemned beforehand but as a matter of fact he was right he must await the judgment as she preserved silence pensive and irresolute revertega gave two gentle knocks at the door to beg her to leave the cell well she resumed addressing the prisoner be ready all the same if you are condemned we will prepare your flight your brother and me have faith she withdrew leaving philippe almost in love she had now time before her to win over her uncle she continued the same tactics bewitching the worthy man with her goodness of heart and gracefulness and exciting his pity on his prisoner's lot in the end she even drew her two little cousins into the conspiracy and they at a word would have left their father to follow her one evening after having softened revertega's heart by all the cajoling she was capable of she ended by boldly asking him for philippe's liberty 
of course exclaimed the jailer if it only depended on me i would open the door to him immediately but it does only depend on you uncle fine innocently answered ah so you think but the next morning they would turn me adrift and send me starving with my two daughters these words made the flower-girl look quite serious but she resumed after a moment if i gave you money supposing i loved this youth supposing i were to implore you with joined hands to give him back to me you you exclaimed the astonished jailer he had risen he gazed at his niece to see if she were not laughing at him when he observed her grave and troubled manner he bent forward vanquished softened consenting by a sign faith he added i'll do what you like you are too good and pretty a girl for me to refuse fine kissed him and spoke of something else henceforward she was sure of victory on several occasions she returned to the conversation accustoming Auvertega to the idea that he would allow philippe to escape she did not wish to throw her relative into poverty and she offered him a first reward of fifteen thousand francs this offer dazzled the jailer who from that moment belonged to her body and soul and that is how fine had been able to say to marius with her clever smile follow me your brother is saved she accompanied the young man to the prison on the road she related to him all she had been doing how she had little by little won over her uncle marius's straightforward nature set him first of all against the plan then he remembered the intrigues to which m de cazalis had recourse and reflected that after all he was only making use of the same weapons as his adversaries and his mind was at ease he thanked fine most touchingly and was at a loss to know what proof to give her of his gratitude the young girl happy beyond measure hardly listened to his protestations of devotedness they could only see Ravertega in the evening the jailer from the very first words of the conversation pointed out his two little girls who were playing in a corner of the lodge and simply said to marius monsieur they are my excuse i would not ask a sou if i had not these children to feed this was a painful scene for marius he abridged it as much as possible he was aware that the jailer was giving way both to self-sacrifice and interest and if he could not despise him he none the less felt ill at ease at concluding such a bargain with him all was settled in a few minutes marius announced that he would leave the following morning for marseilles and would bring back with him the fifteen thousand francs promised by fine he would get them from his banker his mother had left a sum of fifty thousand francs which was deposited with m Birard, whose house was one of the most important and best known of the city the flower girl was to remain at aix and there await the young man's return he set out full of hope with the idea that his brother was already free but as he stepped out of the diligence at marseilles he learned a terrible piece of news which completely staggered him the banker Bérard had just been made a bankrupt End of chapters eleven and twelve part one chapters thirteen and fourteen of the mysteries of marseilles by emile zola translated by ernest alfred visitelli this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter thirteen a bankruptcy as there are many marius hastened to the banker Bérard. he could not believe the bad news he possessed all the confidence of a straightforward mind on the road he said to himself that the rumours that were afloat were perhaps after all only calumnies and so he clung to false hopes the loss of his fortune at this moment amounted to his brother's discomfiture it seemed to him that chance would not be so cruel the public must be mistaken Birard would hand him his money when he entered the banking-house he was seized with a pang of anguish he saw the terrible reality the offices were empty and these spacious rooms deserted and calm with their closed wire-work cages appeared to him funeral-like it is difficult to conceive what mournful desolation a fortune that is breaking up leaves behind it from the counting-house ledgers papers escaped a vague odour of ruin seals were to be seen everywhere with their white bands and large blotches of red wax marius crossed three rooms without meeting any one he at length discovered a clerk who had come to remove a few objects belonging to him from a desk 
and who answered him sharply that Monsieur Bérard was in his office. The young man entered all of a tremble, forgetting to close the door. He perceived the banker quietly at work, writing letters, setting papers in order, and balancing accounts. He was young, tall, had a handsome and intelligent face, was dressed with great care, wore rings on his fingers, and presented the appearance of a gallant and wealthy man. One would have said he had just had a brush up to receive his customers and explain his disaster to them himself. Moreover, his attitude appeared courageous. This man was either a victim of circumstances, full of resignation, or else an errant rascal brazening out his infamy. On seeing Marius enter, he looked him in the face, and his countenance wore an expression of sad straightforwardness. "'I was awaiting you, dear sir,' he said in an unsteady voice. "'You see, I am waiting for all those whose ruin I have brought about. "'I shall have courage to the end. "'I want each of them to assure himself that I have no cause to be ashamed.' "'He took up a register from his writing-table and opened it with some affectation. "'Here are my accounts,' he continued. "'My liabilities are a million, my assets one million five hundred thousand francs. "'The court will adjudicate, and I believe my creditors will lose nothing.' i am the first to suffer i have lost my fortune and credit i have allowed insolvent debtors to rob me in a most bare-faced way marius had not yet uttered a word in face of Bérard's broken-down serenity in presence of this display of austere grief he could not find a single reproach not one word of indignation he almost pitied this man who was heading the storm sir he said to him at last why did you not warn me when you saw your affairs getting into a mess and turning to the bad my mother was a friend of your mother's in remembrance of our former intimacy you should have made me withdraw this money which you were about to compromise from your control your present ruin strips me of everything and plunges me in despair Bérard ran forward and grasped marius's hands do not say that he exclaimed in a voice broken by tears do not overwhelm me ah you have no idea of the regret that is tormenting me when i saw the abyss i sought to catch hold of the branches i struggled till the last moment hoping to be able to save the amounts deposited in my hands you cannot imagine what terrible risks are run by those who deal in money marius had nothing to answer what could he say to a man who found his excuse in self-accusation he had no proofs he did not dare call Bérard a scamp, it only remained to him to withdraw. The banker spoke in such an aggrieved tone of voice, in such a convinced and straightforward manner, that he hastened to go away and leave him to himself. He felt oppressed at his misfortune. As he was crossing the empty offices again, the clerk who had at last gathered his things together took his bundle and hat and followed him. This clerk was muttering between his teeth at each step he looked in a strange way at marius and shrugged his shoulders below on the pavement he suddenly approached him well said he what think you of monsieur Bérard? he's a splendid actor isn't he the door of his office was open and made me laugh to see his distressed manner he almost wept the honest fellow permit me to tell you that you have just allowed yourself to be duped in the most beautiful way i don't understand you answered marius so much the better that is because you are an honest man for my part i have just left this shop with profound satisfaction i long since expected a stroke of business like this i foresaw the issue of this high comedy of theft i possess a peculiar knack for ferreting out jobbery in a firm explain yourself oh the story is simple i'll relate it to you in a few words ten years ago Bera started a banking business at the present day i have no doubt that he prepared his bankruptcy from the first moment this was his reasoning i wish to be rich because i have many desires and to be so as rapidly as possible because i am in a hurry to satisfy them but the straight road is rough and long i prefer to follow the paths of cheating and get my million together in ten years i will make myself a banker i shall have a counting-house where i will take the people's money as a bird-catcher snares the feathered songsters each year i will pilfer a round sum i will last as long as necessary i will stop when my pockets are full then i shall quietly suspend payment on two millions that will have been entrusted to me i will generously return two or three hundred thousand francs to my creditors 
the remainder hidden away in a little corner i know of will assist me to live as i desire as an idler and a voluptuary do you understand dear sir marius had listened to the clerk with stupefaction but he exclaimed at last what you are telling me is impossible Pirat has just confided to me that his liabilities amount to a million and his assets to a million and a half we shall all be paid in full the clerk held his sides with laughter oh, goodness gracious how simple you are he continued do you really believe in these assets of a million and a half first of all they will deduct madame Bérard's marriage portion from the amount now madame Bérard brought her husband fifty thousand francs which he in the marriage contract transformed into the handsome sum of five hundred thousand francs that as you see was a little robbery of four hundred and fifty thousand francs there remains a million and that million is almost entirely represented by suspicious book debts oh the proceeding is simple enough there are persons at marseilles who sell their signatures for a hundred sous piece and they live very well at this easy and lucrative business Bérard had got men of straw to sign him numbers of acceptances and he pocketed the money which he now pretends he lent to insolvent debtors if they give you ten per cent on your claim you may esteem yourself lucky and you will only receive that in eighteen months or two years when the assignees of the bankruptcy have concluded their work marius was completely upset thus the fifty thousand francs left him by his mother would be useless to him he wanted money at once and they talked to him of waiting two years and his ruin and despair were the work of a scoundrel who had just been laughing at him he flew into a passion this Bérard is a rascal he burst out he will be vigorously hunted down society must be freed of these crafty men who enrich themselves by the ruin of others the galleys await them the clerk again burst out laughing Bérard, he continued will perhaps get a fortnight's imprisonment that is all you don't seem to understand again listen to me you say the galleys await Bérard, continued the clerk the galleys only await clumsy folk during the ten years that our customer has been hatching and nursing his bankruptcy he has taken his precautions infamy such as this is quite a work of art his accounts are in order and he has the law on his side he knew beforehand how slight was the risk he ran the most the court can do will be to reproach him with heavy personal expenses they will tax him besides with having put a large number of bills of exchange in circulation which is a ruinous way of procuring money the penalties for such mistakes are ridiculous Pirard, as i told you will get a fortnight or a month's imprisonment at the most but exclaimed marius cannot one go and proclaim this man's crime on the public square prove it and have him sentenced no indeed one cannot do that proofs are wanting i tell you besides Bérard has not lost his time he has foreseen everything he has made powerful friends at marseilles imagining he would some day have need of their influence he is now a sort of inviolable personage in this city of coteries if they touched a single hair of his head all his friends would yell with grief and rage the most they could do would be to imprison him for form's sake when he leaves jail he will find his little million again he will make a show of luxury and will easily conquer fresh esteem you will then meet him driving out in his carriage extended on his cushions and the wheels of his vehicle will splash you with mud you will find him indifferent and idle with a large establishment enjoying all the luxuries of life and to worthily crown this success in the art of robbery they will bow to him like him and open him a new credit of honour and consideration marius preserved ferocious silence the clerk made him a slight bow and was about to leave him it is thus the farce is played he added i had all that on my heart and am glad to have met you to ease myself now a piece of advice keep what i have told you to yourself say good-bye to your money and do not bother any more about the sorry business reflect and you will see i am right good-day marius remained alone he had a tremendous desire to rush upstairs to Bérard and slap him in the face all his instincts of probity and justice had risen up within him urging him to drag the banker out into the street and proclaim his crime then his passion gave way to disgust he remembered his poor mother shamelessly deceived by this man and from that moment he felt nothing but crushing contempt for him 
he followed the clerk's advice and left the house endeavouring to forget that he had had money and that a rascal had robbed him of it what the clerk had told him was confirmed in every point Bérard was sentenced to a month's imprisonment for simple bankruptcy a year afterwards with florid complexion and easy insolent bearing he sauntered about marseilles displaying the jovial humour of a wealthy man he rang his purse in the clubs restaurants and theatres everywhere in fact where pleasure could be purchased and on his road he invariably met with complacent persons or dupes who bowed to him lowly chapter fourteen in which it is proved that it is possible to spend thirty thousand francs a year when only earning eighteen hundred marius went mechanically down to the port he walked straight on without noticing whither he was going he was so to say in a state of stupefaction one sole thought occupied his otherwise empty brain and kept repeating in a sing-song way that he needed fifteen thousand francs without a moment's loss of time he cast about him the vague glance of persons in despair as though he were looking on the ground to see if he could not find the money he required in the interstices of the paving-stones down at the port he felt a longing to be rich the merchandise piled up along the quays the ships bringing fortunes in their holds the noise the motion of that money-making crowd irritated him never before had he felt his poverty so strongly for a moment he was filled with envy revolt and bitter jealousy he asked himself why was he poor whilst others were rich and still that ever-recurring thought kept ringing in his head fit to break it fifteen thousand francs fifteen thousand francs his brother was awaiting him and he could not go back empty-handed he had only a few hours in which to save him from infamy but he could form no plan his bewildered senses did not furnish him with a single practical idea he turned about in his powerlessness exerted every effort of his mind in vain he struggled almost choking with rage and anguish he could never ask his employer m martelly to lend him fifteen thousand francs his earnings were too small to warrant such a loan moreover he knew the shipowner's upright principles and dreaded his reproaches if he admitted to him that he wished to purchase another's conscience m martelly would at once have refused the money marius suddenly had an idea he would not stay to discuss it in his mind but hurried off to his lodging in the rue sainte on the same floor as himself there resided a young clerk named charles blétry who was employed as a collector at the soap-works of messrs d'aste and degan a kind of intimacy had sprung up between these two young fellows living side by side marius had been won over by charles gentleness for the latter went regularly to church led an exemplary life and appeared to be of the strictest honesty yet during the past two years he had been spending money pretty freely he had refurnished his lodging in a luxurious style buying carpets hangings mirrors and rich furniture besides this he came home later lived more expensively but still remained gentle and honest quiet and pious at first his neighbour's outlay rather astonished marius who could not understand how a clerk earning eighteen hundred francs a year could afford to purchase such expensive things but charles told him that he had inherited some money and that he intended shortly to resign his position and live on his means he even placed himself and his purse at his disposal but marius declined to-day he recalled this offer and was about to knock at the young man's door and ask him for the means to save his brother a loan of fifteen thousand francs would not perhaps inconvenience him seeing how lavishly he was spending his money he proposed to himself to repay the amount in instalments persuaded that his neighbour would grant him all the time necessary the clerk however was not at home in the rue sainte and as marius was pressed for time he went off to messrs d'aste and degan's soap-works situated on the boulevard des dames when he arrived there and asked for charles blétry it seemed to him that he was eyed in a strange manner the workman told him to address himself to m d'ast who was in his office surprised at this reception marius decided to do so and found the manufacturer engaged in conversation with three gentlemen who stopped talking directly he showed himself can you tell me sir inquired the young man if m chablitry is at the factory d'ast exchanged a rapid glance with one of the persons present a stout pale and severe-looking man m chablitry will return presently he replied please wait for him are you a friend of his yes replied marius simply 
he resides in the same house as i do i have known him for about three years there was a pause the young man thinking he was in the way added with a bow and walking towards the door i am much obliged to you i will wait for him outside then the stout gentleman leant forward and said a few words to the manufacturer in a low voice m dast signed to marius to stay have the goodness to wait here he exclaimed your presence may be useful to us you must know something of m blitry's mode of living and can no doubt give us some information about him marius greatly astonished and not understanding hesitated excuse me resumed m dast with great politeness i see that my words surprise you and indicating the stout man he went on that gentleman is the police commissary of the district and i have sent for him to arrest charles blitry who has robbed us of sixty thousand francs in two years on hearing charles accused of theft marius understood everything he accounted for the young fellow's lavish expenditure and shuddered at the thought that he had been on the point of accepting his offers of service he would never have believed that his neighbour could have been guilty of a mean action he knew very well that there existed at marseilles as in all great centres of industry clerks who robbed their employers in order to satisfy their vices and their love of luxury he had often heard of clerks earning a hundred or a hundred and fifty francs a month and who managed to lose immense sums in gambling in the clubs to throw gold to loose women and to idle away their time in restaurants and cafes but charles seemed so pious so modest so honest he had played the hypocrite so artfully that marius had been taken in by these appearances of probity and he even now entertained doubts despite m dast's formal accusation he seated himself and awaited the development of the drama as a matter of fact he could not very well have done otherwise during half an hour a mournful silence reigned in the office the manufacturer was writing whilst the police commissary and the two officers mute and looking half asleep gazed vaguely before them with terrible patience such a sight was calculated to make marius honest had he been disposed to be otherwise a step was heard outside and the door slowly opened here's our man said m dast rising from his seat charles blitry entered quite unsuspiciously without even noticing the persons who were there you wish to see me sir he asked in that drawling voice peculiar to clerks when addressing their employers as m dast was looking him straight in the face he turned round and beheld the police commissary whom he knew by sight he became ghastly pale understanding that he was lost and his whole body trembled he had just walked into the meshes of the law with his eyes shut seeing that his frightened looks were accusing him he tried to pull himself together and to recover a little coolness and audacity yes i wish to see you m dast explained violently and you know why don't you ah scoundrel you'll never rob me again i don't know what you mean stammered blitry i've never robbed you what is it you accuse me of the police commissary had seated himself at the manufacturer's desk ready to draw up his report whilst the two officers were guarding the door kindly tell me sir said the police commissary to m dast how you discovered that m blitry had been guilty of embezzling your money then m dast told the story of the crime he noticed that occasionally his collector was an extremely long time in getting in certain monies but as he had unlimited confidence in the young man he attributed these delays to the dilatoriness of his customers the first embezzlement must have occurred quite eighteen months back anyhow the day before one of his customers being on the verge of bankruptcy he had gone personally to demand payment of an account amounting to five thousand francs and had thereupon learnt that blitry had collected it some weeks previously much alarmed he had hurried back to the factory and by going through the cashier's books had convinced himself that about sixty thousand francs were missing the police commissary then proceeded to question blitry the latter taken unawares and unable to deny the facts concocted a ridiculous story one day he said i lost my pocket-book containing forty thousand francs i had not the courage to tell m dast of this great misfortune so i embezzled some money to gamble on the stock exchange hoping to win and so reimburse the firm the police commissary asked him for particulars confused him by his questions and forced him to contradict himself Blitry then tried another falsehood you are right he resumed 
and i did not lose the pocket-book i prefer to tell you everything the truth is i was robbed myself i gave shelter to a young man who was hard up one night he went off with my collector's bag and it contained a considerable sum of money come don't make your crime worse by lying said the commissary with that terrifying patience of police officials you know very well that we can't believe you it's no use inventing such rigmaroles he then turned to marius and continued i asked m das to detain you sir thinking you might be useful to us in our inquiry the accused is you said your neighbour do you know anything about his mode of life will you not beseech him with us to tell the truth marius felt dreadfully embarrassed he pitied Blétry, who was reeling like a drunken man and looking at him imploringly the man was not a hardened scoundrel no doubt he had given way to temptation to a weak mind and heart but marius's conscience would not be stilled and commanded him to say what he knew he did not reply to the police commissary directly but preferred to address himself to Blétry. listen charles he said i do not know whether you are guilty i have always found you good and quiet i am aware that you support your mother and that you are beloved by all who know you if you have been guilty of wrong admit your folly you will cause less suffering to those who love and esteem you by frankly owning your guilt and showing sincere repentance marius spoke in a gentle and convincing voice Blétry, whom the curt words of the police commissary had left dumb and inwardly irritated gave way before his friend's kindness he thought of his mother he thought of the esteem and the friendships he was about to lose and his emotion nearly choked him he burst into sobs weeping hot tears in his closed hands and for some minutes no sound was heard by the heart-rending cry of his despair it was a complete avowal the spectators of the scene remained silent well yes Blétry exclaimed at last amidst his tears i have robbed i'm a scoundrel i didn't know what i was about i commenced by taking a few hundred francs then i required a thousand two thousand five thousand ten thousand francs at a time it seemed as if someone was behind me urging me on and my needs my appetites were ever increasing but what did you do with all that money asked the police commissary i don't know i gave it away lost it at play devoured it somehow you don't know the life i was happy enough in my poverty and troubled with nothing i loved to go to church and to live worthily like an honest man but then i had a taste of luxury and vice i got to know women i bought expensive things i was mad can you give me the names of the women with whom you squandered the money you were embezzling as if i knew their names i met them here there everywhere in the streets and at public balls they came because i had my pockets full of gold and they went off when they were empty then i lost a lot playing baccarat at the clubs what turned me into a thief was seeing certain well-born young men throwing their money out of window and revelling in wealth and idleness i wanted to know women as they did to have noisy joys nights spent in gambling and debauchery i required thirty thousand francs a year and i was only earning eighteen hundred so i ended by stealing the poor wretch suffocating overcome by grief dropped on to a chair marius went up to m dast who was also much affected and beseeched him to be merciful he then hastened to withdraw from a scene which made his heart bleed he left Blétry quite prostrated by a kind of nervous stupor some months later he learnt that the young man had been condemned to five years imprisonment once outside marius experienced a great feeling of relief he understood that by assisting at charles arrest he had received a lesson a few hours before when down at the port he had indulged in some evil ideas of fortune he had just seen where such thoughts might lead him and suddenly he remembered why he had gone to the soapworks he had only an hour left in which to find the fifteen thousand francs which were to save his brother end of chapters thirteen and fourteen part one 
Chapters fifteen and sixteen of the Mysteries of Marseille by Emile Zola. Translated by Ernest Alfred Visitelli. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter fifteen. Philippe refuses to save himself. Marius had to admit to himself how powerless he was. He knew not at what door to knock. It is not easy for a simple clerk to borrow fifteen thousand francs in the course of an hour he walked slowly down the rue x straining his mind but finding nothing in his wearied brain money troubles are terrible one would sooner battle with an assassin than fight against the imperceptible and crushing phantom of poverty nobody has ever yet been able to conjure up a five-franc piece when the young man hopeless and at his wit's end reached the cour Bazins, he decided to return to x empty-handed the coach was about to start and there was only one vacant seat left an outside one he took it with delight preferring to remain in the open air for anxiety was stifling him and he hoped that the vast horizon of the open country would calm his fever it was a sad journey in the morning he had passed the same trees the same hills and hope which brought a smile to his lips then shed a joyous brightness over the fields and slopes now as he again beheld the same countryside he enveloped it in all the gloom that was weighing on his mind the heavy vehicle lumbered on the cultivated land the pine woods the little hamlets succeeded each other at either side of the road and marius found in each change of landscape a deeper air of mourning a more poignant grief night fell and it seemed to him that the entire country was covered by an immense pall on reaching x he walked slowly towards the prison he felt that he would always arrive too soon with his evil news when he entered the jail it was nine o'clock robert Tegas and fine were killing time by having a game at cards on a corner of the table the flower girl jumped up gleefully and ran to meet the young man well she asked him with a bright smile and throwing back her head coquettishly marius had not the courage to reply he sat down exhausted speak up cried fine you've got the money no the young man answered simply after a moment he told them of Bérard's failure blétry's arrest all the misfortunes he had encountered at marseilles he wound up by saying i am now no more than a poverty-stricken wretch my brother will remain a prisoner the flower girl remained painfully surprised her hands clasped in that attitude of pity peculiar to provencal women she repeated in a rueful tone of voice how sad how sad she looked at her uncle and seemed to be urging him to speak robert Tega eyed the two young people compassionately it was evident that a struggle was taking place within him at length he seemed to make up his mind and said to marius listen to me sir my duties have not hardened me to such an extent as to render me insensible to the sufferings of worthy people i have already said why i was willing to sell you your brother's freedom but i do not wish you to think that the love of money alone is prompting me if unfortunate circumstances prevent your placing me at once out of the reach of poverty i will nevertheless open the door to m philippe you can come to my assistance later on and pay me the fifteen thousand francs little by little when you are able to do so fine clapped her hands on hearing these words she flung her arms round her uncle's neck and embraced him heartily marius looked very grave as he replied i cannot accept your sacrifice i am already reproaching myself with having tempted you to disregard your duty and i refuse to increase my responsibility by also casting you adrift without a crust of bread the flower girl turned to the young man almost angrily hold your tongue she cried monsieur philippe must be saved i intend that he shall be besides we don't need you to open the prison doors come uncle if m philippe is willing his brother can have nothing to say marius followed the young woman and the jailer who were going in the direction of the prisoner's cell they had taken a dark lantern and were gliding softly along the passages in order not to excite remark all three entered the cell and closed the door behind them philippe was asleep robert Tegas, moved by his niece's tears had softened the prison regulations as much as possible for the young man he brought him lunch and dinner which fine herself prepared he lent him books and had even given him an additional rug the cell had been made habitable and philippe was not too uncomfortable there 
he knew moreover that they were working for his escape he woke up and held out his hands effusively to his brother and the flower-girl you have come for me he asked smiling yes answered fine dress yourself at once marius remained silent his heart was beating quickly he feared that a strong desire for liberty might lead his brother to accept the means of flight which he himself had thought right to decline so everything is agreed and arranged resumed philippe i may go off without fear or regret you have paid the promised amount you don't answer me marius fine hastened to intervene haven't i told you to make haste she cried what are you troubling yourself about she threw him his clothes and added that she would wait in the passage marius stopped her excuse me he said i cannot leave my brother in ignorance of our misfortunes and in spite of fine's impatience he related again the result of his journey to marseilles he however gave his brother no advice but left him at full liberty to come to a decision himself so then exclaimed philippe completely crushed you've not given the money to the jailer and we're without a copper don't worry yourself about that replied Robertega, drawing near you can help me later on the prisoner said nothing he was no longer thinking of his escape his thoughts were centred on his poverty on the sorry figure he would henceforth cut once he was at liberty no more smart clothes no more strolls in fashionable haunts no more love adventures but besides all this he had some chivalrous feelings some poetical ideas which forbade him accepting Robertega's sacrifice he lay back on his miserable bed drew the clothes up to his chin and said quietly very well i shall stay where i am marius's face beamed fine looked overwhelmed she tried to prove the necessity for the escape she spoke of the public exhibition of the infamy of the pillory she grew excited and looked superb in her passion and philippe gazed at her admiringly my beautiful child he replied you might succeed in making me yield if i had not grown blind and obstinate in this cell but really i have done enough mean things already without wishing to burden my conscience with any more we are in the hands of providence moreover all is not yet lost marius will free me he'll find the money somehow you see if he don't you shall come and fetch me when you've paid my ransom and we'll fly together and i'll give you a kiss he spoke almost gaily marius took his hand thanks brother he said be of good cheer fine and Robertega went out whilst philippe and marius remained alone a few minutes they had some serious and affecting conversation they spoke of blanche and the child she was expecting when the visitors were back in the jailer's room the flower-girl in despair asked marius what he thought of doing i shall make some further efforts he replied unfortunately we have not much time and i scarcely know where to seek assistance i can give you a piece of advice observed Robertega. there's a banker in this town living close by here named rostand who would perhaps consent to lend you a considerable sum but i must warn you that this rostand has the reputation of being an usurer marius had not the choice of means thanks he said i will call on the man to-morrow chapter sixteen the usurers m rostand was a clever man he pursued his shameful calling undisturbed to give an honest appearance to his trade he had opened a banking-house and having paid for the license he was legally established at times he could even be a trifle honest and would lend money at the same rate of interest as the other bankers of the town but there was so to say a back office in his establishment wherein he took delight in elaborating his knavish schemes six months after the opening of his bank he became the managing director of a company of usurers a black band which entrusted him with certain funds for investment the combination was of a simplicity quite patriarchal people endowed him with the bump of usury and who feared to indulge their propensity at their own risk and peril brought him their money and requested him to turn it to good account by these means he always had a considerable capital to turn over and was unable to take full advantage of needy borrowers those who furnished the money remained in the background he had solemnly undertaken to lend at a fabulous rate of interest at fifty sixty and even eighty per cent the sleeping partners met at his office once a month he produced his accounts and they shared the spoil 
but he so arranged matters as to keep the larger share for himself in fact he robbed the robbers it was especially against the small traders that he directed his operations when a shopkeeper came to see him the day before a payment fell due he imposed most exorbitant terms the tradesman invariably accepted them and in this way he had brought about more than fifty failures in ten years moreover all was fish that came to his net he would as soon lend five francs to a market woman as a thousand to a cattle dealer he kept a sharp lookout and never lost an opportunity of investing ten francs one day to receive twelve the next he was on the watch for noble youths fast young men who fling their money out of window he filled their hands with gold so that they might throw the more and he stood outside to pick up what they threw he also took trips into the country and tempted the peasants when the crops failed he dispossessed them piece by piece of their land and farms his house had thus become a veritable pitfall which swallowed up whole fortunes the individuals the entire families he had ruined were well known no one was ignorant of his underhand dealings his sleeping partners were pointed at in the streets wealthy men ex-officials merchants and even workmen but proof was lacking his banker's license shielded him and he was too clever to allow himself to be caught napping since he had first started his nefarious speculations rostan had only once found himself in danger the affair created a great sensation a lady belonging to a wealthy family borrowed a rather large sum of him she was very pious and had bereft herself of her fortune by giving money and charity on all sides knowing that she was completely without means he insisted upon her signing bills with her brother's name having these forgeries in his possession he was certain of being paid by the brother who would be anxious to avoid a scandal the poor lady signed as required charity had ruined her and the weak kindliness of her nature brought about her fall his calculations turned out correct and the first bills were paid but as more and more were presented the brother grew tired of paying and determined to get to the bottom of the matter he called on rostand and threatened to expose him he said that he would sooner see his sister disgrace than allow himself to be further robbed with impunity by such a scoundrel the usurer thoroughly cowed gave up the bills he still possessed he did not however lose a copper on the transaction having advanced the loan at cent per cent since then rostand had been extremely careful he invested the capital of the black band with a skill which won him the admiration and confidence of the usurers whilst his sleeping partners were airing themselves in the sunshine like worthy people who would never rob a soul he remained buried in a great dark office it was there that the golden coins of the concern grew and multiplied rostand had ended by acquiring quite an affection for his fraudulent and thiefish trade some members of the band applied their profits to satisfying their passions their appetites for luxurious and dissolute living he took his sole delight in being a clever rascal he felt as much interest in each of his operations as if it had been a drama or a comedy he was witnessing he applauded himself when his plan succeeded and then felt the pride the joy of a successful author then he spread out on a table the money he had stolen and lost himself in all the voluptuous sensations of the miser it was to such a man that robert Degas had naively sent marius the latter knocked at rostand's door on the following morning towards eight o'clock it was a heavy square house and the closed shutters gave it a bare cold appearance an air of mystery and mistrust a toothless old waiting-woman attired in a dirty ragged cotton gown opened a door a few inches monsieur rostand asked marius he is in but engaged replied the servant without opening the door any wider the young man losing patience pushed the door open and entered the hall very well he said i'll wait surprised and scarcely knowing what to do the servant seeing she could not get rid of him took him up to the first floor and left him by himself in a kind of ante-room it was a small dark apartment hung with greenish wallpaper discoloured by large damp stains the only furniture consisted in a rush-bottomed chair upon which marius seated himself opposite him an open door showed the interior of an office in which a clerk was writing with a quill pen which made a grating noise as it travelled over the paper there was another door on his left which probably led to the banker's private room marius waited a long time 
the stale smell of old papers pervaded the atmosphere around him the apartment was sickeningly dirty and the nakedness of the walls gave it a lugubrious appearance dust was accumulated in all the corners and cobwebs hung from the ceiling the young man was suffocating and getting out of patience with the grating of the quill pen which kept on increasing suddenly he heard voices in the adjoining room and as the words reached him clear and distinct he was on the point of discreetly moving further off when certain expressions rooted him to the spot there are some conversations which it is permissible to overhear scrupulousness not being intended as a safeguard of the privacy of certain people a harsh voice no doubt that of the master of the house was saying with friendly bluntness gentlemen we are all here let's talk business the sitting is open i will render you a faithful account of my operations of the month and we will then proceed to the division of the profits there was slight noise a sound of private conversations dying away marius who so far had not understood felt nevertheless a lively curiosity he guessed that some strange scene was taking place on the other side of the door as a matter of fact the usurer rostand was closeted with his worthy associates of the black band the young man had called just at the time of their meeting when the managing director was about to produce his accounts explain his operations and divide the spoil the harsh voice continued before entering into details i must inform you that this month's results are not so good as last month's we then had an average of sixty per cent to-day we have only fifty-five various exclamations arose similar to the protesting murmurs of a dissatisfied crowd there must have been about fifteen persons in the room gentlemen continued rostand with bitter raillery i have done what i could and you ought to thank me the business becomes more difficult every day however here are my accounts and i will give you a rapid statement of some of the affairs i have transacted complete silence ensued for a few seconds then there was a rustling of paper and the sound of the leaves of a ledger being turned over marius beginning to understand listened more attentively than ever rostand commenced to go over his various operations giving some explanations as to each one he spoke in the sing-song voice of a court official i lent he said ten thousand francs to young count de salvi a youth of twenty who will attain his majority in nine months time he had lost at play and his mistress it seems required a large amount from him he signed bills at three months for eighteen thousand francs these bills are post dated the day of his majority so as to make all secure the family owns large estates it's an excellent affair a flattering murmur greeted the usurer's words on the morrow he continued i received a visit from the count's mistress who was exasperated her lover only having given her two or three thousand franc notes she swore that she would bring me the count bound hand and foot to negotiate a fresh loan i shall then require the assignment of one of his estates we have still nine months to shear the young fool whom his mother leaves without money rostand turned over some leaves of the ledger and resumed after a short silence jourdier a cloth merchant who each month requires a few hundred francs to meet his bills at the present time his business belongs almost entirely to us i last lent him five hundred francs at sixty per cent if he asks for anything next month i'll make him bankrupt and we shall take the whole of his stock marianne a market woman every morning she wants ten francs and every evening she returns me fifteen i fancy she drinks it's a small affair but a certain profit a fixed income of five francs a day laurent a peasant of the roque favour district he has made over to me piece by piece some land he owned near arc the ground is worth five thousand francs and has only cost us two thousand i had the man evicted from the place and his wife and children came here and made quite a scene you'll take it into account i hope these annoyances i have to put up with andre a miller he owed us eight hundred francs and i threatened him with an execution he hurried here and implored me not to ruin him by letting every one know of his insolvency i consented to effect the seizure myself without employing a bailiff and by that means i obtained over twelve hundred francs worth of furniture and linen i made quite four hundred francs by being good-natured a tremor of satisfaction passed through his colleagues marius could hear the smothered laughter of those men who were rejoicing at rostand's cleverness the latter continued now for the simple cases three thousand francs at forty per cent to the merchant simon 
fifteen hundred francs at fifty per cent to charançon the cattle dealer two thousand francs at eighty per cent to the marquis de cantarel one hundred francs at thirty-five per cent to the son of tingre the notary and rostand went on thus for a quarter of an hour reading out names and figures mentioning loans varying from ten francs to ten thousand and interest from twenty to one hundred per cent but what were you telling us my dear friend asked a thick husky voice when he had finished you have worked wonderfully well this last month all these assets are excellent it is impossible for the profit not to average more than fifty-five per cent you no doubt made a mistake when you mentioned that figure i never make a mistake the usurer curtly answered marius who had almost placed his ear against the door thought he noticed some hesitation in the wretch's voice i have not yet told you everything rostand continued with embarrassment we lost twelve thousand francs a week ago these words created quite an uproar and marius hoped for a moment that these scoundrels would set upon one another hang it all listen to me cried the banker amid the tumult i help you to make enough money for you to excuse me if you lose some once in a way besides it wasn't my fault i was robbed he uttered these words with all the indignation of an honest man when quiet was restored he added here's the whole story monnier a corn dealer and a solvent man about whom i had obtained reliable information came to borrow twelve thousand francs i said i could not lend them myself but that i knew an old skinflint who would perhaps advance the money at exorbitant interest he called again the next day and told me that he was ready to agree to any conditions i told him that five thousand francs interest for six months was required he agreed you see it was as good as a gold mine whilst i went to fetch the cash he sat down at my table and wrote out seventeen bills of a thousand francs each i examined them and placed them on the corner of this desk then i conversed a few minutes with monnier who got up and after putting his money away prepared to leave when he was gone i took the documents to put them in a place of safety but just fancy the rogue had changed the bills for a similar bundle of worthless ones scribbled all over payable to the deuce knows who and unsigned i was robbed and nearly had a fit i ran after the swindler whom i found strolling along the cour in the sunshine at the first word i uttered he called me a usurer and threatened me with the police commissary that monnier has the reputation of being a loyal and upright man and so upon reflection i preferred to hold my tongue this story had been several times interrupted by the angry remarks of the listeners you must admit rostand that you have been wanting in energy observed the husky voice well we've lost our money and we'll only get fifty-five per cent another time you must look after our interests better now we'll divide the profits in spite of his anguish and indignation marius could not help smiling monnier's robbery was like a grand piece of comedy and in his heart he applauded the knave who had cheated a knave he now knew the trade rostand followed he had not lost a word of what had been said in the adjoining room and he easily pictured to himself the scene that had been passing there leaning back on his chair his ear close to the door he could see in his mind's eye the usurers quarrelling among themselves with eager looks and faces contracted by the evil passions which were agitating them he felt a kind of bitter mirth when he thought of his reason for coming to that thieves den what simplicity good heavens it was there he had thought to obtain the fifteen thousand francs which were to save philippe and he had not been waiting an hour for the banker to turn him out like a beggar or else rostand would demand fifty per cent interest and rob him impudently at that thought and with the knowledge that there was there close to him a meeting of rascals who throve on the shame and misfortunes of a town he jumped up and laid his hand on the door-handle one could hear the clink of gold within the room the usurers were dividing their spoil each one was pocketing his share of a month's swindling that money which they were counting and whose music voluptuously titillated their flesh seemed at times to sob aloud amidst the quivering silence broken only by the banker's voice uttering figures with metallic harshness he calculated each one's share named an amount and let fall a pile of jingling coins marius turned the handle and with pale face and resolute gaze stood a few seconds silent in the doorway the young man had a strange spectacle before him rostand was standing at his stable behind him was an open safe from which he took handfuls of gold around the table were seated the members of the black band 
some awaiting their share others pocketing the money they had just received every minute the banker consulted his accounts examining a ledger and doled out the money with a careful hand his confederates were watching his movements at the sound of the opening door all the heads turned quickly round with fright and when they beheld marius grave and indignant they instinctively closed their fingers on their heaps of gold for a moment all was confusion and apprehension the young man recognized the wretches perfectly he had met them in the streets with heads erect and dignified means and he had even bowed to some who might have saved his brother they were all wealthy esteemed and influential there were among them ex-government officials landed proprietors and persons who frequented the churches and drawing-rooms of the town to see them thus cringing and paling beneath his gaze he could not restrain a movement of disgust rostand rushed forward his eyes blinking feverishly his thick discoloured lips trembling all his miser's red and wrinkled face expressing a sort of sacred surprise what do you want he asked marius stammering you have no right to walk into a house in this manner i wanted fifteen thousand francs replied the young man in a cold and scoffing tone of voice i've no money the usurer hastened to say retreating to the door of his safe oh be easy i no longer wish to be robbed i must tell you that i've been waiting an hour on the other side of the door and have heard all you've been saying this statement came like the blow of a club and caused the members of the black band to bow their heads these men had still some slight feeling of respectability left and there were some who hid their faces in their hands rostand having no reputation to lose gradually recovered himself he again went up to marius and raised his voice who are you he cried by what right do you come into my house listening at doors why do you come into my private office if you have nothing to ask of me who am i said the young man in a calm quiet tone i am an honest man and you are a rascal by what right did i listen at this door by the right that respectable people have of unmasking scoundrels why have i come in here simply to tell you that you are a villain rostand was trembling with rage he could not account for the presence of this avenger who thus told him the truth to his face he was about to shout out to fall upon marius when the latter energetically motioned him back keep quiet he resumed i am going i am stifling here but i would not go without relieving my feelings a bit ah gentlemen you have a voracious appetite you gluttonously share among you the tears and despair of entire families you gorge yourselves with robbery and swindling i am glad to be able to trouble your digestion a trifle and to make you shiver with anxiety rostand attempted to stop him but he continued in a louder tone of voice highwaymen possess at least courage they fight and risk their lives but you gentlemen you rob shamelessly in secret and to think that it was not necessary for you to become swindlers to live you are every one of you well to do you behave like scoundrels heaven forgive me for pleasure some of the usurers rose menacingly you've never before seen the anger of an honest man have you added marius scoffingly truth both annoys and frightens you you are accustomed to be treated with the respect due to decent people and as you have arranged to hide your baseness and to live esteemed by all you have ended by yourselves believing in the respect accorded to your hypocrisy well i have chosen that for once in your lives you should be insulted as you deserve and that's why i entered here the young man saw that they would fall upon him if he went on he retreated step by step towards the door keeping the usurer at bay by the firmness of his gaze once there he stopped again i know very well gentlemen he said that i cannot bring you to the bar of human justice your wealth your influence and your skill render you inviolable if i were foolish enough to fight against you it is i no doubt who would be crushed but anyhow i shall not have to reproach myself with having been in the company of such men as you without having shewn them my contempt i would that my words were red-hot irons that would brand you on your faces the crowd would follow you with its howls and perhaps the lesson would do you good share your gold if there's an atom of honesty left in you it will burn your hands marius closed the door and went off when he reached the street he smiled sadly 
he saw life spread out before him in all its shame and wretchedness and perceived he was performing the noble and ridiculous part of a don quixote of justice and honour end of chapters fifteen and sixteen part one chapters seventeen eighteen and nineteen of the mysteries of marseilles by emile zola translated by ernest alfred visitelli this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter seventeen two shameless characters when marius had related his adventure to the jailer and flower-girl the latter exclaimed we're no better off than we were why did you lose your temper that man might have lent you the money women possess a certain obstinacy which renders the feminine conscience easier therefore fine loyal girl though she was would perhaps have closed her ears at rostand's or even have made use of the secret chance placed in her possession robert Higa felt rather ashamed at having advised marius to go to the banker i warned you sir he said i was aware of the rumours afloat about the man but i thought a great deal was said out of spite had i known the real truth i would never have sent you to him marius and fine spent the afternoon in forming extravagant plans and cudgelling their brains in vain for a means of obtaining the fifteen thousand francs necessary for philippe's safety what exclaimed the young woman can't we find in all this town some kind soul willing to help us out of our trouble are there no rich people here who would lend their money at a reasonable rate come uncle think a bit tell me of some benevolent person whom i may go and plead to on my knees robert Tega shook his head well yes he replied there are worthy people here rich folk who would perhaps assist you but you have no claim on their bounty you can't go and ask them for money right off you must apply to money-lenders or bill discounters and as you've no solid security to offer you're obliged to deal with usurers oh i know some old misers old rascals would be delighted to have you in their clutches or else would chuck you out like dangerous beggars as fine listened to her uncle all these money questions got rather mixed in her young head she was so frank so open-hearted that it seemed to her quite natural and easy to ask for and obtain a large sum in a couple of hours there are millionaires who can so easily dispose of a few thousand francs without inconveniencing themselves she therefore persisted come think well she said again to the jailer do you really know of nobody we might apply to robert Tega, greatly affected looked at her anxious face he would rather not have laid bare the unsavoury realities of life before this young creature full of the hopes of youth no really he replied i know of no one i have spoken to you of old rascals who have shamelessly made large fortunes they like rostand lend a hundred francs to receive a hundred and fifty at the end of three months he hesitated and then went on in a lower tone of voice shall i relate to you the history of one of these men his name is Romieux, and he's a retired notary his game was to prosecute a terrible chase after inheritances he would introduce himself into families where his calling should have made him a confidant and friend and there study the ground and prepare his ambuscades whenever he came across a weak-minded person who had property to leave he became his creature circumvented him and drew him gradually into his meshes by obsequiousness and blandishments by quite a clever comedy of little attentions and filial tenderness ah he was a clever fellow you should have seen him fascinate his prey making himself supple and winning gaining a hold on the affections of some old man he ousted the natural heirs the nephews and cousins by degrees and then drew up a new will which despoiled them of their relative's fortune and appointed him sole legatee but he never hurried matters he would take ten years to reach his goal to mature things thoroughly he advanced with feline craftiness creeping along in the dark never springing upon his prey until it lay panting rendered inert by his gaze and caresses he hunted inheritances like the tiger hunts game with noiseless cruelty and a ferocity hidden behind smirks and smiles fine fancied she was being told a story out of the arabian nights she listened to her uncle her eyes wide open with astonishment marius was becoming familiar with base actions and you say this man made a large fortune he asked the jailer yes the latter replied there are some strange stories told which prove rumier's amazing cleverness for instance 
ten or fifteen years ago he worked his way into the good graces of an old lady who possessed a fortune of close upon five hundred thousand francs it was quite a conquest the old lady became his slave almost to the point of refusing herself a crust of bread in order not to encroach upon the wealth she wished to leave to this demon who possessed her like a devil and obtained complete mastery over her she was indeed possessed in the true sense of the word all the holy water of a church would not have been sufficient to cast him out a visit from rumieux would plunge her into endless ecstasy when he bowed to her in the street it was as though she had received a shock she became quite red with joy one has never been able to understand by what flattery by what skilful and irresistible advance the notary had been able to penetrate so deeply into this heart which was closed by the most exaggerated piety when the old lady died she despoiled her direct heirs and left her five hundred thousand francs to romieux everybody expected this would happen after a pause Ravert Egas went on listen i can give you another instance the anecdote contains quite a cruel comedy in which romieux gave proof of rare artfulness a man named richard who had amassed several hundred thousand francs in business retired and went to live with a worthy couple who nursed him and enlivened his old age in exchange for their affectionate attentions the retired merchant had promised to leave them his fortune they lived on in this expectation they had several children whom they hoped to establish well in life but rumieux happened to pass by and soon became richard's intimate friend he would take him occasionally into the country and secretly obtained complete mastery over him the family which had received the retired merchant suspected nothing they continued to nurse him and await the inheritance during fifteen years they lived thus quite easy in their minds forming plans for the future and feeling certain of being happy and rich richard died and on the morrow rumieux was found to have inherited his property to the great surprise and grief of this family swindled both in its affections and its interest such is the hunter after inheritances when he moves one cannot hear the sound of his claws upon the ground his bounds are too rapid to be measured he has already sucked his prey dry before he has been observed to be upon it fine felt filled with disgust no no she said i will never go and ask money of such a man don't you know another uncle all usurers are alike my poor child replied the jailer they all have some indelible stain on their lives i know an old skinflint who has more than a million and who lives alone in a dirty tumble-down house guillaume buries himself out of sight in his foul den the damp is rotting the walls the floor is not even paved but is a sort of muck-heap consisting of mud and filth cobwebs hang from the ceiling the dust lies thick over everything while a dull lugubrious light penetrates through the window-panes which are coated thick with dirt the old miser seems to sleep amidst impurities like the waiting spider sleeps in the centre of his web on the beam when some prey becomes entangled in the nets he has spread he draws it to him and sucks it dry of its life-blood his food consists solely of vegetables cooked in plain water and he never satisfies his hunger he clothes himself in rags and leads the life of a leprous beggar and all this for the sake of keeping the money he has already accumulated and of adding unceasingly to his store he only lends at cent per cent fine turned pale at the picture her uncle was setting before her guillaume has friends however who extol his piety continued the jailer he believes in neither heaven nor hell and would sell the saviour a second time if he had the opportunity but he has been clever enough to sham great devoutness and this piece of acting has won him the esteem of certain narrow minds he may be met dragging himself about the churches kneeling behind every pillar using gallons of holy water inquire throughout the town ask any one what good action this saintly person has ever done he worships the almighty it is said but he robs his fellow man it's impossible to name a single creature he has ever assisted he lends at an usurious rate he has never given a copper in charity were some poor wretch to be dying at his door he wouldn't take him a crust of bread nor a glass of water if he enjoys any kind of esteem it's because he has stolen it the same as everything else he possesses robert Egas stopped and looked at his niece scarcely knowing whether he should continue and you would be simple enough to apply to such a man 
said he at last i cannot tell you everything i cannot speak of his vices for the old scoundrel has ignoble ones at times he forgets his avarice to satisfy his lust there are shocking stories told of him enough cried marius energetically fine confused and dismayed bowed her head having lost all courage and hope i see money is too dear the young man resumed and that one must sell oneself to obtain it ah if i had only the time to earn the sum we require by hard work then all three remained silent unable to find a means of salvation chapter eighteen in which there is a glimmer of hope the following morning marius urged on by necessity decided on calling on m de girousse he had been thinking of applying to the old count ever since he had been in search of money but had always refrained from doing so on account of the nobleman's original bluntness he felt ashamed to own his poverty and blushed at the thought of having to confess to what use he proposed putting the amount he was asking for nothing seemed more painful to him than to be compelled to take any third party into his confidence in regard to his brother's escape and m de girousse frightened him more than any one else when the young man called the mansion was closed the count having just left for lambesque his errand was so disagreeable to him that he was almost glad at finding no one at home he remained on the cour irresolute not daring to go to lambesque and in despair at being reduced to an action as he advanced along one of the paths quite upset and with his eyes wandering vaguely about him he met fine it was seven o'clock in the morning the flower-girl with her best clothes on had a small travelling-bag in her hand and appeared all smiles and determination where are you off to he inquired with surprise i am going to marseilles she answered he looked at her curiously asking for an explanation with his eyes i can tell you nothing she continued i have a plan but am afraid of failure i shall return to-night come never despair marius accompanied fine to the diligence when the heavy vehicle set out he followed it for a long time with his eyes this carriage bore away his last hope and would bring him back joy or anguish up to the evening he watched all the diligences coming in until at length there remained only one to arrive and fine had not yet returned the young man devoured by impatience walked nervously backward and forward trembling lest the flower-girl should not return until the following day in his trouble as to what this last attempt might be he felt he had not the courage to pass another whole night of uncertainty and anxiety he walked about the cour shivering and a prey to a sort of nightmare at last he perceived the diligence in the distance in the centre of the rotonde square when he heard the wheels rumbling on the stones his heart beat violently he set his back against a tree and watched the travellers stepping out one by one all at once he felt as if rooted to the spot he had seen the tall form and sad pale face of abbe chastanier appear at one of the open doors of the vehicle almost opposite him when the abbe was on the pavement he extended his hand and helped out a young lady who was none other than mademoiselle blanche de casalis fine lightly sprang to the ground behind her without making use of the step she was beaming with smiles the two travellers guided by fine went off in the direction of the hotel des princes marius who had remained in the shades of early evening followed them in a mechanical manner at a loss to understand as if stultified fine remained ten minutes in the hotel at most as she left she caught sight of the young man and ran towards him in a fit of delight i succeeded in bringing them here she exclaimed clapping her hands and now i trust they will obtain what i want to-morrow we shall be fixed then she took marius's arm and gave him an account of her journey the previous evening she had been struck by something the young man had said about regretting he had not the time before him to earn the amount he required by work on the other hand the anecdotes her uncle had related had shown her that it would be impossible to find a money-lender or usurer disposed to be reasonable the matter was therefore reduced to one of gaining time of delaying as long as possible the moment when philippe would be attached to the pillory what terrified them was this public exhibition and the infamy it carried with it by handing over the condemned to the sneers and insults of the mob from that moment the young girl's plan was formed it was a bold plan which would perhaps succeed by reason of its audacity her intention had been to go straight to m casalis's to penetrate as far as his niece and describe the picture of the public exhibition of philippe 
pointing out how insulting such a sight would be for her she would persuade her to lend assistance and both would go and implore the deputy to intercede if m de cazalis would not consent to ask for pardon he would perhaps try to obtain a postponement fine however did not reason out her plans it seemed to her impossible that blanche's uncle could resist her tears she had faith in her devotedness the poor child was dreaming with her eyes wide open and hoping that m de cazalis would relent at the last moment this proud and obstinate man had meant to cover philippe with infamy and he would have allowed no obstacle to be placed in the way of his vengeance had she found herself in his path she would have been crushed she would have expended her brightest smiles and most touching tears in pure loss fortunately for her she was assisted by circumstances when she called at the deputy's mansion in the cour bonaparte she was informed that m de cazalis had just left for paris on business connected with his political position she then asked to see mademoiselle blanche and was told in a sort of vague manner that the young lady was absent that she was travelling the flower girl felt very much embarrassed but she was obliged to withdraw and to go back and think matters over in the street all her plans were upset this absence of the uncle and niece deprived her of the support on which she had relied and she had not a single friend to whom she could appeal she was determined however that she would not lose her last hope and return to aix as sick at heart as on the previous evening after having made a useless journey all at once she thought of abbe chastanier marius had often spoken to her of the old priest she knew how good and devoted he was perhaps he might be able to give her some valuable information she found him at the house of his sister the old invalided workwoman and unbosoming herself to him explained in a few words the reason of her journey to marseilles the priest listened to her with lively concern it is heaven that has sent you here he answered i think under circumstances such as these that i may violate the secret that has been entrusted to me mademoiselle blanche is not travelling her uncle wishing to hide her condition and being unable to take her to paris has rented a cottage for her in the village of st henri she is living there with a companion m de cazalis who has received me back into his good graces and begged me to visit her frequently has given me considerable power over her shall i take you to this poor child whom you will find very much altered and broken down fine accepted joyfully blanche turned quite pale when she saw the flower girl and began to shed warm tears there was a large bluish circle round her eyes the blood had fled from her lips and her cheeks were like white wax one saw that a terrible cry the cry of truth rose within her and made her stagger when fine in a sweet voice accompanied by tender caresses had made her understand that she could perhaps save philippe from supreme humiliation she stood straight up and said in a broken voice i am ready dispose of me i hear a child speaking to me unceasingly of its father i would fain appease the anger of this poor little creature which is yet unborn well continued fine warmly assist us in our work of deliverance i am certain you will obtain at least a respite if you make the attempt but observed abbe chastanier mademoiselle blanche cannot go to aix alone i must accompany her i know that if m de cazalis hears of this journey he will load me with bitter reproaches i accept however the responsibility of what i am doing in the belief that i am acting as an upright man as soon as the flower girl had obtained this consent she hardly allowed the old man and young girl sufficient time to get a few things together for the journey she returned to marseilles with them pushed them into the diligence and it was thus that she brought them triumphantly into aix the following day blanche was to pay a visit to the president of the bench of judges who had passed sentence on philippe when fine had concluded her story marius embraced her warmly on both cheeks a proceeding that made a bloom of pink overspread the young girl's forehead chapter nineteen a respite fine called on blanche and abbe chastanier the next morning she wished to accompany them to the door of the president's residence so as to learn the result of their application without a moment's delay marius who understood that his presence would be painful to mademoiselle de cazalis began strolling about the cour like a soul in trouble and followed the priest and two young girls at a distance when the supplicants had gone upstairs the flower girl perceived the young man and sighed to him to come and join her they both waited agitated and anxious without exchanging a word the president received blanche with great commiseration 
he understood that she had received the cruellest of blows in this unfortunate business the poor child could not speak at the first she began to sob and all her supplicating being begged for pity infinitely better than her prayers could have done it was abbe chastanier who had to explain their presence and present their petition sir said he to the president we come with joined hands mademoiselle de cazalis is already broken down by the misfortunes that have overwhelmed her she implores you for pity's sake to spare her fresh humiliation what would you have me do inquired the president in an unsteady voice we desire if it be possible that you will prevent a fresh scandal m philippe Cayolle has been sentenced to be publicly exhibited and he is to undergo this punishment within the next few days but the infamy will not attain him alone it will not be a case of one culprit being fastened to the pillory there will be a poor suffering child who now implores your pity you understand do you not the yells and insults of the mob will recoil on mademoiselle de cazalis she will be dragged in the mud by the people and her name will be passed from mouth to mouth around the abominable post with sneers of hatred and foul expressions the president seemed deeply affected he preserved silence for a moment then as if struck with a sudden idea he inquired but was it m de cazalis who sent you here is he aware of the steps you are taking no replied the priest with frank dignity m de cazalis does not know we are here men have interests passions that bear them along and which sometimes prevent them forming a clear judgment as to their position perhaps we are acting contrary to the wish of mademoiselle de cazalis's uncle in coming to solicit you but above the passions and interests of men are goodness and justice and so i do not fear to place my sacred character in jeopardy by taking upon myself to ask you to be good and just you are right sir said the president i understand the motives that brought you here and as you see i am deeply affected by your words unfortunately i cannot prevent the punishment it is not within my power to modify a sentence of a court of assizes blanche joined her hands sir she stammered i know not what you can do for me but i implore you to be merciful say to yourself that it is i whom you have sentenced and endeavour to case my sufferings the president took her hands and answered her with parental tenderness my poor child i understand everything the part i have played in this affair has been a painful one at this moment i am in despair at not being able to say to you fear nothing i have the power to overthrow the pillory and you shall not be attached to the post with the condemned man then asked the dejected priest the exhibition will take place shortly you are not even allowed to delay this deplorable scene the president had risen the minister of justice he said can put it off at the request of the crown advocate will you have this exhibition take place at the end of december i shall be glad to give you a proof of my compassion and good will yes yes exclaimed blanche warmly delay the terrible moment as long as possible i shall perhaps feel stronger abbe chastanier who knew what marius's projects were thought that in presence of the president's promise he ought to retire without insisting further so he joined blanche in accepting the offer made them very well that is understood said the president accompanying them to the door i shall make the request and i feel sure it will be granted that justice shall not take its course before the expiration of four months until then rest in peace mademoiselle hope heaven will perhaps send you some balm to your wounds the two supplicants proceeded downstairs as soon as fine perceived them she ran to meet them well she inquired panting for breath as i told you answered abbe chastanier the president cannot prevent the execution of the sentence the flower girl turned quite pale but the old priest hastened to add he has promised to intercede and to have the date of the exhibition adjourned you have four months before you to labour for the prisoner's welfare marius had approached the little group formed by the two young girls and the abbe in spite of his desire to stand aloof the silent solitary street appeared quite white in the intense heat of the noonday sun grass had sprung up between the bright paving stones and a dog that was giving an airing to its lean spine in the narrow streak of shade which fell from the houses was the only other living thing about 
when the young man heard the words that fell from abbe chastanier he rushed forward and grasped his hands effusively ah oh, my father he exclaimed in a trembling voice you have brought me back hope and faith since yesterday i had been doubting providence how can i thank you how can i prove to you my gratitude now i feel possessed of invincible courage i am certain of saving my brother blanche at the sight of marius had hung her head a warm blush had suffused her cheeks she stood there confused and embarrassed suffering horridly at the presence of this youth who was aware of her perjury and whom her uncle and she had plunged into despair when the young man's joy had somewhat subsided he regretted he had approached the despairing attitude of mademoiselle de casalis aroused his pity my brother has been very guilty he said to her at last pardon him as i pardon you these few words were all he could find he would have liked to have spoken to her of her child to have questioned her as to the lot reserved to this poor little creature to have claimed it in the name of philippe but he saw her so bowed down that he dared not torture her further fine doubtless understood what was passing within him while he walked a few steps with abbe chastanier she said rapidly to blanche remember that i offered you to be a mother to your child now i love you for i see you have a good heart make a sign and i'll hasten to your assistance but apart from that i shall be on the watch for the little creature must not suffer from the folly of its parents blanche's only answer was to silently squeeze the flower-girl's hand big tears were trickling down her cheeks mademoiselle de casalis and abbe chastanier returned at once to marseilles fine and marius hastened to the jail they told robert Egas that they had four months to prepare the escape and the jailer swore he would abide by his word on whatever day and hour they might remind him of it the two young people desired to see philippe before leaving aix so as to let him know what had taken place and tell him to have hope at eleven o'clock in the evening robert Egas conducted them again to the cell philippe who was becoming accustomed to the prison regulations did not seem particularly depressed provided i am spared the disgrace of the public exhibition he said to them i will consent to everything i would rather break my head open against a wall than be fastened to the post of infamy and the following day the diligence brought marius and fine back to marseilles they were about to continue the struggle to which their hearts urged them on a much larger scale than before they were about to dive to the bottom of human misery and behold the bare wounds of a great city abandoned to all the passions of modern industry End of chapters 17, 18, and 19. End of part 1. Part 2. Chapters 1 and 2 of The Mysteries of Marseilles by Emile Zola. Translated by Ernest Alfred Vizitelli. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 1. Monsieur Sauvert, the Master Stevedore cadet cougourdan's employer the master stevedore sauvert was a short lively dark man with thick-set powerful limbs his great hooked nose thin lips and elongated visage were expressive of that vainglorious confidence and artful bragging which are the distinctive features of certain types in the south of france brought up in the port a simple labourer in his youth he had saved up his earnings for ten years he raised enormous weights and was possessed of vigorous strength that did wonders he was in the habit of saying he did not fear big men the truth was that this dwarf could have thrashed a giant but he displayed prudence and wisdom in the use he made of his power avoiding quarrels knowing that the tension of his muscles was worth money and that a blow with the fist only brings trouble he lived soberly given up entirely to work and avarice impatient to attain the end he dreamed of at last he had before him the few thousand francs he required to accomplish his object he became a master from one day to another took men into his employ and with folded arms watched them toiling and perspiring from time to time he gave them a little help with a grumble sauvert at the bottom was a downright lazy fellow he had worked out of obstinacy preferring to perform his life's task at one go off and rest later on in the comfortable indolence of a wealthy man now that he had poor wretches to win him a fortune he walked about with his hands in his pockets piling up money waiting until he had amassed a large sum to satisfy his instincts of free and noisy life little by little the avaricious workman became transformed into a wealthy prodigal 
sauvert was possessed of a tremendous appetite for wealth and pleasure he wished to have plenty of money in order to enjoy himself beyond measure and he desired to do that so as to show he had plenty of money he was urged on by the vanity of a parvenu to make his pleasures fiendishly riotous when he laughed he insisted on all marseilles hearing his peal of merriment he now wore clothes fashioned out of fine cloth under which it was easy to distinguish the stiff limbs of the former workman a heavy gold chain was spread out across his waistcoat it was as thick as one's finger and from it hung a bunch of massive charms which seemed almost sufficient to stun an ox on the left hand he wore a gold ring without any stone with patent leather shoes on his feet and a soft felt hat on his head he sauntered up and down the canebiere and round about the port all day smoking a magnificent meerschaum pipe mounted in silver and as he walked along he made the charms dance on his stomach while his eyes wandered over the crowd with a half bantering half kindly expression he was enjoying himself sauvert had little by little entrusted the management of his business to cadet cougourdan whose smart manners pleased him this youth of twenty summers was gifted with an upright and candid mind that gave him positive superiority over the other stevedores the master was delighted at having such a workman at his elbow he appointed him overseer of the men working for him and from that moment was able to make a grand display in marseilles of his natural desires he limited his work to making up his accounts in the morning and pocketing the money that had been earned the existence he had been dreaming of commenced sauvert became a member of a club he gambled but prudently being of opinion that the pleasure derived from the card table is not worth what it costs he wanted his money's worth of amusement and he therefore sought after substantial and lasting enjoyment he dined at the best eating-houses and associated with ladies whom he showed off in public his vanity was deliciously tickled when he was able to lounge on the cushions of a carriage beside a huge silk skirt the lady was nothing the silk gown all he dragged it into private dining-rooms and there threw the windows open so that all the passers-by might see that he was having a rare time with a well-dressed lady and ordering expensive dishes others would have closed the shutters and bolted the door his dream was to kiss his fair companions in a glass house so that the multitude might know that he was wealthy enough to love such pretty creatures he had his own idea of love for a month he had been living in rapture he had met a young woman whose acquaintance tickled his self-esteem this young person was protected by a count and was looked upon as one of the queens of the demi-monde at marseilles she called herself therese armande but was better known by the familiar name of armande when armande placed her little gloved hand in sauvert's huge paw for the first time the master stevedore almost faded with delight this pressure of the hand was exchanged in the allée du melon opposite the door of the house where the lorette resided and the passers-by stopped and turned round at the sight of this man and young woman smiling and bowing to each other sauvert went off bursting with pride and in ecstasies about armand's dress and superior manners he had but one thought that of protecting this person himself supplanting the count and walking about with lace and velvet leaning on his arm he watched for armand and placed himself in her path he fell in love with the luxuriant finery she wore and the perfumery that escaped from her clothes he was proud at getting a bow from her at appearing to be one of her friends and it would certainly not have displeased him to have been thought one of her lovers at length she succumbed he thought it a victory due to the charms of his person for a week his conceit was unbearable he went about casting a look of mocking pity on the people he met in the street when armand was leaning on his arm the pavement seemed too small for him the gentle swaying to and fro in the lady's gait the frou-frou of her skirts threw him into a delirious reverie he was very fond of crinolines which take up a great deal of room and interfere with pedestrian traffic he related his good fortune to every one cadet was one of his first confidants ah if you only knew he said to him the charming person and how she adores me she has everything imaginable at her place carpets curtains glasses you would think yourself in high society upon my word and with all that not in the least proud a good-natured girl with her hand always open yesterday i lunched in her small drawing-room and we then took an open carriage and drove to the prado 
every one was staring at us it is enough to make you die of joy to be in such a woman's society cadet smiled his dream was to be loved by a robust girl and in his eyes armand had all the appearance of a mechanical doll of a brittle toy which he would have broken between his fingers but he did not wish to annoy his employer and so he went into ecstasies with him over the lorette's charms in the evening he gave fine an account of sauveur's follies the flower-girl had resumed her place in her little kiosk on the cour st louis while selling her flowers she kept her eyes on the alert in search of opportunities to come to marius's assistance she had not lost sight of the loan of fifteen thousand francs and each day she built up a new plan dreaming of taxing those whom chance brought near her do you think she inquired one morning of her brother that m sauvert is a man to lend money that's according to circumstances answered cadet he would willingly give a thousand francs to a poor devil on a public square before a crowd of people to make an exhibition of kind-heartedness the flower-girl laughed oh it's not charity that is wanted she answered the lender's left hand must ignore what is done by his right the deuce said cadet that is too disinterested however one can see on the basis of these few words of conversation fine elaborated quite a scheme she believed sauveur was very wealthy and she did not take him for an ill-natured man at heart it would perhaps be possible to get something out of him by making use of armand's influence the flower-girl understood that she must first of all persuade marius to call on the lorette that was the difficult part of the business the young man would firmly refuse would say that there could be nothing in common between him and this woman one day she let armand's name escape her as by accident and was very much surprised to see marius smile and appear to know all about her are you acquainted with the lady she inquired i went to see her once he answered it was philippe who took me there this lady as you term her threw open her reception rooms to her friends once a week and my brother was one of the frequenters of the place faith i was very well received and found a charming hostess there who was exceedingly ladylike and very elegant fine seemed quite sad to hear marius sing armand's praises it appears he continued that things have somewhat changed at her place during the past year they tell me her affairs are very much involved however they say she is extremely clever and has a talent for intrigue if she should happen to come across a simpleton she will easily get out of her difficulties the young girl had recovered from the strange emotion that had got the better of her she adroitly continued to put her plan into execution without undue haste the simpleton is found she said laughing don't you know mrs sauveur cadet's principal slightly answered marius i have sometimes met him walking about the old port in slippers well he has been armand's lover for the last few months and they pretend he has already spent some money with her then fine added in an indifferent tone of voice why don't you go and see armand again you would meet wealthy people there who might assist you in the affair in question m sauveur would perhaps be disposed to help you marius became serious and for a moment was silent he was thinking pooh he exclaimed at last i must not flinch at anything i shall have to call and see that person to-morrow i will explain my visit by speaking of my brother the flower-girl looked the young man in the face with quivering eyelids and above all she continued with a forced laugh don't go and remain at the feet of the enchantress i have often heard tell of her costly and clever style of dress of her wit and the strange power she exercises over men marius who was astonished at his friend's unsteady voice took her hand and examined her with his penetrating eyes what is the matter with you he inquired any one would think i was going to see the devil and that i am a sinner ah my dear fine i am far from thinking of such nonsense i have a solemn task to perform besides look at me well what woman would care for such a baboon the young girl gazed at him and was quite surprised to find him no longer ugly formerly he had seemed frightful now she perceived something like light burst from his countenance and transform his features the young man pressed her hand amicably and she remained quite troubled the following evening marius called on armand in accordance with his determination chapter two a marseillaise lorette armand's origin was shrouded in mystery 
she pretended she was born in india of a native woman and an english officer she started from that point and related a novel of which she was the heroine to any one who would listen to it she made a wealthy protector who had taken care of her at her father's death responsible for her first fault he had brought her up in the greatest refinement on the same principle as that of fattening a fowl in order that it may make a more toothsome dish she delighted in relating this brutally romantic tale thanks to her falsehoods her real history was never known she had one day swooped down on marseilles just like those birds that sent a district rich in all kinds of prey from afar in settling in a commercial centre she displayed extraordinary intelligence from the moment of her arrival she directed her batteries against business men young merchants who shovel money about she understood that these young sparks confined all day in their offices were thirsting for amusement at night and anxious to squander some of the cash they have earned she set her snares with art she began by starting her establishment on an important footing and giving it a sort of aristocratic appearance it was easy for her to vanquish the rivals whom she found already settled in the city those poor fallen daughters of eve were grossly ignorant they dressed badly hardly knew how to speak made a wretched mean show of luxury and gave themselves stupidly away armand crushed them with her elegance and the wit she had picked up here and there in her intercourse with persons in good station of life in a few months she became a sort of mundane celebrity at home as sauveur had naively said she gave herself the airs of a duchess she had displayed admirable taste in furnishing her apartment she threw open her drawing-room and while she attracted the golden youth of the city by her noisy mode of life she retained them by her good graces and air of distinction you could hardly perceive through the mistress of the house the lady of easy virtue she had lovers and was willing enough to show them off but in public and at her evening parties she maintained a decency of demeanour for which they felt very grateful to her she was the emblem of vice witty elegant and perfumed little by little she surrounded herself by most of the fast men of the city but she was careful only to receive wealthy people such as earned a great deal of money and spent still more at the commencement she had only to choose her victims a swarm being at her feet she devoured several fortunes with her sharp teeth living in the utmost luxury and providing for all the requirements of her mode of life which were enormous moral people looked on her as a regular pest as a bottomless pit in which the capital of the young commercial men of marseilles was being engulfed her rivals tore her to bits and accused her of engaging in shameless intrigues they made fun of her thin face of the wrinkles come before their time said she was ugly which was almost true and vowed they could not understand the infatuation of these idiotic men for the creature armand let them talk and quietly reigned for several years she had domineered over them by her mind luxury and the science of an elegant and refined woman men attended her receptions in dress coats and white neckties then without any apparent cause her credit was all at once lost bad fortune came and made holes in her luxuriant existence no doubt she had gone out of fashion and generous protectors were scarce she descended to that semi-state of poverty which is attired in silk and treads on carpets feeling she would roll into the gutter if she did not make an effort to retain her grand apartment she struggled in desperation against her ill luck she understood that her power of fascination came solely from her apparent wealth from her style of dress from the money which permitted her to act the part of a duchess beyond her sphere at her ease she knew that as soon as she was out of silk and had closed her drawing-room she would become a poor girl an ugly faded creature whom no one would have anything to do with and she displayed feverish energy to find protectors and procure money at any cost it was at this time that she made the acquaintance of madame mercier who advanced her money at an exorbitant rate of interest she had taken in so many young simpletons that she allowed herself to be imposed upon in her turn without much ado she hoped however to make the first wealthy individual whom she came across pay the capital and interest of the money she had borrowed but men of wealth did not put in an appearance and she became more and more anxious urged on by necessity and feeling that her beauty which was her breadwinner was leaving her day by day with her luxury she turned to crime she had already been obliged to sell looking-glasses furniture porcelain to satisfy the demands of her creditors her apartment was being stripped of everything 
she saw the walls getting bare little by little and thought with a shudder of the day when she would find herself weary and old in an empty room the upholsterers milliners all the tradesmen to whom she owed money became more troublesome as they detected their customers approaching ruin they knew that protectors were becoming rare and insisted on the immediate payment of their claims some of them talked of putting in the brokers armand therefore understood that she was lost unless she found money at once no matter how she had recourse to an extreme measure she imitated the writing of three or four of her lovers and made out acceptances in her own favour which she signed with these persons names then not daring to go to a banker she applied to madame mercier who consented to discount several of the bills it is probable that this female usurer was not ignorant of their origin and that she even speculated on it holding the young woman in her clutches able at any moment to lodge a complaint with the crown attorney relying moreover on those whose names were on the bills and whose interest it was to avoid a scandal she considered the forgeries she held in guarantee as preferable to genuine bills she based quite a fortune on her complacency exacting enormous interest embroiling the lorette's affairs more and more making her provide for her completely acting a cunning and hypocritical part which she performed to perfection armand managed to get along for two years without being disturbed she had made the bills payable at her residence and provided the money for them when they fell due at any cost taking a hundred francs from the first man she met completing the amount by selling something borrowing again and forging fresh bills madame mercier continued to be humble and obliging she desired to hold her prey in a close grip before showing her teeth and biting then the time came when armand was positively unable to meet the forged acceptances she cast herself into the gutter in vain she went to the chateau des fleurs and still could not make the money she required to keep up her house it was just then that she made sauveur's acquaintance for him she dismissed accounts she had ruined under the impression that the master stevedore was rich and generous in other times when she was queen of marseilles and insolently displayed her lace and velvet she would have gazed down on sauveur from the height of the wealth and elegance of her admirers but now there was no prey that she disdained she set her batteries against the crowd and would willingly have received money from soiled hands the former workman mistook the dire necessity which thrust the young woman into his arms for tenderness after a few months she perceived with alarm that her new acquaintance had all the prudent economical habits of an upstart and that he spent all his money on himself like an egotist two or three of the forged acceptances were not met and madame mercier began to get angry things were at that point when one evening marius naively called he expected to meet some of the numerous wealthy company in her drawing-room to whom his brother had introduced him he had a vague idea of getting intimate with some young business man who would come to his assistance and he relied in a measure on sauveur whose obliging disposition fine had been careful to exaggerate he was very much astonished to find the drawing-room empty the large apartment was lit with a single lamp and appeared particularly bare sauveur was reclining on a large divan and seemed to be making a great fuss about digesting the dinner he had just eaten undoing some of the buttons of his waistcoat and holding a toothpick between his fingers armand was seated beside him in an armchair reading graziella with her forehead resting dreamily on the palm of her left hand an italian greyhound named jali was lying at her feet with its head reposing on her cherry-coloured slippers one of armand's ways of seduction was to read the works of great modern poets before her admirers she had a small bookcase containing the writings of chateaubriand victor hugo de lamartine and alfred de musset in the evening in the pale light of the lamp at an hour when she was still beautiful she languidly spelt over pages of verse or poetical prose this placed a sort of halo round her head her admirers thought they had an ignorant girl to deal with and they found an educated almost a lettered lady who read books that they had never had either the time or energy to look into sauveur especially felt crushed and overshadowed on the day when his lady friend took up a book of verses and quietly began turning over the pages of it before him it was a rare event with him when he glanced through a newspaper a woman opening a volume of poetry was in his eyes a superior creature each time armand read in his presence he collected himself and looked affected and charmed it seemed to him that he was becoming wise himself 
marius slightly smiled when he saw armand in an inclined attitude feigning ecstasy and the position sauvert was in lounging on the divan with his hands clasped across his stomach the lorette welcomed the newcomer with her easy sprightly grace she had been more or less intimately connected with philippe and she treated marius as an old acquaintance she asked him to be seated and reproached him with the rarity of his visits i know very well she added that you have had a great deal of trouble lately poor philippe i can fancy sometimes that i see him in his damp prison he who was so fond of luxury and pleasure that will teach him to place his affection in better hands sauvert had raised himself a little one of his good qualities was that he was not jealous on the contrary he showed himself quite proud of his companion's pest admirers the fondness which armand had formerly shown for others doubled in his eyes the value of his good fortune besides marius seemed to him so small that he was delighted to appear robust beside of him the young woman introduced the two men oh we know each other said the master stevedore with the laugh of a happy man i also know m philippe Cayolle. there's a fine fellow for you the truth was that sauvert was delighted at being found alone with armand he began to talk to her familiarly to lay stress on the pleasures they participated in together and then resumed speaking of philippe he often came to see you didn't he ah never mind don't protest i think you were in love with each other i used to meet him sometimes at the chateau des fleurs we went there yesterday eh my dear what a crowd what dresses he turned to marius in the evening he added we supped at a restaurant it is very expensive it is not every one who can afford that armand seemed to suffer there was still some delicacy about the woman she looked at marius shrugged her shoulders slightly shot glances at him scoffing at sauvert the latter remained imperturbable and stretched himself out full of enjoyment marius then guessed how much the lorette was embarrassed and tormented he felt something like pity at the sight of her deserted drawing-room and when he understood down what a frightfully steep incline this woman whom he had known happy and without a care was rolling he regretted having called about ten o'clock he found himself alone with sauvert who began to give him an account of his good fortune and joyous existence a servant had come to tell armand that madame mercier was in the antechamber and that she seemed very angry End of chapters one and two part two chapters three and four of the mysteries of marseilles by emile zola translated by ernest alfred visitelli this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter three in which madame mercier shows her claws madame mercier was a little round fat old woman of fifty who was for ever tearfully complaining about the hardness of the times attired in a gown of washed-out printed calico always with an old straw basket on her arm which served as a safe she trotted along with short steps and the sly movements of a cat she was humble and wretched and gave herself poverty-stricken airs to make people pity her her fresh complexion and the wrinkles on her face resembling rolls of fat were a standing protest against the tears that inundated it at every moment this female usurer played her part admirably with armand she first of all acted the good-natured woman she gained absolute control over her with an infernal kind of art showing herself in turn serviceable and egotistic embroiling the accounts allowing the interest to accumulate making it impossible for her debtor to verify anything thus when one of the acceptances fell due and armand was without funds to meet it madame mercier was greatly distressed then she promised to borrow the money from some one vowing she had not got it herself she advanced the amount of the bill but made the lorette immediately reimburse her and thus there was fresh interest to pay in all this coming and going of acceptances in the constant increase in the rate of discount armand had lost all count of how she stood what she had paid and what she still owed in the meantime the debt increased without the usurer making any farther advances and the older it became the more obscure it got the young woman felt herself lost at the bottom of chaos the female usurer maintained her despairing and coaxing manner when she supplied money herself in order that armand might pay her she made her feel all her devotedness all the heroism of her conduct eh hey, you have never seen a creditor like me she would say 
i even go so far as to borrow the money you want that is splendid that is but answered armand it's for yourself that you borrow the money as i give it to you not at all answered the old woman i am only seeking to do you a service so madame mercier in this way introduced herself little by little into the house every two or three days she came and showed her cunning coaxing face armand became her property her slave sometimes she arrived all in a flutter fell into a chair in despair and accused the young woman of wanting to run away without paying her it was necessary to take her over to the apartment and let her see that the trunks were not packed up sometimes she rang violently at the door said she had been robbed and reproached the lorette with her expenditure she compared the one life with the other accused her debtor of being insolvent and crippled with debt and ended by asking for fresh security at other moments she came suddenly and demanded money then she softened down pleaded poverty and on leaving shuffled along in a most lamentable way she accompanied each of these visits with a deluge of tears these came at her bidding and she took advantage of that circumstance to embarrass people each complaint was followed by a sob she twisted herself about pitifully on a chair uttering the least word in a doleful tone of voice armand weary and bewildered generally stood before her without being able to pronounce a syllable at times she would have sacrificed everything linen gowns furniture to have been freed from these continual lamentations the usurer invented another kind of persecution she would come with red eyes declare she was in want of bread and was dying the young woman aggravated and quite out of patience would tell her to sit down and eat sometimes she would shed streams of tears to get sugar coffee or brandy alas my dear lady she snivelled i am very unhappy this morning i had to take my coffee without sugar and to-morrow i shall have neither sugar nor coffee be charitable it is you who have brought me to this if you were to give me my money i should not be obliged to come and beg for pity's sake let me have a few pounds of coffee and sugar that will count for all the services i have rendered you armand did not dare refuse she spent her last few sous trembling in the presence of certain savage bantering looks of her creditor if she happened to say she had no money the usurer would answer very well i shall present the bill you gave me to your lover the other would not allow her to proceed any further she sent and sold something and purchased what her tormentor required the unfortunate girl closed her eyes in order not to see the chasm gaping before her she belonged to this woman who held such terrible proofs against her in her hands and she obeyed her inwardly irritated inquiring of herself with despair by what means she could escape from her claws madame mercier wept for nearly two years and extracted from armand all she could she never went away with empty hands the money she had lent her already brought her in two hundred and fifty per cent if the capital was compromised the interest covered it two or three times over at last the usurer understood that she must change her tactics armand could not receive her without a nervous shudder which must inevitably bring about a crisis besides she had no money and she had twice firmly refused to give her sugar from that moment the old woman resolved to weep no more but to have recourse to strong measures it only remained to her to play all for all to exact immediate payment of the arrears from the lorette by threatening to lodge a complaint with the crown attorney she had had the prudence not to manifest the least suspicion anent the forged bills in her possession her plan was soon formed she decided she would call on the young woman and put her in a fearful fright if one of her protectors happened to be there she would apply to him she would create a scandal and manage to get back her money somehow she wanted to devour her prey after having sucked all the blood from her veins an acceptance for a thousand francs which armand had signed with sauveur's name and which she had given madame merci in exchange for another bill had fallen due on the previous day the old woman having a pretext to be angry resolved not to wait any longer she called on the young woman just at the time when marius and the master stevedore were there armand was quite troubled when she met her in the antechamber she dragged her to the farthest corner of a small boudoir which was only separated from the drawing-room by the thin door she offered her a seat with the timid and beseeching look of an insolvent person to her creditor what do you mean shouted the usurer refusing the chair you are making fun of me my good lady 
another bill returned unpaid i am tired of it all she had crossed her arms and spoke in a loud insolent voice her little fat red face shone with anger armand would have preferred to have seen her crying and lamenting in her customary drawling tone of voice for mercy's sake she exclaimed frightened speak lower i have visitors you know in what an embarrassing position i find myself grant me a few days grace madame mercier made a movement of impatience she stood on tiptoe and spoke right in the lorette's face what care i if you have visitors she continued without lowering her voice i mean to be paid and immediately madame wears hats and bonnets madame goes to the chateau des fleurs madame has lovers who provide all sorts of amusement for her have i any lovers i deprive myself i eat dry bread and drink water whereas you stuff yourself with good things that can't last i must have my money or i will take you somewhere you know where don't you she accompanied these words with a threatening look and armand turned quite pale ah that ruffles you continued the old woman sneering you must have taken me for a donkey if i have acted like one it was no doubt because it was to my interest to do so she began laughing and shrugging her shoulders then she added violently if you don't pay me to-night i will write to-morrow to the crown attorney i don't know what you mean stammered armand the old woman sat down she felt she was mistress of the situation and she wanted to enjoy the pleasure of playing for a moment with her prey ah you don't know what i mean when i speak to you of the crown attorney she said making a frightful grimace as if overcome with sudden merriment but you lie my good lady look at yourself in that glass you are pallid own that you're a hussy at that word armand rose it seemed to her that she had just received a cut with a whip across the face her self-possession returned to her and showing madame mercier the door she exclaimed in a loud voice walk out at once no i'll not go out answered the old woman sitting back in the armchair i want my money if you touch me i'll shout murder and the persons who are in your drawing-room will come to my assistance i told you i was not a fool pay me at once and i'll leave you alone i have no money answered armand coldly this reply exasperated the old woman for more than a year it had been given her regularly at each of her visits she had ended by taking it for mockery you have no money you always say that she exclaimed give me your furniture and gowns but no i prefer sending you to prison i will go and lodge a complaint i will accuse you of forgery we shall see my beautiful lady if you find lovers among your jailers who will treat you to silk gowns and tasty meals armand staggered losing all her assurance fearing the cries of the old woman might be heard by marius and sauvaire her creditor saw her fright and began shouting still louder yes she said i can send you to the assizes to-morrow you know that don't you i have over ten false acceptances in my possession on which you have imitated your lover's signatures that's nice work i shall go and find each of these gentlemen i will tell them what you are and they will cast you into the street you will die in the gutter she took breath while the young woman all of a tremble thought of strangling her to make her silent but that reminds me she continued you have visitors perhaps in your drawing-room there is one of these gentlemen whose name you have stolen to make money out of i'll go and see it is necessary i should find out let me pass she moved towards the door armand placed herself in front of her with extended arms ready to strike her if she advanced you want to strike me i who have fed you who have lent you my money stammered the female usurer suffocating with rage and she stepped backward shouting help help armand faced sharply round to turn the key in the lock but it was too late the door had just opened and she found herself face to face with marius and sauvaire who were gazing into the boudoir in an anxious and curious manner chapter four which shows that the position of a lorette is not without its troubles sauvaire and marius had been about half an hour alone in the drawing-room 
the young man would willingly have withdrawn but he considered it uncivil to do so without first of all taking leave of the mistress of the house he therefore feigned to be listening to the stevedore stories the sound of loud voices soon reached them little by little the noise increased to such a pitch that both of them lent the ear being unable to appear discreet any longer just then the shout help help made them start up and open the door communicating with the boudoir a strange sight awaited them as soon as they made their appearance armand stepped back staggering and let herself fall into an armchair with her head between her hands she burst out sobbing quite broken down without raising her face or uttering a word the old woman in a rage with inflamed countenance approached the two men and began speaking to them with passionate verbosity from time to time she broke off to turn round and shake her fist at armand who was so upset by despair which made her tremble all over her body that she did not hear her you saw it, did you not repeated the old woman she wanted to beat me she had her arm in the air ah oh, the wretch just fancy my good gentleman i have given that woman all my money i like to be of service besides i thought she was honest she has made me discount acceptances signed by honourable persons i thought i had good security now i learn that the bills are false and that i have been shamefully robbed what would you have done in my place i reproached her with her abominable conduct and then she threatened to strike me sauvaire opened his eyes in astonishment gazing first of all at armand's dejection and then at madame mercier's anger he approached the young woman and exclaimed come my dear defend yourself this woman lies doesn't she you have not done anything so stupid come speak armand did not move but continued sobbing oh she'll not speak she'll not defend herself continued the woman usurer in triumph she knows very well that i am in possession of the proofs i shall write to-morrow morning to the crown attorney marius painfully surprised cast a look of pity on armand chance had brought him face to face with another shame another human misery he remembered the sad scene when charles blaitrie was arrested in his presence and a feeling of mercy overcame him in face of this woman whom vice had brought to infamy he half guessed the circumstances that had urged her on to crime he understood how necessity from fall to fall had brought her to the gutter he would have liked to have saved her to have brought her back to a life of honesty to have given her the means of extricating herself from the sewer why do you wish to ruin her he quietly inquired of the old woman you will not be paid any the quicker don't overwhelm her on the contrary give her a chance to recover herself and pay you back no no mercilessly answered the old woman i want her to go to prison i have waited too long already yesterday again she failed to meet a bill of a thousand francs which she had made payable here she signed that bill sauvaire the name of one of her admirers no doubt the master stevedore on hearing himself referred to started the sum of a thousand alarmed him you say you have an acceptance of a thousand francs signed sauvaire he inquired with an appearance of something very much like terror yes sir answered the old woman i brought it with me it is in my basket show it me if you please sauvaire turned the bill over in his fingers studying the handwriting very closely and was confounded by jupiter he exclaimed it's perfectly imitated he leant over towards armand who was doubled up with grief and continued in a dry tone of voice look here my dear no nonsense i will never pay that you know the deuce i'd willingly give you a hundred francs but a thousand it's too much he no longer spoke familiarly to her he even began to regret his excursion into the demi-monde of marseilles oh that's not the only one i've got continued madame mercier i've many others in my possession bearing different names however if this one were paid i would agree not to say anything i would continue to wait marius's sensible remarks had made her understand that it would be better not to lodge a complaint and as she had sauvaire beside her she was in hopes he would pay she became quite tender changed her plans and began to excuse armand after all 
she said i don't know that the other bills are false the poor little woman has had a rough time you must not be angry with her sir she is a very good person at heart and she began to shed warm tears marius could not restrain a smile sauvert walked up and down excited grumbling angrily he cared very little about armand's infamous conduct he was simply irritated at the struggle between egotism and generosity that was taking place within him no decidedly he exclaimed at last i can do nothing armand buried in her armchair continued sobbing in a low broken-hearted manner this woman who had known all the delight of luxury and adoration suffered bitterly at having fallen so low there she was degraded with her misery and shame brought home to her and she was seized with despair when her thoughts went back to her elegance and wealth of former times she would never rise again she would fall still lower become the last of creatures and she was all the more upset at the thought that her disgrace would be public the presence of sauvert and marius gave her additional pain her silent grief produced a strange effect on marius who was weak in the presence of tears he would willingly have given the old woman her thousand francs if he had had them after a painful silence he addressed sauvert who was taking great strides about the room very much annoyed come sir he said to him this woman must be saved her own sobs plead her cause better than i could do you are fond of her and will not abandon her in her despair eh hey, yes i was fond of her answered the master stevedore sharply and i think i have shown it sufficiently during the last three months do you know that i have already spent nearly five thousand francs with her i'll give no more so much the worse she must get out of it as she can it would be a thousand francs thrown into the street what enjoyment shall i have for this money if i give it to her you will have done a good action her behaviour is scandalous and i'm not trying to excuse her only i think i can guess how it was she became a forger and i could plead her cause oh all that has nothing to do with me she did what she pleased you see i am not angry i am simply going to place myself beyond all this disagreeable business marius was getting discouraged he remembered what fine had related to him about the master stevedore's vanity and he continued in a careless way let's say no more about it i spoke to you thus because i knew you were very rich and very generous sooner or later the account of your good action would have been mooted abroad and you would have won in this affair more than a thousand francs worth of praise do you think so asked sauvert hesitating i am certain few men would be so generous and for that reason it would be positively glorious to save this woman but let us say no more about it sauvert ceased walking about he stopped in the centre of the room and began to think madame mercier who saw him hesitating and who was experiencing thrills of desire at the idea of receiving a thousand francs thought she had better intervene she had resumed her tearful voice and her humble gentle manner ah sir she said to sauvert if you only knew how this poor little woman adores you there are very wealthy men who have tried to take your place she has refused all offers and it is perhaps that which has placed her in straitened circumstances and prevented her repairing the faults she has committed you cannot imagine how closely she clings to you the master stevedore felt very much flattered at these remarks from the moment his self-esteem was in question the matter bore a different complexion very well be it so he said i'll give the thousand francs i'll take them to you to-morrow evening now withdraw leave madame alone the old woman bowed with servile humility and went quietly away closing the doors without the least noise armand had raised her head her face flushed with tears seemed to have grown older all upset with fright and feverish with shame she rose with difficulty and wanted to kneel down before marius and sauvert the young man held her up whilst the master cibador said come my dear it's all over i accept your thanks and trust my good action will be profitable to you the truth was that sauvert no longer found any charm in armand he had just perceived that the poor creature was faded and he had received too hard a lesson to forget himself any longer in the boudoirs of the demi-monde 
he began to prefer the grisette the two men withdrew and at the door armand warmly kissed marius's hand she saw that he felt real and profound pity for her and she thanked him for having saved her the following night sauvert called to fetch marius to accompany him to madame mercier's the female usurer occupied a filthy house in the rue du pavé d'amour the two visitors ascended three flights of stairs and knocked without obtaining an answer at a black and damp door the noise they made brought out a neighbor who informed them that the wicked old woman had been arrested that morning the police said this person had been on her track for some days it seems a complaint had been lodged against her all the tenants were delighted at her arrest she only just had time to burn the papers likely to compromise her marius understood that armand had been saved by providence he made inquiries of the people at the house and acquired the certitude that the old woman had burnt all the acceptances signed by the lorette fearing that their possession might constitute other charges against her for she guessed that if armand found herself implicated she would tell the truth and give the most overwhelming details besides by destroying the security she lost nothing as she had long since recovered her advances sauvert was particularly delighted at their adventure he carried off the thousand francs triumphantly he had been enabled to give a proof of his generosity without spending a sou it was all profit you are a witness that i was going to give the money he said to marius that is how i am i like to be generous i throw money out of the window oh a gift of a thousand francs does not trouble me when it's a question of paying for my amusement marius allowed him to expatiate on his good qualities and ran off to armand to tell her the good news he found the young woman sad and troubled she had passed an atrocious night struggling mentally with her misfortunes in search of a supreme means of extricating herself from the infamy in which she was plunged when she learned that the forged acceptances had been destroyed that she had recovered her liberty she was as if transformed she kissed marius passionately and vowed to him that she would take advantage of the lesson and change her mode of life i will work she said i will conduct myself like a respectable woman then only will i ask you to return me your friendship good-bye marius left her quite moved by her decision and promises when he was alone he reproached himself with his abnegation for two days he had been living beyond himself without giving a thought to his brother's safety when fine inquired the result of his errand he did not dare to relate to her the dramatic scenes at which he had been present he limited himself to telling her that there was no hope of borrowing the money from sauvert and that armand was closing her drawing-room where will you go now then inquired the flower-girl i know not he answered however i have a plan which i am going to put into execution End of chapters three and four part two chapters five and six of the mysteries of marseilles by emile zola translated by ernest alfred Vizitelli. this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter v douglas the notary marius had returned to m martelli's and resumed his duties finding a sort of peacefulness in his work his thoughts ran freer amidst the silence and calm of his office he told himself that he had four months and wished to come to philippe's assistance and he would reflect for hours together as to the best means to be employed m martelli continued to treat him as he would a son sometimes the young man thought of telling him everything and of borrowing the fifteen thousand francs of him but a fear a timidity prevented him he dreaded his employer's republican sternness so he resolved to continue the struggle to exhaust all possible means before applying to the shipowner later on when he had unsuccessfully tried everything else he would make up his mind to tell him of his difficulty and implore his kind assistance meanwhile he determined he would not again behave like a simpleton and take any useless steps for a moment he thought of earning the necessary amount himself the high figure frightened him and he saw very well that he could never put by such a sum in four months yet he felt bold enough to move mountains it recurred to him that douglas the notary whose aid m martelli had vainly asked for philippe had for some months past been offering to employ him as agent acting under power of attorney for some of his clients 
the notary and the shipowner were connected in various business matters and m martelli often sent marius to settle different accounts with douglas one day on calling there the young man decided to accept the offer that had been made him if the profits were small he might when he had become better known succeed in obtaining a loan the notary lived in a house of simple and austere appearance the offices occupied the entire first floor there was quite a crowd of clerks seated along stained deal tables in the large cold bare rooms luxury had never penetrated into those rooms full of prodigious activity and a kind of honest roughness one felt oneself to be in the abode of a man who never forgot himself amid the joys of life about ten years before douglas had succeeded to the practice of a person named imbert whose clerk he had been for more than twelve years he was then an intelligent and active young fellow with a passion for business and ever dreaming of monster speculations the fever for trade and manufacture that was passing over france heated his blood and filled him with strong ambition he wished to earn vast sums of money not in order to live in opulence but because he tasted a keen voluptuousness in unravelling all monetary matters and in guiding the undertakings he embarked upon to success at the outset he felt himself too restricted in his notary's practice he was a born banker and his hands were formed for manipulating large sums of money his profession with its quiet dealings and almost sacred and paternal character did not in the least suit his stock-jobbing nature he felt out of his element for all his instincts urged him to turn the money deposited with him to account he could not reconcile himself to being a disinterested intermediary and he launched into panting and fever speculations which later on turned him into a great criminal he paid the purchase money of his practice in a few months without any one knowing how he had obtained the necessary capital then he displayed febrile activity in a very short time his practice developed considerably he became the first notary of marseilles opening his doors wide and securing fresh clients every day his mode of proceeding was extremely simple he never denied himself to any client and listened to every application he always found money for those who wanted to borrow and always had excellent investments for those who deposited their cash with him a considerable turnover of capital thus took place through the intermediary of his office at first people were surprised at his rapid success they talked of imprudence and considered that the young notary was going too quickly ahead and was undertaking a burden too heavy for his shoulders besides this no one could make out how he managed to meet the calls occasioned by the continual increase of his practice but douglas calmed public anxiety by the simplicity of his life he was believed to be very wealthy yet he dressed quietly displayed not the slightest luxury and denied himself all pleasures every one knew that he led a sober existence eating only plain food living in fact like a petty shopkeeper he was also very pious gave a great deal in charity went to church and remained kneeling during the whole length of the service by these means he acquired the reputation of an honest man and this went on increasing daily he came to be cited at last as a model of piety and honour his name was respected and beloved it had taken him barely six years to arrive at this position and now during six years he had been at the head of the marseilles notaries his office was the most frequented and the one that did the most business wealthy people made a point of employing this modest and pious man endowed with every virtue the nobility and clergy supported him the commercial world had ended by feeling unlimited confidence in his loyalty the position was won and douglas was feverishly turning it to account he was then about forty-five years old a strong thick-set man inclined to stoutness his face always clean-shaven was deathly pale the flesh seemed inanimate the eyes alone showing signs of life he looked like a verger turned banker beneath his gentle exterior one could hear a kind of muffled roar no doubt the blood was coursing fiercely in this struggler's body which seemed to sleep when he conversed in his drawling tones his voice occasionally rose to a pitch which revealed the internal fever consuming him he was always to be found in his private room a cold apartment poorly furnished there was generally a priest or a nun in the antechamber the door was left open and it was easy for any one to find the chief he displayed his charity contempt for luxury and austere good-nature even rather too complacently marius felt a real sympathy for this man whose simple virtues quite won his heart he delighted in calling upon him 
on this particular day after discussing with douglas the business upon which m martelli had sent him the young man added hesitatingly i wish now sir to speak to you on a private matter only i am afraid i may be trespassing on your time not at all my dear friend said the notary cordially i am quite at your service i have already offered you my assistance and my house is open to you i remember your kind offers and i wish to remind you of what you said to me some months ago i told you that it only rested with yourself to earn some money with me i should like to assist a young fellow like you by putting your willingness and courage to the proof what i told you then i repeat to-day i thank you and accept replied marius simply much affected by douglas's frank and generous ways the latter on hearing the young man's words started with joy he turned his chair round quickly and indicated another seat to his visitor sit down and let us talk he said i can only give you a few minutes i like young men such as you not afraid of work and speaking their minds freely you do not know how happy you make me by placing me in the position to be useful to you he smiled and every word he uttered was like a caress well this is the matter in question he continued as some of my clients do not reside at marseilles i have had to find a means of facilitating their transactions i have therefore obtained several agents acting under power of attorney to represent the absent parties and who look after these persons properties whenever one of my clients is for some reason or other unable to attend personally to his affairs he leaves me with a blank power of attorney depending on me to find some upright party who will faithfully fulfil his duties i know that you are an active and honest fellow and i offer you the position of representing two or three landlords whose powers of attorney i have by me there is only your name to fill in and you will receive five per cent upon all the transactions you carry out he spoke in a calm and simple tone of voice marius was frightened at the responsibility of such a position but he felt so sure of his uprightness that he did not hesitate to accept i am at your commands he said to douglas you must guide and advise me i know i shall have nothing to fear in obeying you in everything so as not to overwhelm you at the outset resumed the notary rising i will entrust you with two powers of attorney to begin with he took some papers and returned to his table where he read out the two documents after having filled in marius's name the powers conferred were practically unlimited the right to sell and buy mortgage and bring or defend actions when the notary had finished reading he added i must now give you some information respecting the persons you are to represent he handed marius one of the documents and went on this to begin with is the authorization of my friend and client m hautier of lambesque he is just now at cherbourg and will be shortly starting for new york to take possession of a large fortune that has been left him he purchased at marseilles before his departure a building in the rue de rome you will administer the property during his absence i am expecting to receive his instructions to-morrow and i will inform you of them he then took up the other document and continued and this is the authorization of m moutet a retired merchant at toulon who entrusted me with the capital necessary for taking a mortgage on a country house in the st just district he has just remitted a further sum which he wishes to have invested in the same way but as he is a great sufferer from gout he has asked me to find some one who acting under his power of attorney would give the necessary signatures in his stead come back to-morrow and we can then arrange finally about the two matters douglas rose as a hint that the interview was at an end at the door he shook marius's hand with rough and cordial familiarity the young man withdrew rather stunned by the rapidity of what had taken place he was surprised at the facility with which the notary had entrusted him with such important matters and felt ill at ease at the thought of the heavy responsibility about to weigh upon him chapter six marius seeks unsuccessfully for a house and a man marius called on douglas the next day to receive his final instructions come you're punctual said the notary smiling you'll see we shall do plenty of business together i intend to make you rich sit down i'll attend to you in a minute douglas was lunching at the corner of his table he was eating stale bread with a few nuts and drinking plain water 
this frugality impressed marius and removed the uneasiness he had hitherto felt such a sober man could not lead him into shady transactions he was undoubtedly a heart in the right place an upright soul a sincere and pious mind devoted to its duty like a priest devotes himself to god now let's talk said the notary when he had finished his repast i have received a letter from m Autier who wishes to raise money on his house as he requires funds for his journey here's his letter marius took the paper that douglas held out to him as he appeared to be looking for the post-office stamps the notary said hastily the letter was enclosed in a large envelope which contained several other documents the young man coloured up fearing he had wounded his new employer's feelings he read m Autier's letter which indeed asked to have money raised on the house in the rue de rome he instructed douglas to make use of the power of attorney and to remit him the money at the earliest possible moment when marius had finished reading the letter the notary resumed this request for a loan comes at the right moment for m moutet has again been asking me to find him a safe and advantageous investment as you are now the authorized representative of both my clients the lender and the borrower you will be able to satisfy them both at once you have simply to give me your signature and i will transmit to m Autier the cash that m moutet sent me for investment marius thought douglas was settling matters rather quickly he would have liked to have seen the building and to have exchanged at least a letter or two with the persons he was to represent he did not doubt the notary's good faith but he was unable to get rid of some vague and inexplicable fear his uneasiness of the day before was returning it seemed to him that he was descending into some black hole and douglas's smiles and soft voice troubled him strangely he could not define the peculiar sensation that was creeping over him he felt a need of reaction the notary was already sorting out the documents which he required marius to sign ah the deuce said he stopping suddenly there's one paper wanting i must send a clerk to the mortgage office for it douglas seemed very much put out marius as though urged on by some instinct and obeying the feeling of uneasiness which had taken possession of him rose hastily i cannot wait he said i ought already to be at m martelli's put off the signing of the documents please until monday the day after to-morrow very well said the notary after a moment's hesitation i would rather have finished the matter to-day you know in what a hurry m Autier is however come on monday marius breathed more freely when he found himself in the street he thought he had been childish and felt ashamed of the vague suspicions he had entertained he had almost run off under the spell of some indefinable feeling and he shrugged his shoulders after the manner of a person who had been frightened of his shadow he was glad however to have two days during which he could think matters over and account for his repugnance and overcome it during the afternoon he received a visit at m martelli's office which delighted him m de girousse who was killing time by visiting all the towns of the department called upon him he had just reached marseilles and was leaving the same evening ah my dear friend said he to the clerk how lucky you are to be poor and have to work for your living you've no idea how bored i feel if i could i would change places with your brother i think i should enjoy myself more in prison marius smiled at the old count's strange ideas whilst the latter continued philippe's trial helped to keep me going for a month i never before assisted at such a fine spectacle of human misery and folly i had a violent desire when in court to get up and say all i thought they would no doubt have put me into a straight waistcoat lambesque is becoming uninhabitable ever since m de Girousse had put in an appearance marius had been thinking of asking him to give him some information respecting m Autier. he thought the count must surely know this man who belonged to the same little town as himself according to what douglas had said he attempted to assume an indifferent air as he observed but there are some rich people at lambesque you might cultivate their society and amuse yourself more do you know m Autier, a landlord in your neighbourhood i believe m Autier, repeated the old nobleman trying to remember m Autier, i can recall no one of that name at lambesque and you say the gentleman owns property there yes he has recently bought a house at marseilles and he must have a pretty extensive estate close to your own 
m de girousse was still thinking hard you must be mistaken he said at length i certainly know no m otier i am certain there's no landlord in lambesque of that name for i amused myself by learning the names of all the persons in the place one has to do something come let's understand each other resumed marius turning pale i mean a m otier who has just come into a large fortune he is at the present time at cherbourg and is about to leave for new york where the relative whose sole heir he is died the count burst out laughing what yarns that you're telling me he exclaimed if such a thing were to happen at lambesque if one of my neighbours were to inherit the fortune of a rich uncle in america do you think i should know nothing about it and that i should not amuse myself during a whole week with the gossip such a romance would produce in my little town i assure you again that there has never been an hôtier at lambesque and that nobody there has ever inherited the mythical fortune you talk of marius felt quite crushed the count's words carried conviction with them and douglas alone could be the liar in all this the young man did not dare express all he was thinking what interest have you in this monsieur hautier asked m de girousse whose curiosity was excited none at all replied marius stammering one of my friends told me about him and i must have mistaken the name of the town he mentioned he still hesitated to accuse douglas and there was a buzzing sensation in his head which prevented his judging the matter clearly it was in an absent-minded way that he clasped the hand m de girousse held out to him with the words well good-bye come to me at the opening of the shooting season it'll amuse me when the count had gone marius remained in a painful state of perplexity he must certainly have misunderstood yet m de girousse's statements were clear and decisive m otier was not known at lambesque and therefore douglas had lied for some reason or other the young man did not dare fathom the consequences of this falsehood he divined the existence of several pitfalls beneath his feet and could account for the uneasiness he had experienced when with the notary having at present nothing more than suspicions he promised himself that he would discover the whole truth before engaging further in the matter and giving his signature he understood how serious the least accusation would be and he decided to act with extreme prudence without haste and without showing his mistrust the morrow was a sunday and marius having a free day before him went the first thing in the morning to the rue de rome where the property hautier was supposed to have purchased was situated it was a large handsome house let out in flats to different persons armed with his power of attorney marius skilfully questioned each of the tenants and was soon convinced that not one of them knew m hautier nor had even ever seen him and that all of them had up till then dealt directly with douglas the notary the young man's suspicions were being confirmed he thought he would put them to a final test and went to see the former owner of the building whose address one of the tenants gave him his name was landrol and he lived in an adjoining street sir said marius i am instructed by m otier to administer the property you sold him and i wish you to give me some information concerning the leases you granted and the rent you charged m landrol obligingly placed himself at his disposal and answered all his inquiries marius was very circumspect and when he had spoken of one thing and another he cleverly broached the real object of his visit very many thanks he said and i regret to have taken up so much of your time my excuse is that i had not been able to see m otier who is at present away it occurred to me that as you have had dealings with him you could tell me something about him and give me some idea as to what his intentions were but i never treated directly with m otier landrel replied simply i have never even seen the gentleman the affair was carried through m douglas who furnished me with all the necessary signatures ah i thought m otier had inspected the building which is the usual custom not at all don't you know that he has been in america for the last six months m douglas inspected the house himself and bought it for his client whose instructions he had received marius bit his lip he had almost allowed his terrible secret to escape him the day before the notary had told him that hautier had come from lambesque to seek and purchase a house the falsehood was now an absolute certainty hautier could not be at the same time away in america where he had been for the past six months and also awaiting money at cherbourg no doubt the individual was no more known at cherbourg or new york than he was at lambesque 
he was a pure fiction an imaginary puppet whom douglas had conjured up for some criminal design of his own and marius suddenly thought that the power of attorney filled up with his name was in reality a forgery which rendered the forger liable to a sentence of penal servitude he blushed as though he were himself the culprit and muttered some further thanks to landreuil who was eyeing him curiously surprised to find him so badly informed as to the affairs of the person he was representing when marius found himself alone in the street he was obliged to submit to the evidence of his senses only douglas could have forged the document he had in his pocket yet the young man could not exactly understand the reason of the crime the purchase money of the building had been paid so the only explanation he could hit upon was that the notary had acquired the property for himself under an assumed name in order to disguise the amount of his fortune but even then the crime was still there douglas the pious and upright man was a forger marius feared for a time that moutet the retired toulon merchant was also a dummy he hastened to call on one of his friends who had resided a long time at toulon and breathed more freely when on questioning him he learnt that moutet really existed and was one of douglas's clients after this still prompted by his suspicions he decided to see the property upon which moutet held a mortgage he had spent this morning in uselessly seeking a man and he employed his afternoon in hunting for a house brought up in the st just district in his mother's country house marius knew all the residences of the neighbourhood the property upon which douglas professed to hold a mortgage in moutet's name belonged to a m giraud in whose house the young man had often played when a child he went at once to giraud's and paid a friendly call as though he had been strolling in the neighbourhood and wished merely to shake hands with his old friend it was about mid-september at the horizon the sea was slumbering heavy and motionless looking like an immense carpet of blue velvet the countryside extended yellow with sunshine hot and sweltering a gentle breeze rose at times from the shore and went lightly through the branches of the quivering pine trees when marius passed before the country house where his mother had nursed him a poignant emotion brought big tears to his eyes amidst the silence of this scorched and mournful desert he fancied he could hear the beloved voice of the saintly woman whose memory sustained him in his task of deliverance which was weighing him down giraud received him like the prodigal son one never sees you now he said come here sometimes and try and forget all your troubles you will find none but devoted friends here who will help you to pass a few more pleasant hours marius was touched at this reception he had often despaired of humanity since he had found himself face to face with the wickedness of life during an hour he quite forgot the reason of his visit it was giraud himself who gave an opening for the delicate inquiry the young man wished to institute you see said the master of the house we live happily here we're certainly not over rich but the few acres of land we possess suffice for our needs i thought you were in straitened circumstances replied marius the harvests have not been good giraud looked at the young man with surprise straight in circumstances he said not a bit of it why do you say that marius felt himself changing colour excuse me he stammered i don't wish to appear indiscreet i was told that after the last harvest you had been obliged to mortgage your property on hearing this giraud laughed aloud whoever told you that told you wrong he resumed thank heavens i've never mortgaged a single inch of land yet said marius further wishing to be quite sure i was told the notary's name it's m douglas who is stated to have taken the mortgage giraud continued laughing with his broad frank laugh m douglas is a worthy man he replied but whatever property he's got a mortgage on it's certainly not mine the day before marius had seen the document in which giraud's property was distinctly named and it moreover bore the owner's signature the notary had therefore committed a second forgery and this one could not be so easily explained as the first he had evidently kept the money which moutet had intended to be invested for himself marius withdrew desirous of thinking everything over before acting Outier did not exist and the property on which moutet was supposed to have a mortgage was also a fiction since giraud declared it was not his all this was a mystery which the young man dreaded to investigate on the monday morning after a feverish night he decided to call on the notary 
End of chapters 5 and 6part two chapter seven and eight of the mysteries of marseilles by emile zola translated by ernest alfred visitelli this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter seven the cowl does not make the friar on arriving at douglas's marius was surprised at the religious calm reigning in the large cold rooms which he knew to be the abode of crime he could not accustom himself to such hypocrisy and would have liked the very walls to have proclaimed aloud the notary's infamy the quiet activity of the clerks the respectable appearance of the house exasperated him and filled his mind with painful doubts pale and agitated he had seated himself in the ante-room when douglas caught sight of him from his office the door of which was open come in come in he cried you won't be in my way and i'll attend to you in a minute marius walked in and found five or six priests there among them abbe donadei this abbe ever graceful and smiling was cajoling the notary both by word and look he had come to ask for alms you are one of our friends he was saying and we come to you every time the poor boxes of our parishes are empty you do well sir replied douglas rising and taking some gold from a drawer how much do you want he asked the priest well resumed on a day in a soft tone of voice i think that five hundred francs will suffice we are much in need of the assistance of pious and honourable persons here are five hundred francs said douglas interrupting him and he added in a slightly trembling voice pray for me my father then all the priests rose and surrounded the notary thanking him and calling upon heaven to bless him douglas listened to them erect and very pale and marius fancied he could see a slight nervous trembling of his lips and eyelids donna day with easy elegance was inexhaustible in praise and flattering professions the almighty will repay you what you give us he said he is already doing so by making your business prosper and by bestowing on you the peace of mind that is only awarded to the righteous ah sir you are a grand example in this city which is being corrupted by the materialism of the century i would that the whole of our commercial population imitated your simple life and possessed your piety and kindliness of heart one would not then see the horrible spectacle which marseilles is presenting to us douglas seemed uneasy and wearied by the priest's praise he interrupted him a second time and said as he showed him to the door no no i am no saint every one is in need of divine mercy if you think you owe me any thanks be so good as to pray for me the priest made him a final bow and at last withdrew marius seated in a corner of the room had assisted at this scene in silence he felt indignant at the comedy that was being played before his eyes perhaps douglas felt that he was purchasing heaven's forgiveness and paying well for it with the money he had stolen so this godly man this kind-hearted soul who relieved those in distress this christian who devoted so much of his time to the churches was but a hypocrite and a scoundrel and as marius thought thus whilst watching the priests and notary he fancied he was dreaming with his eyes open he had come to overwhelm a forger and he found himself confronted by a charitable man for whom the very church was offering up prayers when the first moment of surprise was over he felt a still more eager desire to do his duty as the notary advanced towards him smiling and with open and extended hand he drew back slowly gazing at him intently then he said suddenly shut the door douglas surprised and as though incapable of resistance went and closed it bolt it resumed marius as harshly as before we have to talk together douglas shot the bolt and came back looking astonished and displeased what is the matter with you my dear friend he asked and as marius influenced perhaps by a last feeling of pity did not answer he continued but after all you're right it's best to be alone when talking business well are you ready i have procured the document that was wanting and now i only require your signature to complete moutet's mortgage on otier's house you know that we are pressed for time i received another letter this morning from my client otier who begs me to send him some money as quickly as possible 
the notary rose from his table spread out some papers and dipping a pen in the ink offered it to marius saying simply sign marius had not said a word but had quietly watched each of the notary's movements instead of taking the pen he looked him straight in the face and said in a calm tone of voice i went yesterday to see the house in the rue de rome i saw the tenants and the former landlord and they all tell me that they do not know m Othier. douglas turned pale and his lips had again that trembling motion marius had already observed he gathered the papers together laid the pen down and reseated himself as he stammered ah you surprise me very much the day before yesterday continued marius i received a visit from m de Girous, a rich landed proprietor of lambesque and he assured me that none of his neighbours was named Othier, and that that person certainly did not exist to-day i know that he was not mistaken what am i to think the notary did not answer he was gazing vaguely before him changing colour and shaking feeling himself lost seeking no doubt in his despair a means of explaining matters satisfactorily i then went to the st just district resumed marius pitilessly the property upon which you told me you had taken a mortgage on your client moutet's behalf happens to belong to one of my mother's old friends m giraud who assured me that his property was quite free i ask you again what am i to think and as douglas still remained silent the young man went on in a louder tone of voice well since you refuse to answer i will tell you myself what i believe and what is indeed true your m othier never existed he is a puppet whom you invented in order to accomplish some nefarious scheme more easily in addition to this you never took any mortgage and you put moutet's money into your own pocket to arrive at this fine result you have committed several forgeries and to-day you are quite prepared to commit others in order to procure a further supply of cash for your needs it was as though marius was speaking to an insensible and motionless statue the notary's calm increased the young man's anger i have not to judge your crimes he continued louder still but i have to ask you for an explanation of your unworthy conduct towards myself what you intended light-heartedly to mix me up in your dirty business you would have compromised me while professing to be my friend and knowing my position as a humble worker i have the right have i not to tell you that you are a scoundrel the notary did not wince and just now resumed marius there were priests here blessing you ah uh, you played your part admirably i alone in marseilles know what you are and were i to state in public the enormity of your crime i should very likely be stoned you have so skilfully duped every one who would believe that the notary douglas that man esteemed by all that frugal religious individual is shamelessly working in the dark the ruin of his numerous clients i myself would still doubt if doubt were possible at seeing you seated so calm before me in your humble and pious attitude of a monk at prayer but say something defend yourself if you can douglas had taken up a paper knife and was playing with it as though indifferent to all marius was saying to him what would you have me tell you he replied at last you judge me as a child i've let you have your say perhaps now you'll listen to me without interrupting chapter eight the notary's speculations when marius heard douglas accuse him of judging like a child he was indignant and opened his lips to tell him that he judged as an honest man would this forger thought it childish that he should be reproached with his forgeries and he assumed the attitude of a misunderstood individual as the young man was on the point of protesting the notary interrupted him with a movement of impatience if you're always talking he said you'll always be in the right i let you insult me to your heart's content so allow me to defend myself without interruption i certainly would rather you had not become acquainted with my system but as you have discovered a part of the truth i prefer to tell you all i know you are intelligent and you will understand me better than any other moreover i am worn out i have not been successful in the application of my theory and i know very well that i am a lost man that's why i consent to unbosom myself entirely to you you will see that i never wished for any one's ruin and that it was with good faith that i offered as a friend to put you in the way of earning a little money anyhow you will judge me and i trust that after hearing my explanation you will simply look upon me as an unfortunate speculator 
please listen to what i have to say marius almost fancied he was dreaming he looked at douglas as one would look at a madman talking reason the peaceful tone of the man his want of remorse his self-satisfied manner made him resemble some honest inventor sadly explaining without cause for shame why his invention had not succeeded there's no need to go into details he resumed and let us put aside the oti and mute matters which are but of slight importance the thing to see and judge is the whole vast and complicated machine that i had succeeded in establishing you are surprised at my complaisance well i tell you again i am a lost man i can speak without fear of compromising myself in fact i experience a sort of pleasure in explaining my invention to you he took up the position before marius of a man who has an interesting story to tell and was still toying with the paper knife first of all he said i recognize with you that i have betrayed my trust and that i am a great criminal if considered as a notary but i have always looked upon myself as a banker a money-dealer in a word please behold in me nothing more than a speculator when i succeeded my former employer the practice was a very small one my first efforts were directed towards making that practice the medium of a vast business connection i was obliged to satisfy all requirements lend to whosoever needed money borrow of those who wanted to invest sell to those who wished to buy purchase of those who desired to sell i was like the bird catchers who make use of decoy birds to call the wild ones i invented some forty imaginary persons in whose names i was able to embark in all kinds of transactions Oti, i admit was one of them i was thus enabled to purchase a large number of buildings which i paid for by means of loans contracted by the fictitious purchasers and by granting mortgages on these buildings by these means i created a capital a considerable turnover a much more extended practice which served as a foundation to my credit douglas was speaking in a clear tone of voice he continued after a short silence you must know that when one speculates on money one is at times brought face to face with terrible exigencies i should have been forced to stop at the very outset of my speculations if my buildings being mortgaged i had not been able to procure by some means the funds necessary for the other operations i was contemplating i did what seemed to be the simplest and most convenient thing to do when the mortgages had reached the full value of the properties i released the latter by false discharges and then offered them as security for fresh loans what you are telling me is infamous exclaimed marius i begged you not to interrupt me douglas retorted abruptly i will defend myself later on at present i am merely stating the facts i soon had to enlarge my system my forty personages no longer sufficed so i then had recourse to extreme measures which from their very audacity succeeded perfectly i caused well-known landowners and merchants to contract loans mortgaged their properties and forged their signatures afterwards each fresh mortgage was wiped out by the aid of a false discharge which shielded me from all uneasiness you understand it's very simple yes yes i understand murmured marius who was beginning to think the notary was mad besides douglas went on i raised money no matter how when it was necessary i wished to go straight to my goal and i have ever marched steadily on without troubling myself about obstacles and accepting freely the consequences of my theory for instance i sometimes created both the borrower and the building in the same transaction i have taken mortgages on a property which did not exist or which did not belong to the pretended borrower at other times when i have been in urgent need of money to meet some unforeseen exigency i have drawn bills payable to order and signed by the leading merchants of marseilles and which i have put into circulation at a loss after accepting them in my own name you see that i am hiding nothing from you and that i am accusing myself i am laying myself bare before you because i wish to justify myself and also because in future i must give over applying my system marius was utterly terrified he entered tremblingly the recesses of this man's mind he felt that he was in the presence of a moral phenomenon and he submitted to this strange confession like one submits to a nightmare 
it seemed to him that he was in the thick of the roar and smoke of some machine surrounded by the revolving gear so douglas resumed you quite understand what my system was in principle i wished to be a banker to turn to account the funds that passed through my hands i acquired on my own account properties which i fancied i could resell at a profit my system of fictitious names answered all requirements by the aid of these names i was able to deal with all who applied to me i have been according to the opportunity lender borrower purchaser and seller whenever the funds raised by my personal credit or the credit i had procured for the fictitious individuals did not suffice for my needs i obtained others by negotiating supposed loans on behalf of no matter who relative friend or client being careful later on to release that person's property the same as i had mortgaged it unbeknown to himself in a word my office became a banking establishment a thieving establishment exclaimed marius a forger's den douglas shrugged his shoulders you ought by now to understand me he said and to see that i never sought to rob a single one of my clients i have a hope that you will do me justice by and by i have now to tell you about my finest invention to administer the properties acquired and turn the borrowed monies to good account i conceived the idea of establishing agents acting under power of attorney who would represent in all matters my forty imaginary personages and to fill these posts i selected honourable young men who became my unconscious accomplices i had faith in my system and i should most certainly have enriched those who assisted me if unfortunate circumstances had not marred my success when i proposed to you to represent Otier, i desired solely as i have already told you to come to your assistance and give you a share in the profits of a speculation which i considered an excellent one these last words exasperated marius he could bear it no longer and he felt he would go mad if he continued to follow douglas's strange talk i have listened to you patiently he said shaking with indignation the rascalities you have been telling me of with such cool impudence prove to my mind that you are either a fool or a rogue not at all interrupted the notary striking the table with his fist you have certainly not understood me i have told you four or five times i'm a banker listen to me for goodness sake douglas rose and placed himself before marius there was nothing in his attitude to indicate either fear or shame you have called me a rogue and a thief said he softly and i let you insult me for you were accusing me in the name of society speaking as the crown attorney would speak when judging my conduct from the legal standpoint you must look at it from another point of view if you would understand me let us reason a bit a thief is he who steals another's property and makes off when his pockets are full is he not i have never for a moment thought of stealing i have been applying my system during six years and i am poorer now than when i first began my operations have not succeeded i have even lost some thousands of francs which were my own you know what my life has been i have lived on bread and water i have led the existence of an austere and indefatigable worker the only luxury i have allowed myself has been to give a little in charity a strange thief indeed who has lived in his office as in a cloister and who has handled enormous sums of money without even being tempted to steal a copper admit that if i were really a thief i should long ago have got together what funds i could and have bolted marius felt surprised and embarrassed he had not looked at the matter in that light the man was evidently right he could not be accused of robbery what shocks and incenses you resumed douglas is my system itself it has failed and i shall be considered a great criminal if it had succeeded i should have realized a large fortune without doing the slightest injury to any one i should have been immensely rich and the world would have esteemed me yes crime has been my base of operation i have speculated on forgery i have followed a new and bold line but to my mind success was certain 
i had faith in my activity it never occurred to me that i might drag another down in my fall that is wherein i was blind you see my course of proceeding i took mortgages on property which did not exist or which had already been mortgaged but i paid the interest on the money invested i put forged bills into circulation but i took them up at maturity my imaginary personages were so to say nothing more than borrowed names to cover myself and i made use of them simply to increase my speculations understand me well i wished above all to procure funds and turn them to account what matter the fictitious securities i emitted the forged documents the different means i employed to extend my credit and the sphere of my business in speculation the only reality is the profit one is able to draw more or less skilfully from a given capital take the stock exchange for instance there one trades on mere suppositions admit for a moment that by buying and selling properties by means of other people's money i had succeeded in doubling the capital i had illegally procured i should have refunded that capital in full have robbed nobody destroyed the forged documents and have retired with a fortune won by my labour and intelligence that's my system in its entirety having no fortune of my own i was obliged to borrow of my clients the principal necessary for carrying on my operations it was no theft but a mere loan on hearing douglas's clear and logical reasoning a kind of terror crept over marius the notary grew terribly in his eyes for a moment he looked upon him as some misguided genius who had employed his rare faculties of energy and daring in the cause of evil had the man had large means of action he might perhaps have accomplished great things there are some superior qualities residing in all criminals of douglas's calibre marius was above all surprised by the simple and natural manner in which the notary spoke of the forgeries he had committed his mind was undoubtedly disordered the man was ill the fever of speculation which devoured him had brought him little by little to look upon crime as an excellent medium provided the crime remained concealed and unpunished he had said it himself though he had forged he still considered himself an honest man so long as he caused no one to lose anything after a pause douglas went on shaking his head the while systems are always splendid practice alone opens your eyes to their defects in theory i should have won an immense fortune i don't know how it has happened but i am now overwhelmed with debt and i can see very well that all hope is gone my unfortunate operations have swallowed up over a million and my clients are ruined the notary's voice had grown feebler and emotion was filling his eyes with tears he walked feverishly up and down and as he did so he continued you've no idea what a frightful life i've been leading these past two years every one of my operations failed and i found myself face to face with terrible exigencies to preserve my credit to conceal my forgeries i have been daily obliged to commit others i no longer dreamed of making money i only thought of defending myself and escaping the galleys i take heaven to witness that had i been able to get back the money that was lost i would have reimbursed every one and then lived as a law-abiding citizen but the enormous amount of interest i had to pay crushed me i resold at a loss the properties i had acquired in spite of my struggles ill luck has clung to me and weighed me down to the very depths of ruin to-day my liabilities are considerable i cannot meet this fortnight's bills and for me a suspension of payment means penal servitude if the authorities were ever to examine my papers i should be at once arrested and put in prison marius almost felt disposed to pity the wretch douglas sat down again and resumed dejectedly after all though this is the end i've confessed to you and i know that you're about to hand me over to justice let it be so for my position is no longer bearable you're right i'm a scoundrel and i ought to be punished marius did not stir he was reflecting uncertain how to act one fear stayed him he did not wish to be mixed up in the matter in case he should be called as a witness and thus lose precious time which belonged to his mission 
moreover it was not his business to denounce the notary there was no escape now for the man he was fatally on the road to his punishment and would fall of his own accord into his judge's hands well why do you hesitate asked douglas you know all i'll await here the police officers you are going for the young man rose from his chair and tore up the documents containing his name you are a wretch he replied my judgment has not changed but there is no need for me to assist justice which will know how to punish you without my help your chastisement will come of itself and he walked out of the office here is the end of this episode on the morrow douglas unable to meet his engagements took to flight marseilles was panic-stricken at the news several fortunes were compromised and it was impossible at first to gauge the full extent of the disaster it was a kind of public misfortune with the dismay of those concerned was mingled the astonishment of all honest persons they could not forgive the notary the hypocrisy with which he had deceived a whole city during several years douglas was caught and tried at aix in the midst of a terrible feeling of irritation he accepted his position with rare coolness without his assistance the authorities would never have succeeded in unravelling such an intricate affair the court had to pronounce on more than nine hundred deeds infected with every kind of forgery varied in so many ways that the human mind could not have conceived any combination of which the forger had not made use the misdeeds laid to his charge were so numerous were complicated with so many details and affected so great a number of victims that it would have been impossible to have seen clearly amidst the chaos without the assistance of him who after imagining and putting his crimes into execution could alone unravel the skein of them douglas set to work with indefatigable zeal and surprising truthfulness to clear up the disorder of his affairs and to fix his own position as well as those of his creditors and debtors he continued to energetically defend himself against the accusation of theft he repeated that he was an unfortunate speculator and if justice and circumstances had permitted him he would have retrieved his affairs as well as those of his clients he seemed to be accusing the court of binding his hands of preventing him repairing the harm he had done he was condemned to penal servitude for life and to be publicly exhibited in the pillory at marseilles End of chapter 7 and 8part two chapters nine and ten of the mysteries of marseilles by emile zola translated by ernest alfred visitelli this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter nine how an ugly man may become handsome it was now more than two months since marius and fine had returned to marseilles on leaving the notary's office the young man had to own to himself that up till then he had been wasting his time and that so far he had not obtained the first franc of the fifteen thousand he required for philippe's safety after all he knew only how to show his love and devotion he felt he had a soul too upright a mind too loyal and too generously artless for him to be able to procure in a few weeks the large sum he was so despairingly seeking he had always acted like a child the deplorable incidents with which he had recently found himself mixed up the loves of armand and sauveur douglas's hypocrisy and forgeries had shown him life under a terrifying aspect which discouraged him he retreated instead of advancing he feared in making another attempt to fail and even compromise himself by falling again into the hands of rogues who would take advantage of him in his suspicious state he saw nothing but snares around him such tender hearts ignorant of evil and desirous of good are predestined to be wounded and made to bleed at every hour of the day yet the month of december was drawing nigh and it was necessary to make haste if philippe was to be saved no further mercy would be shown and the condemned man would be undoubtedly fastened to the infamous pillory at that thought marius shed tears of impotence and weariness he would he could have freed his brother by some herculean task if he had been put to the proof he would have undertaken to pierce the prison wall with his nails to have scraped and crumbled the stone away beneath his fingers that laborious exploit would not have appeared to him a hard one and he would have succeeded in it although he wore his fingers to the bone but the thought of the fifteen thousand francs terrified him once it was a question of money 
of taking humiliating steps or of engaging in more or less equivocal dealings he went off his head and felt incapable of conducting the least enterprise to a successful conclusion this explained the artless confidence which had taken him to armand and douglas all hope however was not yet dead within him thanks to those same qualities which were his weakness to his kindly heart and upright mind he always returned to the thoughts of self-reliance and hope the lessons which the ignominies of life had taught him could not prevent him still believing in the helpful sympathy of others i have more than six weeks before me yet he thought it's impossible that i shall not find some true friend by then there's no reason for despair he would certainly have fallen ill with the anguish the hopes and disappointments of his task if he had not had a comforter at hand who smiled at him when most depressed a strong friendship had grown up between him and the cougourdans he went nearly every day to see fine and spent long evenings in her society at the beginning they talked together of philippe then whilst not forgetting the poor prisoner they conversed about themselves about their childhood and future these were chats quite free from all restraint which rested them after the fatigues and anxieties of the day and gave them fresh courage for the morrow every morning marius little by little began ardently to long for the evening in order to find himself back in fine's little room when he had a gleam of hope he ran to tell it to his friend and when he had met with some disappointment he also hastened to relate it to her and be consoled it was only there in that clean and tidy attic which smelt so sweet and looked so gay that he felt at ease in the midst of his tender sadness one evening he persisted in helping the young woman who was making up some bouquets for the morrow's sale he took a childish delight in removing the thorns from the roses in gathering up the pinks into slender bunches in delicately taking one by one the violets and marguerites and handing them to fine from that time he became a florist every evening between eight and ten the work amused him he said and quieted his anxieties if ever his fingers touched fines when handing her the flowers he felt a gentle warmth rise to his face the strange uneasiness the penetrating emotion he then experienced was no doubt the sole cause of his sudden inclination for making bouquets marius was certainly a simpleton he would have been much surprised even hurt if any one told him that he was falling in love with fine he would have exclaimed that he knew he was much too ugly to dare to love the young woman and that moreover such a love born and developed in the shadow of his brother's misfortune would have seemed to him a crime but his heart would soon have protested he had never lived much in the society of a woman and had let himself be caught by the first affectionate glance bestowed upon him fine consoling and encouraging him ever ready with a caressing smile and a warm pressure of the hand seemed to him at first both a sister and a mother whom heaven had sent him in his affliction the truth was that unbeknown to himself this sister this mother was becoming a bride a bride whom he already loved with all the tender and devoted ardour of his heart and this love was bound to spring up between two young people who wept and smiled in company chance had brought them together and their goodness was uniting them they were worthy of each other they possessed the all-powerful sympathy of devotion for some time past a sly smile which marius had failed to notice had been playing about fine's lips she guessed the young man loved her long before he himself had become aware of his love women have a special gift of penetrating this sort of secret they can read in their lovers eyes and see into the innermost recesses of their souls the flower-girl however was careful to hide her blushes she schooled herself to remain marius's cordial friend and not to open his eyes by a warmer grasp of the hand to see them each evening seated opposite one another with a table covered with roses between them one would have taken them for brother and sister on sundays fine went to st henri she felt a sort of sympathetic pity a compassionate friendship for blanche the poor young girl who was soon to become a mother and whose life was for ever blighted became every day dearer to her she saw her remorse her tears of regret she assisted at her disconsolate existence and sought by her visits to assuage her misery she brought her bright smile to that little house by the sea where blanche was weeping as she thought of philippe and her unborn babe it was like a holy pilgrimage for the flower girl and she accomplished it religiously she started off about midday after luncheon and remained till dusk with mademoiselle de casalis in the evening as night was falling she found marius waiting for her on the seashore and they returned together to marseilles on foot arm in arm like a young married couple 
marius tasted pure joy during these walks sunday evening became for him the reward of all his efforts of the week he waited for fine by the sea forgetful of his sorrows feverishly watching for the young woman's arrival then when she was there they smiled at each other and returned slowly in the soft shadows of the gathering night exchanging words of friendship and hope never did the young man think the road long enough one sunday marius arrived early as a feeling of delicacy prevented him calling at blanche's house and so adding to her grief he sat down on the cliff which rises near the village and took patience in watching the blue immensity spread out before him he remained there nearly two hours lost in a vague reverie in thoughts of love and happiness which softly lulled him the immense horizon moved him unconsciously his love for fine rose from his heart to his lips the sea and sky the infinity of the waters and the air affected him opened his soul he beheld but fine in the boundless sea he heard but her name in the dull and regular murmur of the waves the flower-girl arrived and seated herself on the rock beside the young man who took her hand without speaking before them was spread the sea and heavens both of a soft pale blue twilight was falling profound serenity was alike enfeebling the last sounds and the last rays thin rosy gleams in the west were casting their delicate reflections on the rocks of the shore there was a breath of tenderness in the air a great quivering voice which grew softer and softer deeply moved marius kept his friend's hand in his as he continued his dream his eyes fixed on the horizon on that vague haze where heaven and sea mingled together he was smiling sadly and in a low voice and quite unconsciously his lips gave utterance to the thoughts of his heart no no he murmured i am too ugly from the moment marius took her hand fine had been smiling in her sly and tender way at last her friend was going to make up his mind to speak she guessed it from the deeper look in his eyes his tighter grasp when she heard the young man say he was too ugly she seemed surprised and annoyed too ugly she exclaimed but you are quite handsome marius fine had put so much feeling into the cry which had escaped her that marius looked round and clasped his hands as he gazed at her anxiously she feeling that she had abruptly delivered up the secret of her heart lowered her face which became covered with blushes she remained thus speechless and embarrassed during some seconds but she was not the girl to withdraw from the complete avowal of her love she possessed too much frankness and sprightliness to indulge in the hypocritical comedy which most young persons in love go through on similar occasions she courageously raised her face and looked straight at marius who was trembling listen my friend she said to him i wish to speak frankly six months ago i hardly thought of you at all i considered you to be ugly no doubt i had never really looked at you to-day i think you are quite handsome i don't know how it has happened i assure you in spite of her resolution she hesitated a little and sudden blushes again covered her cheeks she stopped short unable to tell marius plainly that she loved him she knew the young man's timidity and had spoken solely to encourage him marius remained in his state of tender ecstasy he required no more and would have remained there on the cliff all night without seeking to obtain from fine a more complete avowal she was growing impatient the story of her love was a simple one at first she had admired philippe's tall frame and energetic countenance with that blindness of young girls which prompts them to choose handsome lads those who carry all their beauty on their faces and none in their souls then wounded to the heart by the indifference of blanche's lover seeing at last clearly into his vain nature she had begun to look more severely upon his conduct and had become little by little estranged from him it was at this time that she found herself frequently with marius in an intimacy which brought them closer and closer together in this instance love had been born of kindliness marius ugly to the eyes became beautiful for the heart at first fine had seen in him merely a disheartened friend who needed help she had undertaken half his task in a sisterly way prompted a little by love for philippe and a great deal by a natural desire to be serviceable she had therefore joined marius and their common thought of deliverance had united them more each day it was thus that their affection grew they loved each other through their self-devotion whilst living on the same hope and working for the same object 
and it was in the accomplishment of this generous task that marius became handsome the comparison which fine could not help drawing between philippe and marius made the latter appear an exceptional being the charming prince of a young girl's dreams marius's countenance became forthwith transfigured in her eyes it appeared to her quite handsome with all the beauty of his loyal and tender nature she would have been immensely surprised had any one told her her lover was ugly marius could still hear the young woman's cry that cry of the heart which as good as told him you are handsome and i love you he dared not speak fearing to dispel the sweet dream which was so deliciously soothing his mind fine in her embarrassment continued to smile you don't believe me she asked speaking merely for the sake of speaking and scarcely knowing what she was saying yes i believe you marius replied in a low deep voice i need to believe you when you were not there the murmur of the waves told me a secret i don't know what is the matter with the sea and the sky this evening they speak in so sweet a voice that they have moved my heart and disturbed my mind at this close of day amidst the sadness of the twilight i have just discovered within myself a happiness i had never dreamed of would you like to know the secret the waves whispered in my ear yes said the young woman while her emotion caused her hand to tremble marius leant towards her and murmured in a faint and timid tone of voice the waves told me that i loved you the shadows were falling more grey and solemn in the heavens lights appeared amid a milky transparency the dark blue motionless sea was slumbering as it wafted its sluggish heavy breath fresh and briny odours arose borne by the evening breeze and the serenity of space spread in the advancing night the hour was a fit one for an avowal of love a divine tenderness a smiling calm came from the vast compassionate sea at the foot of the cliff the waves were slowly breaking lulling the sleeping coast whilst from the earth still hot and feverish rose a fierce breath of passion it seemed as though the vast sea was adding its voice to marius's tender words well said the flower girl gaily the waves are chatterboxes but did they tell you the truth yes yes he exclaimed the waves spoke the truth i feel it now my friend i've been loving you for months past ah what a lot of good this avowal does me for a long time past i have felt there was something wanting when i was in your presence i became penetrated by some pleasant sensation i could hear some indistinct voices within me and i could not make out what they were whispering now the silence of this cliff has sufficed for me to hear them tell of my love fine listened to marius's words with a smile on her lips the shadows were becoming more and more bluish and mysterious marius hesitated for a moment then asked in a soft and humble tone of voice you are not angry at what i am telling you i know very well that you cannot love me you know nothing at all replied fine with abrupt tenderness good heavens what a time you are making up your mind my answer has been ready for more than a month past and what is it ask the waves the young woman answered with a laugh she held out her hands to marius who kissed them passionately it was now quite dark and the dull moan of the sea lingered voluptuously in the gloom the young man bent over the young woman and their lips met then they talked as lovers do in the puerile way of children going from recollections of the past to projects for the future their voices were a music which caressed them and they talked to hear each other speak to feel one another's warm breath play about their faces they were so happy in the obscurity in face of the infinite which lay open before them listen said fine we will get married when your brother is free philippe must be placed in safety first at the mention of philippe's name marius shuddered he had forgotten his brother the sad reality rose before him for two hours he had been living in the seventh heaven and now he had fallen back to the earth from the height of his dream philippe he murmured despondently yes we must think of him oh heavens is my happiness already dead you love my brother do you not for mercy's sake tell me the truth fine said nothing but burst into sobs the young man's words were breaking her heart 
in his despair he pressed for an answer and at last the flower-girl cried i love you because you are good because you know how to love so you see well enough that i cannot love philippe there was such a burst of faith and love in this cry that marius at last understood he placed his arms around her in a sudden transport of adoration and then he had a slight feeling of remorse we are happy he observed and egotistical whilst we are breathing here the free air of heaven our brother is pining in prison ah we know not how to work for his deliverance yes you'll see fine replied you'll see what one can do when one's in love and loved in return they remained hand in hand without saying another word while the sea continued to lull their love with its monotonous voice the stars were shining brightly as they re-entered marseilles their hearts full of their young hopes and affection chapter ten hostilities are renewed blanche passed her days in tears the autumn was giving a pale hue to the melancholy horizon the season was becoming cold and dreary chill blasts stirred the sea whose voice had changed into a wail whilst the trees were casting their leaves upon the ground beneath the mournful nudity of the heavens lay the bareness of the sea and shore this sadness of the air this last farewell of summer spread over blanche's surroundings the despair which already filled her heart she led a retired life in the little house by the shore it was situated a short distance from the village of st henri stood alone upon a cliff and overlooked the sea which beat against the rocks beneath the windows blanche would spend whole days together watching and listening to the waves whose constant noise soothed her sufferings this was her sole diversion she followed with her eyes the great sheets of foam which broke and leapt into the air her aching being found relief in presence of the mild and monotonous immensity occasionally of an evening she would go out accompanied by her companion she would descend to the seashore and seat herself on a fragment of rock the cool night breeze calmed the fever that was consuming her she would linger in the darkness deafened by the breaking of the waves upon the beach and not return home until she was shivering with the cold the same thought was ever oppressing her at each succeeding hour it was there overwhelming inexorable in the chilliness of the night or the warmth of the day in presence of the infinite or before the void of darkness blanche thought of philippe and her unborn babe fine was her great consoler if the flower-girl had not consented to spend the sunday afternoons with her the poor young creature would have died of despair she felt an imperious need of confiding her grief to some kind soul solitude frightened her for when she found herself alone again her remorse rose before her like a spectre and filled her with terror directly fine arrived they both went up to a little room where they shut themselves into talk and weep undisturbed the window stood open and far away on the blue velvet of the sea white sails would pass like messengers of hope and on each occasion the same tears were shed the same words spoken heart-rending and pathetic oh how gloomy life is said blanche i have been thinking all day of the hours i passed with philippe among the rocks of jaunegarde and the infernet i ought to have killed myself in those gulfs have fallen down some precipice why be always weeping ever regretting fine gently replied you're no longer a little girl and have sacred duties to fulfil for heaven's sake think of the present and no longer linger in an ever irreparable past you will end by making yourself ill by killing your child blanche shuddered kill my child she resumed amidst her sobs do not say that the child must live to atone for my transgression and obtain my pardon ah philippe was right when he said that i should belong to him for ever though i denied him i have vainly tried to tear the memory of him from my heart my pride has been crushed and i have been obliged to yield to the love filled with remorse which is torturing me and to-day i love philippe more than i ever did before with all my regrets and all my despair fine said nothing she would have liked to have seen blanche stronger and prepared for the difficult task maternity was about to bring her but mademoiselle de cazalis was always the poor weak creature who could do nothing but cry the flower-girl determined to act herself when the time came if you knew 
continued blanche how i suffer when you're not here i feel philippe torturing me he lives again in my child and is ever with me reproaching me with my perjury he is always before me or about me i can see him on his pallet in his cell i hear him complaining and cursing me i would i had no heart then i might live in peace come you must be calm said fine with such despair consolation is often powerless the young woman assisted with a certain terror at these scenes of distress she studied blanche's shattered love like a physician studies some strange and terrible malady and said to herself that is how one suffers that is what one becomes when one loves timidly one day when in one of her fits of despair blanche said in a broken voice with her eyes fixed upon her companion you are going to marry him are you not fine did not at first understand blanche who added hastily hide nothing from me i would rather know all you are a good girl and will make him happy and i prefer to see him married to you than to know he is gadding about marseilles when i am dead tell him that i always loved him and she burst into sobs the flower girl gently took her hands i beg you she said think no more of your lover but think of your child if possible forget everything for it besides be easy i shall never marry philippe though i may become his sister his sister interrupted mademoiselle de cazalis yes answered fine smiling sweetly as she thought of marius i love and am beloved and she told her the story of her love appeasing her fever by speaking to her of marius as she listened to the recital of this peaceful courtship blanche's tears fell less fast from that day forth she loved fine far more she felt only a faint sadness when thinking of philippe and determined to devote herself to her child true love the devoted generous love of her friend had entered her heart sometimes fine found abbe chastanier in the little house on the cliff the priest took blanche the consolation of religion he sustained her by talking to her of heaven by withdrawing her thoughts from the world and its passions he would have liked to have seen mademoiselle de cazalis enter a convent for he felt that there was no longer any happiness possible for her amid the pleasures of society she would have to remain everlastingly a widow and she did not possess the strength of mind necessary to make herself a peaceful existence in her widowhood but the poor priest was very ignorant of matters relating to the heart blanche much preferred to weep with fine whilst talking of philippe than to listen to abbe chastanier's sermons yet the old man spoke to her at times in profound accents and the girl looked at him with surprise seized with a desire to penetrate into the peaceful world in which he lived she wished to kneel down to remain for ever in obeisance absorbed in an ecstasy that would have delivered her from all her sufferings it was thus that she became little by little that which she was destined to be a servant of god one of those holy women whom the world has wounded and who ascend to heaven before their death one day abbe chastanier remained till evening and left with fine he had to tell the flower girl some bad news which he did not wish to mention before blanche he found marius on the shore awaiting his sweetheart my dear child he said there is more trouble in store for you m de cazalis wrote to me yesterday he is much surprised that the sentence pronounced against your brother has not yet been carried out and informs me he is taking steps to hasten the date of the public exhibition in the pillory how are you getting on do you hope soon to secure the prisoner's release well no replied marius sorrowfully i am no farther advanced than on the first day i hope to have still at least six weeks before me i do not think the abbe resumed that m de cazalis will be able to induce the president to break with us besides our interview has remained secret and that makes me believe that the exhibition will not take place till the end of december as promised but i advise you to make haste one can never say what may happen and i thought it right to let you know what i had been told fine and marius were in dismay they returned to marseilles with the priest silently and again a prey to their anguish their love had in a sense blinded them during a week and now they once more beheld the same abyss before them end of chapters nine and ten part two 
chapters eleven twelve and thirteen of the mysteries of marseilles by emile zola translated by ernest alfred visitelli this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter eleven douglas in the pillory at marseilles some few mornings afterwards towards nine o'clock as marius was on his way to his office he found the rue paradis full of a noisy crowd which was going in the direction of the Canbière he stopped at the corner of the rue de la dasse and standing on tiptoe caught a glimpse of the place royale full of people it was like a sea of human heads the unceasing flow of the crowd about him continued on its way with a noisy hum the keen curiosity evinced by the mob gradually took hold of marius also stray words which he caught from time to time filled him with vague anxiety and he also wished to go and see he allowed himself to be carried along by the crowd which was streaming down the street like a torrent he easily reached the place royale but there the throng which surged from the rue paradis broke itself against a compact immovable mass of people all were standing on tiptoe and looking in the direction of the canbiere the young man obtained a vague view of some soldiers on horseback he could distinguish nothing else and did not yet guess what painful sight could thus attract the entire population of the city the crowd about him was shouting voices gave utterance to sudden sharp words which rose above the discordant hum of the multitude and reached him distinctly he arrived from aix during the night yes and he'll start to-morrow for toulon i should like to see what figure he cuts they say he burst into sobs when he saw the executioner bring the cords no no he kept up well believe me he's a plucky fellow who doesn't weep like a woman ah the scoundrel the people should stone him i shall try and get nearer wait for me they must be hooting him there i want to join in these words interspersed with jeers and yelled out with angry gesticulations sounded cruelly in marius's ears a genuine terror seized him and a cold sweat broke out on his forehead he was frightened and incapable of reasoning he asked himself in his anguish who the man could be whom the mob was hurrying to insult the crowd was growing denser and more eager every moment and he saw that he would never be able to pierce the formidable mass before him so he decided to get round the place royale he went slowly down the rue vacon took the rue beauvau and eventually reached the canbiere there a strange sight awaited him the whole extent of the canbiere from the harbour to the cour bazins was filled with an immense mob which was added to every minute throngs of people were streaming down every street at times a breath of anger rushed through the crowd and then shouts arose spread like vast billows with the deep murmur of the sea all the windows were filled with spectators urchins had climbed up the shop fronts along the houses all marseilles was there and each head was eagerly gazing in the same direction there were more than sixty thousand persons on the canbiere staring and hooting when marius had succeeded in drawing near he then understood what kind of sight was attracting and detaining the crowd in the centre of the canbiere opposite the place royale stood a scaffold made of rough planks on which was a man tied to a post two companies of infantry a picket of mounted gendarmerie and chasseurs were drawn round the platform and protecting the culprit against the increasing fury of the mob at first marius only beheld the wretch fastened to the pillory and towering above the crowd a horrible anxiety made him seek to see the man's face perhaps it was philippe perhaps m de casalis had succeeded in having the date of the execution of the sentence advanced at that thought marius's sight became confused tears filled his eyes and there was like a thick cloud hanging before his gaze which prevented him distinguishing anything he leant against a shop feeling faint and stabbed to the heart by each shout of the crowd in his feverish state he ended by really believing that he recognized his brother on the scaffold that it was indeed philippe who was there and whom the multitude was insulting the shame pain and pity which then took possession of him filled him with atrocious anguish during several minutes he remained like one annihilated then he recovered sufficient courage to raise his head and look the wretched man was firmly tied to the post he wore a vest and trousers of grey canvas his head was covered by a cap and he had drawn the peak down over his eyes he obstinately held his head bent thus preventing the spectators seeing his features 
his face was turned towards the port and he never once raised his head to gaze at the broad sea which spread out before him free and happy when marius had again looked at the prisoner he felt a doubt and with it relief the man seemed twice as stout as his brother moreover he knew philippe and was confident that he would not have bowed his head thus but would have considered it a duty to return the crowd scorn for scorn yet marius still had a vague fear the hidden face disquieted him he would have liked to have had a clear view of the culprit's features all about the young man the mob continued to utter exclamations yells of anger or irony hold up your head you rogue show us your face you scoundrel oh he'll never look up he's frightened well he's harmless now he's got his hands tied and will never again rob anybody you think so do you he almost stole his pardon yes yes some rich people pious people tried to have him spared the ignominy of the pillory a poor man wouldn't have met with such sympathy but the king didn't give way he said the punishment must be the same for all scoundrels whether high or low oh the king's a good fellow hi douglas rogue rascal thief hypocrite you won't play any more of your pranks my friend you won't go again to church to pray to have your forgeries concealed marius breathed more freely the cries he heard told him at last who was the sufferer then he recognized douglas he caught a distinct view of the ex-notary's pale fat face but in the innermost recesses of his heart he thought of his brother and remembered that philippe also might have to confront the jeers and howls of the mob the multitude was still roaring he's ruined more than fifty families penal servitude is too light a punishment for him we should take the law into our own hands yes that's it we'll capture him and lynch him when he passes by look how comfortable he seems up there he doesn't suffer half enough he ought to be hung up by his feet ah there's the executioner about to untie him come along it was true and douglas left the scaffold he was placed in a little open cart drawn by a single horse which was to take him back to the prison at this moment there was a great commotion amongst the people everybody rushed forward to hoot and perhaps kill the wretch but the foot soldiers surrounded the cart whilst those on horseback galloped about and broke up the mob marius looked a last time at the culprit with intense pity the man was no doubt very guilty but the cavalry of shame he was ascending turned him rather into an object of commiseration than of anger the young man had remained leaning against a shop as he was watching the departure of the cart he heard two workmen who were passing by say we'll come back next month you know they're going to exhibit that fellow who carried off the young lady it'll be more amusing ah oh, yes philippe Cayol. i knew him he's a big chap we must find out the proper day so as not to miss it they'll be a fine to do the workmen went off and marius remained with a pale face and an aching heart the men were right in a month's time it would be his brother's turn and he reflected that chance had caused him to assist at all the horrors philippe would have to go through he knew now what sufferings awaited him he could fancy him in douglas's place and pictured to himself the horrible scene that would be enacted his anguish kept him a long time with closed eyes and ears full of a confused hum he was seeing philippe on the scaffold and listening to the laughing crowd insulting him chapter twelve marius loses his wits as marius was leaning against the shop front his eyes fixed on the ground and deeply affected by the scene at which he had been assisting he felt a hand laid on his shoulder with friendly roughness he looked up and beheld sauvaire the master stevedore before him well my young friend what on earth are you doing there sauvaire exclaimed with a hearty laugh one would think you were going to be tied to that post and he pointed to the scaffold sauvaire was gaily dressed he wore a coat and trousers of fine cloth and his partly buttoned waistcoat gave a view of his white shirt his heavy watch-chain with its massive charms was displayed complacently as it was scarcely ten o'clock the master stevedore was still in his slippers with his soft felt hat cocked on his head and his beautiful meerschaum pipe between his teeth one felt that the whole pavement of the canbiere belonged to him he was quite at home there occupying as much room as possible and watching the passers-by in a familiar and patronizing way 
with his hands in his pockets stretching out his trousers his legs wide apart he examined marius with a look of superiority that was full of condescension you seem worried and ill he added do as i do keep well eat and drink heartily lead a merry life ah as for me i don't know what grief is i'm strong i've got a good digestion and i can spend a hundred francs whenever i like i know one must be well off to do as i do everybody isn't rich he eyed marius pitifully and found him so puny and pale that he was delighted at feeling himself plump and red beside him at that moment he would willingly have lent the young man a thousand francs marius was not listening to his prating he had shaken his hand in an absent-minded way and then had plunged again in his gloomy thoughts he was thinking with despair that he had been vainly struggling for three months without having made the slightest headway the post erected before him was a waiting philippe and it seemed to him that his feet were rooted to the pavement and that he was unable to run to his brother's assistance at that moment he would have sold himself to obtain a few thousand francs he would have committed a mean action receiving no reply sauvert continued prating he liked to hear the sound of his own voice deuce take it he said a young man should amuse himself but poor you you don't amuse yourself enough you work too hard my young friend ah it requires a lot of money pleasures cost dear as for myself i some weeks spend enormous sums you can't amuse yourself as much as that it'd be impossible but yet you might have a bit of a fling you've got a trifle of money haven't you listen shall i take you some evenings to places that'll enliven you up the master stevedore thought himself very generous in making marius this proposal he waited a while for the young man to thank him but as he still maintained his silence of despair he took his arm in an authoritative way and led him along the pavement i'll take you in hand he exclaimed i'll show you life i intend you to be almost as lively as myself in a week's time i eat in the best restaurants i know the prettiest women in marseilles and as you see i stroll about all day that's the way to live he stopped and folding his arms planted himself abruptly before marius do you know at what time i went to bed he resumed at three o'clock this morning and would you like to know where i passed the night at the corneille club where there was a fine old gamble just fancy there were two delightful creatures there women attired in velvet with jewels and lace things so costly that one is afraid to touch them with the tips of one's fingers clairon a little dark woman won over five thousand francs marius looked up sharply ah he said in a strange voice can one win five thousand francs in a single night sauvert burst out laughing good heavens what a simpleton you are i have seen larger sums than that one some people have luck last year i knew a young man who won sixteen thousand francs in a couple of nights he came to the club with me and hadn't a copper on him i lent him five francs and two days after he was in possession of sixteen thousand we spent them together heavens didn't i just amuse myself during the month they lasted a red flush came to marius's face he felt a tremor pass up him and burn his chest he had never before experienced so painful a sensation doesn't one have to be a member of a club to be able to play there he asked the master stevedore smiled and winked his eye in a knowing manner shrugging his shoulders the while i thought resumed marius that strangers were not allowed in a club and that only the members who had paid a subscription could play there yes yes that's correct replied sauvert laughing only members have the right to play but strangers who have not that right are generally more numerous around the gaming-table and play for higher stakes than the members do you understand it was now marius who took hold of sauvert's arm and they went a few steps in silence then the young man asked his companion in a stifled voice could you take me to-night to the corneille club bravo exclaimed the master stevedore we'll have a laugh i see you're beginning to understand life look you wine love and cards that's the ticket for me 
when i saw you looking so pale i said to myself there's a youngster i must take in hand try and win some money be quick and get a sweetheart and you'll soon grow fat or the devil take me certainly i'll conduct you to-night to the corneille club and i'll introduce you to clairon marius made a movement of impatience he cared nothing for clairon a fixed idea was occupying his brain since it was possible to win sixteen thousand francs at play in a couple of nights he wished to tempt fortune and obtain philippe's ransom from chance and he said to himself that providence would watch over him that he would leave the club with his hands full of gold something had gone wrong in his healthy upright mind beneath the repeated blows of disaster the good sense he possessed had become clouded everything was weighing him down in bringing him the news of m de cazalis's fresh proceedings abbe chastanier had dealt him the first blow then douglas in the pillory that terrible sight had completed his perturbation driving him mad by spreading before his eyes the spectacle of the infamous punishment that awaited his brother he was now quite losing his wits reduced to powerlessness not knowing where to turn in his supreme anguish he looked upon gambling as a providential means which would either help him out of his difficulty or plunge him more deeply into the abyss of his despair besides he was acting in a state of fever no longer knowing what he was doing obeying simply the instincts of the beast he looked at sauvert wondering whether it was virtue or crime which had placed this man across his path at the moment when the thought of the steps the deputy was taking and of philippe's punishment was torturing him at that instant he would have accepted anything he would have fought ill luck with no matter what weapons well that's agreed resumed sauvert as he took leave where shall i meet you this evening i'll be here on the canebiere at ten o'clock replied marius he left the master stevedore and went to his office he had never before been in such a state of over-excitement he passed a terrible day shaking with fever his brow heated a vacant gaze in his eyes and full of eager desire as he thought of the night that was coming he was dreaming awake and beheld the gold heaping up before him he fancied himself already rich and imagined his brother was free in the evening he went to see fine as usual at about eight o'clock the young woman noticed how heated his hands were whatever is the matter with you she asked him anxiously he stammered and hurried away with the words don't ask me anything philippe will be free and we shall all live happily he called at his lodging to take a hundred francs which he had saved up one by one and then went to meet sauvert at ten o'clock they both entered the corneille club chapter thirteen the gambling houses of marseilles before relating the next episode of this drama before showing marius a prey to all the anxieties of the gambler it is necessary to explain the causes which led to the increase of gambling houses in marseilles the writer of these lines would like to display in all its hideous nakedness the festering sore which preyed upon one of the wealthiest and liveliest cities of france the reader will pardon his short digression in consideration of its usefulness it is to be observed that the passion for gambling plays the most havoc in the great centres of commerce when a whole population is given over to unbridled speculation when all classes in a city are trafficking from morn to eve it is almost impossible that this throng of dealers should not plunge into the keen emotions of gambling gaming then becomes an additional speculation to be added to the others people speculate on chance and continue during the night the occupation of the day during the daytime they have been trying to increase their fortune by selling no matter what and at night-time they seek to add to the profit by risking it at the gaming-table if it is true that trade is often a game the traders may believe that they are not going out of their element when they pass from their counters to the neighbouring gambling-houses the commercial fever too is contagious in the face of certain great fortunes accumulated in a few years there is not a young man at marseilles who does not dream of similar luck every one wishes to go into business the whole city is an enormous bank in which one lives merely for the sake of making money go down to the port walk into all the places where the crowd is densest you will find every one talking of money and will fancy yourself in some immense office where all conversations are about figures the important business is when one has ten francs in one's pocket to turn them into twenty thirty forty those with large capital gamble at the stock exchange buying and selling but folks who only possess a few francs have recourse to gaming 
not having sufficient to engage in vast enterprises they satisfy their craving by tempting chance it is a means of gaining fortune or meeting ruin which is within every one's grasp a prompt and easy method a new style of trade full of keen emotions the gambler is a speculator who lives a whole panting existence in a night and experiences the hope anxiety and despair of a stock-jobber in a city like marseilles where money reigns as sovereign king where the inhabitants are under the influence of a terrible commercial fever gambling becomes a necessity a sort of bank open to all in which each one both rich and poor can risk his coppers or his gold add to this the fact that the wealthy those who shovel gold about who gain enormous sums in a day set little value on that gold they pile up so easily a workman looks with reverence at the five-franc piece which is paid him in the evening he has toiled and moiled to earn the coin it represents to him an exhausting labour long hours of fatigue and he has to live on it but a trader a stock-jobber who whilst remaining seated in his office finds at evening that he has gained several hundreds of francs does not fear when pocketing his profit to let a few twenty-franc pieces fall to the ground he knows that on the morrow he will no doubt earn as many more he is still young and wishes to enjoy life as he has been shut in during several hours he requires in the evening some noisy pleasures and strong emotions so he squanders his money in the restaurants and cafes and at the gaming-table spending it as easily as he earned it a commercial city is therefore forcibly dissolute and given to gambling in this ebb and flow of fortunes in this scorching breath of trade which penetrates throughout every house there are hours of madness imperious needs for enjoyment at certain times these people are blinded by the dazzle of the gold they plunge into debauchery the same as they plunged into business and the fever lays hold of the town from one end to the other little and big rich and poor are agitated by the same emotion the same need to lose or win gold down to ruin or up to millions one can understand the existence of i was almost saying the necessity for gambling houses at marseilles at the time of this story there were more than a hundred of them and the number was increasing daily the police were vanquished by the passion of the gamblers whenever a gambling house was discovered and closed two others were opened in its immediate neighbourhood to cut off the evil at the root it was necessary to remove the fever that was agitating the whole population but to my mind the evil was irremediable one may kill man but not his passions the police who have a direct action on gambling houses close all those they discover but their action is difficult to apply in the clubs which at times become changed into veritable houses for gaming gamblers are inventive when it is a question of satisfying their passion they endeavour to have the law on their side understand well however what i mean to say i have no idea of attacking certain honourable clubs at marseilles i wish merely to be the historian of those scandalous clubs frequented by sharpers and sometimes terribly stained by the blood of suicide this is how a club is founded a few persons ask for an authorization to meet of an evening in a certain place for the purposes of conversation and refreshment and even to play at lawful games each member pays a subscription and it is forbidden to admit strangers that is to say to keep a gaming-table open to the public and now this is what happens after a few months conversation and drinking cease and whole nights are spent around the green bays the stakes at first very small gradually increase in amount so much so that it is easy to ruin oneself in a few nights the management is no longer so strict any one is free to enter there are more strangers in the club than members even women are admitted sharpers soon put in an appearance for the purpose of fleecing inexperienced players and this state of things lasts until the police make a raid and close the premises two months later the club reopens some distance off the farce is played over again with the same ending this is one of the open sores of marseilles a festering sore which spreads every day the clubs have always a tendency to become gambling houses abysses which swallow up the fortunes and honour of those imprudent enough to venture therein and once one has tasted the keen delights of play all other pleasures seem to cloy the fever seizes hold of one's whole being and the table claims the last coin in one's purse not a week goes by without some fresh disaster or complaint to the authorities one time it is merchants who have been ruining themselves at the gaming-tables they come there and jeopardize the money deposited with them 
first dissipating their own profits and then breaking into the funds that have been entrusted to their commercial probity after that they are obliged to go into bankruptcy and they drag down in their ruin those who have had faith in their honesty another time it is small clerks with appetites for luxury and fast living and whose modest salaries are insufficient for the gratification of their passions they see around them wealthy people wallowing in the lap of luxury surrounded by lovely women reclining in carriages in short tasting of all the dissolute joys of life they are seized with jealousy and feel a keen desire to lead a similar existence of pleasure and festivity so they seek to obtain the necessary money at the gaming-table they first of all risk their salaries then when luck is against them they rob their employers and enter upon a criminal career then again there are young men poor simple fellows fresh from college who become the prey of skilful sharpers if they win they plunge into debauchery if they lose they fall into debt give bills to usurers and eat their corn in the ear the following characteristic story is told a clerk who had been given a few thousand francs by his employer to pay the duty on some merchandise went that evening to a club and lost the money with which he had been entrusted at baccarat it was a temporary madness the clerk being an honest fellow who had succumbed to the gambling fever the employer threatened to make a complaint to the authorities on hearing this the members of the club met together and decided to restore to the employer out of their own pockets the sum which his clerk had misappropriated when they had paid up the clerk signed a bill to the order of the cashier of the club and the cashier has never insisted on the payment of this bill which the poor clerk was unable to meet is not this kind action on the gambler's part an admission they understood that they were all jointly and severally guilty of the embezzlement and they hushed up the affair so that the authorities should not come and disturb them in the gratification of their passion it was into this world stricken with madness into this company of excited gamblers that sauveur introduced marius End of chapters eleven twelve and thirteen part two chapter fourteen of the mysteries of marseilles by emile zola translated by ernest alfred visitelli this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter fourteen in which marius wins ten thousand francs the corneille club was one of those authorized gambling hells that were referred to in the preceding chapter in principle it should only have comprised members admitted by a majority of voices and paying a subscription of twenty-five francs but in reality every one could go there and gamble at the commencement to save appearances they were in the habit of pasting a list of the newcomers up on the glass or else strangers were obliged to give a card of introduction supplied by one of the members later on they omitted to ask for the card and they had not taken the trouble to post up the names any one could go there who liked of course the master stevedore was an upright man incapable of committing a base action but his life of pleasure had caused him to make strange friendships he naively said that he preferred the society of rogues to that of straightforward people for while the latter worried him the former made him laugh he sought low society by instinct because he could there unbutton himself at his ease and amuse himself as he pleased that is to say by making a frightful riot besides with his affected air of a simple easy man he concealed extraordinary cunning and prudence he never compromised himself gambled little and withdrew as soon as he ran the least danger he was aware of the shady reputation of the majority of the frequenters of the corneille club and he went there because he met with ladies who were the reverse of being straight-laced and was able to satisfy his inclinations of an upstart sauveur and marius after ascending a narrow staircase reached a spacious apartment on the first floor where a score of marble-topped tables were set out against the walls were divans covered with red velvet and in the centre rush-seated chairs you might have imagined yourself in a cafe at the end was a large table covered with green cloth on which two squares were marked out with red braid and between these was a well for the cards that had been used this was the gaming-table it was surrounded by chairs marius cast a bewildered look over the place on entering he was suffocating like a man who had just fallen into the water any one to look at him might have thought that he had just come into a cavern where wild beasts were about to devour him his heart was beating rapidly and his brow covered with perspiration 
a sort of timidity mingled with repugnance kept him motionless awkward and gave him an embarrassed appearance there was hardly any one in the room a few men were drinking two women were conversing excitedly in a low tone in the corner the gaming-table remained dark and unoccupied in the background for the gas burners which descended in the centre of the green cloth had not yet been lit marius regained his assurance little by little but the fever continued raging in his veins what will you take inquired sauveur whatever you like answered the young man in an off-hand way staring at the table with curiosity and alarm the master stevedore ordered beer he extended himself full length on a divan and lit a cigar ah there is clairon along with her friend isnard he all at once exclaimed perceiving the two girls talking in a corner look what pearls of women they are eh what say you they are the sort of little creatures you require to drive away your troubles marius looked at the girls clairon wore an old black velvet gown stained and frayed she was short dark faded her face which was pale and covered with yellow spots wore an air of weariness which was painful to look at isnard who was tall and thin appeared still older and more worn out it seemed as if her angular limbs would pierce through her faded silk gown at the shoulders marius was at a loss to understand sauveur's passionate admiration for these creatures he turned away his head with an expression of disgust fine's healthy countenance had just appeared to him and he felt ashamed at being in such a place the high key of sauveur's voice had made the two girls turn their heads and they began to laugh oh they are buxom lasses murmured the master stevedore there's no mourning in their society if you like we'll take them off with us to-night aren't we going to play inquired marius sharply interrupting his companion good heavens what a hurry you are in answered sauveur who stretched himself out still more to attract the girl's attention of course we are going to play we'll play until to-morrow morning if you like but dash it there's time enough for that just observe how clairon and isnard are looking at me the frequenters of the place gradually came in a waiter lit the gas and several players went and seated themselves at the gaming-table the two girls began to move about the room smiling on the men they knew they ended by seating themselves near the banker who held the cards hoping no doubt to glean a few twenty-franc pieces sauveur then consented to approach the players marius stayed for a moment standing studying the game he leant over to his companion and said kindly explain to me how i must act the master stevedore was very much amused at the young man's naivety but my good fellow he answered nothing is easier where have you come from every one knows baccarat come here sit down place your stake on this side or that in one of those squares surrounded by a red band you see the banker makes use of two packs of cards of different coloured backs and of fifty-two cards each he deals two cards on each side and two to himself the tens and picture cards do not count the highest point is nine and it is necessary to get as near that as possible if you have no more than the banker you win if less you lose that's all but said marius i see some of the players ask for a card yes answered sauveur you are allowed to draw a card to arrange your hand you often disarrange it i advise you to always stand at six it's a nice point marius sat down at the table don't you play he inquired of sauveur faith no answered the master stevedore i prefer having a laugh with clairon and he got up and went hanging round the little brunette the truth was that he was afraid of losing his cash he found gambling ran away with such a lot of money the excitement of winning and losing was too rapid for him he wanted solid lasting enjoyment the banker shuffled the cards make your game gentlemen he said marius placed fifty francs on the cloth with a shudder he had decided that he would play his hundred francs in two stakes red light passed before his eyes he heard a sort of growling within him which made him feel giddy his ears tinkled and his sight was troubled the sensation he experienced was so violent that his heart almost ceased beating 
nothing more goes said the banker and he dealt the cards it was marius's turn to take them he picked them up and looked at them in a stupid way he had five he asked for cards and remained with four the hands were thrown down the banker had three a murmur of astonishment passed round the table marius had won from that moment the young man was beside himself he lived in a sort of dream he remained there for more than five hours downcast overcome sent half asleep by the monotony of the game winning always losing only to win still more he played with an audacity that made the other gamblers tremble and one contrary to every probability clearing out the bankers one after the other beside him was an elderly man who watched him with a stupefied and envious look this person at length bent towards him and asked him in a low tone of voice sir would you be so good as to tell me what your mascot is marius did not hear him a mascot in the slang of provencal gamblers is a sort of talisman which shields the person who possesses it against ill luck all gamblers are more or less superstitious and each of them invents a little protecting divinity as a means of ensuring fortune the old gentleman seemed wounded at marius's silence i don't think i have been indiscreet he continued i should have been curious to know what could possibly have given you such luck i don't hide what i do here's my mascot he took off his hat and displayed an image of the virgin mary inside of it if marius had been calm he would have laughed but he was enervated by several hours play and he made a movement of impatience and continued to pile up the gold before him without uttering a single word sauvert who was astounded at his companion's luck had placed himself behind his chair he preferred to watch the game to playing himself he enjoyed the sight of large sums of money spread out on the gaming table when he did not run the risk of losing clairon and isnard had followed him and leant familiarly on the back of marius's seat they bent over towards the young man smiled at him fondled him with their eyes the odour of gold had made them hasten forward like birds of prey five o'clock struck the pale daylight was streaming in at the windows the gamblers went off one by one marius ended by finding himself alone he had ten thousand francs in winnings before him the young man would have sat at the gaming-table until evening until the following day without being conscious of it without complaining of the fatigue which was overpowering him for more than five hours he had been playing mechanically having but one idea in his head that of winning of always winning he wanted to finish with it at a single stroke to win the sum he required in one night and not put his feet in the hell again when he found himself alone at the table stupid blind his limbs aching with excitement and weariness he was in despair his eyes sought some one to go on playing with he had just counted the money he had won and he knew it only amounted to ten thousand francs he wanted five thousand francs more he would have given anything in the world for daylight not to have appeared perhaps he might have had time to complete philip's ransom and he was there staring at his gold pieces putting them slowly into his pocket folding up the banknotes one by one looking round the room for a belated gambler there was a man at a small table near him who had been watching the play all the evening without risking anything himself when he had seen marius winning he had approached and had not lost sight of him he seemed to be waiting he let the other gamblers go away one by one fixing his eyes on the young man following the fever that agitated him lying in wait for him as for a sure prey when the latter vexed and shivering was making up his mind to leave the stranger rose hurriedly and approached him sir he inquired will you have a game at ecarte with me marius was about to accept joyfully when sauvert who was following him step by step seized him by the arm and whispered don't play the young man turned round and threw an inquiring look on the master stevedore don't play the latter continued if you wish to keep the ten thousand francs you've got in your pocket for the love of providence refuse and come quickly you will thank me afterwards marius had a good mind not to listen to sauvert but the master stevedore got him little by little near the door and seeing him hesitate he undertook to speak for him no no monsieur felix 
he said to the man who was offering to play écarté my friend is tired he can't stay any longer good day monsieur felix m felix seemed very much annoyed at this answer he stared fixedly at sauvert as if to say to him what the deuce are you meddling with then he turned on his heels whistled between his teeth and murmured and so i've lost my night sauvert had not let go of marius when they were both in the street the young man inquired of his companion in an irritated tone why did you prevent me playing ah poor innocent answered the master stevedore because i took pity on you because i didn't want felix to win your ten thousand francs from you that man's a rascal then oh no he remains within the strictest limits of honesty then i should have won no you would have lost the calculations of m felix are sure this is how he proceeds he never plays during the night towards morning when the other players are racked with fever he addresses one of them and makes him seat himself at an écarté table it is no longer a question of a game of chance but of a game in which you need all your intelligence and all your calm m felix is calm and prudent he is a head that is fresh and reposed his adversary is feverish blind he does not even see his cards and in a few deals he is stripped in the most straightforward fashion in the world i understand and i thank you m felix has already won quite a fortune by putting his system into practice every evening but i repeat that he plays in a perfectly honourable manner only he arranges things in such a way that his adversaries always play like perfect jackasses and that is how clever people succeed if i were in his place i'd take out a patent marius remained silent the two men had stopped in the middle of the deserted street opposite the entrance to the corneille club it was wet foggy weather nasty odours hovered over the pavement and there was a piercing chill in the matinal breeze buttoned up to their chins both shivering they reeled about like drunkards their pale countenances and sparkless eyes telling the few passers-by what sort of night they had just passed as marius was about to go off he felt an arm slipped in his he turned and recognized isnard clairon had just taken sauvert's arm the two women had not lost sight of these men who smelt of gold they had followed them ravenous at the thought of the ten thousand francs that marius had on him and determined to have their share of the amount the young man appeared to them a simpleton whom they could master without difficulty and strip at their ease isnard burst into a laugh and said in a slightly groggy voice are you going to bed already gentlemen marius rapidly withdrew his arm with an air of repugnance which he did not take the trouble to disguise my loves answered sauvert i am willing to stand you a breakfast eh promise me to be very amusing are you coming marius no answered the young man sharply ah this gentleman is not coming said clairon in a drawling voice ah that's a pity he would have stood us champagne he owes us at least that marius felt in his pockets pulled two handfuls of gold out of them and passed them to clairon and isnard the women pocketed the money without being in the least degree put out until to-night said marius until to-night answered the master stevedore he took one of the women on each arm and went off in that way singing and creating a frightful disturbance in the quiet thoroughfare marius watched him move away and then proceeded to his peaceful little room in the rue sainte it was six o'clock in the morning he went to bed and slept like a top he only awoke at two o'clock when he opened his eyes he perceived the money he had won the reddish reflex running over the gold almost frightened him all at once the night he had passed came back to him with singular distinctiveness and he felt a formidable choking sensation in the throat he was afraid of becoming a gambler for his first thought on awakening was that he would return to the hell in the evening and would win again at this idea a tremor passed through him and he became feverish and enjoyed a moment of voluptuous delight and he repeated to himself no it is not true i cannot be possessed of that horrible passion i cannot have become a gambler from one day to another 
i gamble to deliver philippe i don't play for myself he did not dare interrogate himself further then he thought of fine and he had to make an effort to restrain his sobs he said to himself that he already had ten thousand francs and that he could dispense with returning to the gambling-house assuredly he could easily find five thousand francs he would not run the risk of losing what he had won he dressed himself and went out into the street his head was bursting he did not even think of going to his office he entered a restaurant but could not eat everything he saw seemed to be turning and at times he felt a choking sensation as if he were all at once in want of breath when night came he went as a matter of course step by step to the corneille club End of chapter fourteen part two chapters fifteen and sixteen of the mysteries of marseilles by emile zola translated by ernest alfred Vizzatelli. this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter fifteen how marius had blood on his hands on entering the room marius perceived sauvert seated at a table between clarron and isnard the master stevedore had not quitted the two girls since the morning he rose stepped forward and pressed the young man's hand ah my friend he said how wrong you were not to have come with us we amused ourselves immensely these charmers are so funny they would make stones laugh they are the sort of ladies i like he dragged marius to the table where clairon and isnard were drinking beer the young man sat down with a good deal of ill grace sir said isnard to him would you like me to go into partnership with you to-night no he answered dryly he's quite right to refuse cried sauvert in a noisy voice you want to ruin him my dear you know the proverb lucky at cards unlucky in love and he added in a low voice addressing his companion why don't you make friends with her don't you see the glances she is casting at you marius rose without answering and went and sat at the card-table a game was about to commence and he was impatient to return to the sensations of the previous night he wished to follow the same tactics he placed fifty francs on the cloth and lost them he put fifty others there and lost them also gamblers are justly fatalists they know by experience that chance has its laws like everything else in this world that it labours sometimes for a whole night to make a man's fortune and that often the next day it works his ruin with the same persistence a moment comes when chance turns when a person who has won a long series of hands loses another series that is quite as long marius had arrived at one of those terrible moments he lost five times in succession sauvert who had drawn near and was following his game bent over him and said rapidly don't play to-night you are not in luck you will lose all you won yesterday the young man shrugged his shoulders impatiently his throat became dry and the perspiration stood out on his forehead leave me alone he answered sharply i know what i'm doing i want all or nothing as you please replied the master stevedore i have gained some experience during the ten years i have been playing and watching others play in a few hours my good fellow you will not have a sou left it always happens like that he took a chair and sat down behind marius wishing to be present when his predictions were realized clairon and isnard who hoped to gather up a few pieces of gold as on the previous day also came and placed themselves near the young man they laughed gave themselves airs and sauvert from time to time joked noisily with them the bursts of laughter and tittering which marius heard behind him exasperated him he was on the point of turning round two or three times to send sauvert and the girls to the prince of darkness in despair at losing enervated by the strange and terrible hands that chance gave him he felt his anger rising within him and would have been glad to vent it on some one he had played at first as on the previous night with audacity and decision risking hands of five and relying on his good luck but that luck had gone his audacity did not serve him then he wanted to act prudently he dodged chance calculated the probabilities and finally played cleverly he lost just as often as before on several occasions he had eight and the banker nine 
fortune seemed to take bitter pleasure in stripping him on whom he had showered her favours it was indeed a fight to the death and at each fresh attack at each hand of cards marius was vanquished at the expiration of an hour he had already lost four thousand francs sauvert kept singing out behind him what did i say i was certain of it and clairon and isnard who saw the bits of gold on which they relied disappearing began to make fun of the young man and to look about for some one more lucky marius bewildered in front of the gulf open before him turned towards sauvert and said to him in a choking voice you who know how to play tell me what to do oh answered the master stevedore if you were to play like an angel you would lose chance is blind it goes you see where it likes one can never direct it you had better withdraw no no i'll see it out well then let us try play the series marius played the series hand on hand he lost five hundred francs the deuce exclaimed sauvert play intermission then marius played intermission and lost again i warned you i warned you repeated the master stevedore try a martingale marius tried a martingale and had no better luck it's enough to drive one mad he exclaimed in anger don't play any more said sauvert yes i will play i'll play to the end the master stevedore rose whistling between his teeth he could not understand his friend's nervous obstinacy he who never risked more than a hundred francs on the green cloth look here he continued the banker has thrown up his hand and is leaving take his place that perhaps will change the luck marius took the banker's seat he paid two francs for cards and slipped a franc into the slot in accordance with the custom of the club he shuffled the cards and then presented them to the player saying gentlemen the cards pass some of the players shuffled the cards again and returned them to marius who shuffled them a third time as was his right the game began again the young man could now lose all he had in a few hands he lost twice running sauvert continued to remain behind him he ended by taking an interest in this intrepid youth the latter was about to deal the cards again to the players to the punters as they are called when the master stevedore stopped his arm and leaning over to his ear said to him in a low voice take care they are robbing you you are dealing the cards like a young innocent how do you mean yes you hold them up as you deal them so that the punters opposite see them pass and know what you have in your hand all new bankers are victimized like that keep the pack slanting in your hand and lower the cards as you deal them out marius followed this wise advice and did very well he won in a few hands he had got back a fairly large sum then chance turned again and he lost next a sort of equilibrium was established between his winning and losings little by little however he felt the ten thousand francs slipping through his fingers he neglected nothing to make his luck change on several occasions he stopped and called for fresh cards at another time he dealt his right hand out in order to lead chance astray and bring it back to him but all these tactics did him no good fortune now seemed to take pleasure in playing with its prey in making it suffer longer and not killing it at one blow then all at once she scratched it she took away what she had just given and even more sauvert kept watch around the table so as to see that his friend was not cheated too much the latter had a man opposite him who was still young and who although playing for small stakes must already have won a good round sum each time the cards were favourable to him his stake was twenty-five francs and each time he lost he had only a silver five-franc piece before him which was a mascotte he said and he paid with another coin the master stevedore looked on this man with distrust he watched his movements and perceived that he concealed a twenty-five-franc gold piece under his five-franc piece in silver when he won he displayed it all and pocketed twenty-five francs when he lost he left the gold coin hidden under the large silver piece and only gave marius five francs it seems that not a night passes without this clever robbery being practised in one of the gambling-houses at marseilles wait a bit wait a bit murmured sauvert i'll nail you my gentleman 
in the hand that followed marius won the cheat was preparing to give him five francs in change when sauvert stretched out his arm gave a flip to the five franc piece and uncovered the gold coin beneath it you are cheating sir he exclaimed out you go the rascal did not lose countenance what are you meddling with he answered insolently he left his twenty-five francs on the table rose took a few turns in the room and withdrew without molestation the punters had limited themselves to growling marius turned very pale he had fallen then so low as that he was playing with thieves from that moment there was a cloud before his eyes which made him commit the grossest blunders he lost and was almost happy to lose all the fever had left him he no longer had the uncomfortable feeling in his throat the money when he touched it was burning hot he would have liked to have lost the whole of it and have to go away with empty pockets soon he had no more than two or three hundred francs before him since the commencement of the evening he had had a young man beside him who had followed all the changes of fortune with lively anxiety as he lost he became more pale and haggard he had begun with a considerable sum before him and gazed in despair on each piece of gold as it was swept away marius had heard him more than once utter disjointed words and had felt anxious about him he could see that a frightful drama was being performed at his elbow a final stroke completed his neighbor's ruin he remained for a moment motionless with contracted features then he placed a hand over his eyes drew a pistol rapidly from his pocket placed the barrel in his mouth and fired there was a sound like the crack of a whip the blood spurted out in large warm crimson drops fell on marius's hands all the players had risen in a fright the body had just fallen on the table the arms folded the head hanging down the bullet after piercing the neck had come out on the right below the ear and there was a red hole there from which ran a stream of blood a pool of gore was formed on the green cloth and in this pool the abandoned cards were soaking alarming sentences uttered in undertones passed among the gamblers do you know the poor fellow i think it's a collector of lambert and company his family is honourable his brother purchased a solicitor's practice six months ago he must have embezzled a large sum and killed himself when he lost it anyhow he might have shot himself somewhere else the police will be here in twenty minutes and close the club these people who have a mania for killing themselves are most annoying we were very well here we could gamble at ease now we must move have they sent to inform the police commissary yes i'm off there was a general stampede the players seized their hats and prudently slipped out on the landing one could hear them stumbling downstairs like drunkards marius had remained seated beside the corpse he could not move hand or foot he sat looking in a stupid way at the suicide's red neck and the splashes of blood covering his own hands his hair stood on end sparks of madness flashed in his eyes which were almost starting out of his head he still held the pack of cards all at once he threw them down shook his hands violently as if to get rid of the blood that was running between his fingers and uttering a harsh cry fled he did not even pick up the few hundreds of francs that were before him the pool increased little by little and the bits of gold now seemed bathed in a stream of blood only the corpse and the two girls remained in the room sauvert had been one of the first to fly when clairon and isnard found themselves alone they approached the table attracted by the gold glittering in the blood let's divide said isnard yes let's be quick answered clairon it's no good giving the police the money and each of them took a handful of gold from the middle of the crimson blood the coin stained with gore disappeared in their pockets then they wiped their fingers on their handkerchiefs and in their turn fled gasping for breath and fancying they heard the voice of the police commissary behind them it was three o'clock in the morning great gusts of wind were driving along the big dark clouds that studded the grey sky with black a sort of mist floated in the air and fell in fine icy cold rain there is nothing more mournful than those hours of the early morning in a great city the streets are dirty the houses stand out in sad silhouettes marius ran like a madman through the silent and deserted streets he slipped on the greasy stones dipping his feet in the gutters and knocking up against the corners of the pavement 
and he continued running with his arms extended before him wringing his hands in furious rage he wanted to go and dip them in the sea and wash them with all the water of the ocean there only could he find relief for the terrible burn that was devouring him he ran alarmed and fierce still wringing his hands and taking out of the way streets like a murderer at moments he was half mad he imagined it was he who had killed the suicide to rob him of fifteen thousand francs then he heard the heavy tread of the gendarme behind him he hastened the pace not knowing where to hide his hands which would bear witness against him he had to cross the cour Bazins. workmen were passing along under the trees and he experienced most horrible anguish to avoid descending to the harbour by the canebiere he plunged into the old town there the streets are dark and narrow and no one could see his blood-stained hands he reached the place aux oeufs it was only then that he thought of fine he remembered all at once that she was matno that she might already be on the place and would see him covered with blood she would question him and he would be unable to answer her he knew nothing all was confusion in his head he found himself lost in a nightmare his hands burned him that was all and he continued running ran to go and plunge them in the sea and extinguish the coals clinging to his flesh he descended the narrow streets the steep inclines at the risk of breaking his head twenty times over twice he slipped and fell each time he rose with a bound and continued his race at length he perceived the black masses of vessels lying silent in the dense water of the port he ran along the white polished slabs of stone and as he could find no boat he for an instant had the insane idea of flinging himself into the water and thus appeasing his sufferings at a single stroke the burns he thought he felt became intolerable he yelled and wept but having at last found a little pleasure craft fastened at the edge of the quay he leapt into it lay down on his stomach and feverishly plunged his arms into the sea up to the shoulders a profound sigh of relief escaped him the cool water appeased his fever the wavelets washed away the blood that was gnawing into his hands he remained lying thus for a long time forgetting all not even remembering why he was there every now and then he drew his arms out of the water and furiously rubbed his hands looked at them and rubbed them again he seemed always to perceive large red spots on his skin then he plunged his arms into the sea again made the water move gently to and fro enjoying intense delight at the sensation of the cold seizing him and sending a shiver all over his body at the end of an hour he was still there thinking there would never be sufficient water in the sea to wash his hands however little by little his ideas became calm and his head heavy it seemed as if his brain were empty icy shivers ran over all his limbs mechanically step by step he reached the rue sainte without thinking of anything he no longer knew where he had come from nor what he had done he went to bed and was seized with a terrible fever chapter sixteen mademoiselle claire's prayer book marius remained three weeks in bed a prey to violent delirium he had an attack of acute cerebral fever which brought him to death's door his youth and the tender attention he received saved him one evening at twilight he opened his eyes with a clear head it seemed to him that he had issued from profound darkness he was so weak that he had no feeling in his body but the fever had disappeared and his thoughts which were still vacillating returned to him the curtains were drawn round his bed a soft warm light came through the white linen and surrounded him with gentle brightness the air of the silent room was pervaded with perfume he raised himself and at the slight noise he made he saw a shadow glide behind the curtains who is there he inquired in a voice that was hardly distinct a hand quietly drew aside the curtains and fine seeing maria sitting up exclaimed joyfully heaven be praised you are saved my friend and she began to weep the invalid understood all and extended his poor thin hands towards the girl thanks he said to her i knew you were there i felt as if i had had a frightful dream and i remember now in the midst of that dream i saw you bending over me like a mother he let his head fall on the pillow and continued in a childish voice i have been very ill have i not 
all is over do not let us think of such disagreeable things said the flower girl gaily but where had you been to my friend the sleeves of your coat were all wet marius passed his hand across his forehead oh i remember he exclaimed it's frightful then he gave fine an account of the two terrible nights he had passed in the gambling-house he made her a confession retracing in detail all he had suffered it's a terrible lesson he remarked in conclusion i doubted and turned to chance for a moment i shuddered i fancied i felt all the instincts of the gambler within me but i've been cured with a red-hot iron he stopped and then continued anxiously how long have i been ill about three weeks answered fine oh heavens three weeks lost we have only about twenty days before us do not trouble about that but get well hasn't mr martelli sent to inquire about me don't worry yourself i tell you i have been to see him and everything is arranged marius seemed more calm and fine continued there is only one course to follow and that is to borrow money from m martelli we should have commenced by that all will be well now sleep do not speak the doctor has forbidden it the convalescence advanced at rapid strides thanks to fine's tender and devoted care the young girl understood that her smile would now suffice to cure marius and each morning she came with that and her fresh breath which filled the little room with a puff of spring ah how nice it is to be ill the invalid often repeated the two lovers passed a charming week in this way their love had increased amidst the suffering and dread of death a new bond united them henceforth they were one when at the expiration of a week of gay and touching intimacy marius was able to get downstairs and go for a short walk in the sun on the cour bonaparte he and fine were taken for two lovers on the morrow of their betrothal they had been affianced in the midst of devotedness and grief now as they walked along slowly the flower girl supported the young man who was still weak and gazed at him with bewitching eyes she was proud of her work proud at her lover's recovery and he thanked her with smiles full of passionate gratitude the next day the clerk wished to go back to his office and fine had to get angry to make him remain at home a day or two longer he was impatient to see m martelli he desired to feel the ground and ascertain if he could rely on the ship-owner but there is no hurry said the flower girl with a calmness that astounded the young man we have a whole week before us it will suffice if we have the money at the last moment at the end of two days marius obtained the young girl's permission to return to his work and it was arranged between them that they would leave for aix on the following monday fine spoke as if she had the amount necessary for philippe's liberty in her pocket marius went to his office and was received by m martelli with paternal kindness the ship-owner wanted to give him another week's holiday but the young man assured him that work would complete his convalescence he felt ashamed in his presence he was thinking that in two or three days he would be making an effort to borrow a large sum of money from him and that thought troubled him moreover m martelli gazed at him with a piercing look that quite embarrassed him i have seen mademoiselle fine said the ship-owner accompanying him into his office she is a charming person a noble heart be very fond of her my friend he smiled again and withdrew when marius was alone he experienced inestimable delight at finding himself in the small office where he had lived and worked so long he again took possession of his little domain found pleasure in seating himself before his table in touching the papers and pens lying there he had been almost dead and he was once more face to face with his daily placid existence the room in which he was working was opposite the ship-owner's private apartments and sometimes visitors made a mistake and knocked at his door on that particular morning as he was about to get to work he heard two discreet knocks and shouted to come in a man dressed in a long black frock coat made his appearance he was shaven his manner was gentle and he had all the humble and sneaking demeanour of a person connected with the roman catholic church mademoiselle claire martelli he inquired marius who was occupied in examining him did not answer he was wondering where on earth he had seen this devout personage before the man was hesitating but he at last pulled a prayer-book confined in a case out of the immense pockets of his overcoat i have brought her he continued in a fluty voice her prayer-book which she forgot yesterday evening in a confessional 
marius continued wondering where on earth have i seen the face of that canting rascal the man no doubt understood the mute interrogation of his look he bent his head slightly adding i am the beadle of the church of st victor these few words were like a beam of light for the young man he remembered having seen the individual before him in the vestry room on one occasion when he went to fetch abbe chastanier his intelligence received a sort of shock that stimulated it and urged on by the power of divination as it were he said it was m donaday who sent you was it not yes answered the beadle after further hesitation very good give me the prayer-book i will hand it to mademoiselle claire but the abbe particularly told me i was to give it to no one but the young lady she shall have it in a moment perhaps she is not up yet you will be disturbing her you promise me to do the errand certainly tell the young lady that the abbe found this prayer-book in his confessional yesterday and told me to bring it to her the abbe sends his compliments to mademoiselle i will tell her all that rest assured the beadle placed the prayer-book on the table and withdrew after making a bow but in closing the door he hesitated again and looked distrustful when he had at last gone marius could not help feeling surprised at his persistence in wishing to see mademoiselle claire himself he vaguely remembered the praises donna day had bestowed on m martelli's young sister he looked at the prayer-book and his thoughts were busy with all kinds of reasonings and explanations he stretched out his arm and took the prayer-book he drew it from its case it was one of those bulky volumes almost square with a handsome binding in corners in open silver-work the initials of the young girl were interlaced on one of the sides as marius contemplated the book and turned it over in his hands he perceived a thin piece of paper peeping out from the gilt edges prompted by a feeling of curiosity which he did not seek to explain he opened the volume and a sheet of paper folded in four slipped out of it before him it was a pretty sheet of pink paper exhaling a slight smell of incense marius was about to return it to the book but as he took it up he saw it was marked with the initial d and a cross in relief he rapidly unfolded it and read as follows dear soul you whose salvation has been entrusted to me by the lord listen i beg of you to the scheme i have formed for your eternal happiness i have never dared explain that scheme to you verbally fearing to give way to the adorable emotions that your righteousness creates within me you cannot remain any longer in your brother's house it is a place of perdition your brother is devoted to the abominable worship of modern idols come come with me we will find a solitary spot where i will place you in the hands of the almighty perhaps my tears and trembling have made you penetrate the secret of my heart i love you as the holy church our mother loves the pure souls that come to her i dream of you each night i see you entwined in a celestial embrace and we both rise to heaven exchanging angelic kisses ah do not resist the voice that is calling you come there is a superior religion which we do not reveal to the vulgar that religion unites creatures together it makes spouses not martyrs bear in mind our conversations say to yourself that i love you and come i await you at my house i shall have a post-chaise in an adjoining street marius was astounded after reading this abbe donaday actually suggested an elopement to mademoiselle claire it is true his letter was pervaded with incense with rakish cloudy mysticism which hid the brutal meaning of his thoughts beneath the devout and fondling sweetness of words the sense was paraphrased diluted in that odd style of expression which some roman catholic priests affect but abbe donaday had not been able to find a religious periphrasis for the post-chaise and his hypocritical letter ended coarsely by a gendarme-like offer which no one could misinterpret the graceful abbe to have cast aside the sly prudence that guided him in all his acts must have been carried away by fierce desire the clerk read and re-read the letter asking himself what he had better do he felt indignant his anger rose within him but one anxiety restrained him he was ignorant as to the harm that had been done he did not know what mademoiselle claire thought and he was afraid lest donna day in the mysterious seclusion of the confessional had not already succeeded in troubling the young girl's heart 
before striking the priest he wanted to be sure that he would not at the same time strike his victim for nothing in the world would he have run the risk of creating a scandal that would certainly have killed m martelli he resolved that if the abbe were to be the only one to suffer to punish him in an original way he took the prayer-book and went to mademoiselle claire in great alarm lest her face should display incriminating emotion End of chapters fifteen and sixteen